Honourable Senators. The President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, chart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Clark, are there any documents? Yes, Mr. President. I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. And are there any proposals for committees to meet? Uh, yes, Mr. President. A committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. If not, I will call the clerk. Government business notice of motion number one standing in the name of the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie, for the introduction of a bill. Minister. Thank you, Clark. Uh, I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Road Vehicle Standards Consequential and Transitional Provisions Act 2018 uh, and for related purposes. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities uh, and that be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Road Vehicle Standards Consequential and Transitional Provisions Act 2018 and for related purposes. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to exempt this bill from the bill's cut-off order. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the provisions of paragraph Against say no, the ayes have it. Minister. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the date, debate now be adjourned. The question is the debate now be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no, the ayes have it. And Clark. Government business order of the day number one. Adva uh, consideration of the advances provided under the Annual Appropriations Act report for 2020-21. Uh, Senator Dodson. Uh, the Appropriations Bill 3 and 4, 2021-22. I'm sorry, Minister. Um, I'm going to give you permission. Sorry, Sen Senator Dodson. <laughs> I'm going to be very connotating, Senator Dodson. I move that the, <laughs> I move that the Senate approves the advances provided under the Annual Appropriations Acts for the end year ending uh, 30 June 2021. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence, Appropriation Bill No. 3, 2021-2022, and Appropriation Bill No. 4, 2021-2022, and I call the Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities be taken together and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. 
Appropriation Bill number 3, 2021 22, Appropriation num Bill number 4, 2021 22. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. Sorry, Senator Dodson, now we can go. Thank to you, you uh, Mr. President. Uh, so enjoyable jumping up and down. Um, Appropriations Bill 3 and 4, 2021 22. Uh, Labor will support these bills. Uh, they resent, uh, represent additional estimates for the 2021 22 financial year, with a total of $15.9 billion uh, appropriated across the two bills, with uh, $11.9 billion in Bill 3 and $4 billion in uh, Bill 4. The financial impact of these were incorporated into the budget bottom line, as at the 21 22 MyOFO. Uh, which was delivered last year. It's appropriate we debate these bills the day after the budget was delivered. But what we saw last night was uh, a falling in real wages, a trillion dollars in debt and the risk of a second wasted decade. Under the Morrison government, the cost of living are uh, skyrocketing, real wages are going backwards and working families are falling further behind. Nothing in this budget makes up for a decade of attacks on wages, job security and Medicare. Its defining features are pay what won't keep up with prices and almost nothing to show for a trillion dollars in debt. It's a ploy for an election, not a plan for a better future. Australians need a pay rise, not a patch job that leaves them $25 a week worse off. An economy that works for everyone starts with a government that actually delivers what it announces, and we know this one uh, never does. And it's a budget that includes $3 billion of secret cuts that the government has, uh, has hidden. Three billion of secret cuts that the government has hidden. The Australian people will soon have a choice, and that choice is very clear. A Labor government led by Anthony Albanese will see budgets as an opportunity to plan for the future and not just plan for an election campaign. A leader who shows up, takes responsibility and wants to bring the country together versus a Prime Minister who can claim to do nothing of these things. Thank you, Madam, Acting, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Deputy President. And I rise to speak on appropriation bills numbers three and four, 2021-22. This government pretends that it can manage the economy, but all it really does is run up debt. Keep wages down and waste money on rort to keep themselves in office. They have no macro or micro reform agenda to deliver safe and secure jobs or to grow wages. Is there a single issue that faces our country that will be resolved by another three years of this lacklustre D-team government? They failed at disaster response. They failed at wage growth, they failed to address growing skills shortages, and they failed to stand up to China. It's just failure after failure with this government. And Senator Concietto Fivanti Wells let us in on why that is the case. The fraud at the head of a decaying government, Mr. Morrison. The announcement of the Chinese base in the Solomon Islands shows the abject failure of the Pacific step up and shows to all of us that this government's posturing as tough on defence and strong on China, they are utterly failing to win the hearts and minds of our neighbours in the Pacific. And that failure matters. The economic ineptitude of this government is complete and total. We've seen wages stagnate for nine years. We've seen key industries hemorrhage jobs or shutter entirely, like the car manufacturers. And we've seen the cost 
of living for ordinary Australians waking up every day, continuing to see that cost of living burden skyrocket. Now feeling more and more vulnerable, more and more insecure, not only in their own employment, but in their sense of the future for them and their families. The economic model of this government, if I could be so generous as to call it that, is entirely shambolic. What happened to this government's supposed gas-fired recovery, announced with great fanfare in 2020? Fact is, there are now 10 per cent fewer jobs in the industry, and two of Australia's oil refineries have closed during this term of government alone. Now, just think about the jobs, the jobs that are lost in that industry, despite the fanfare of the government's announcement. This is the government that positioned themselves in public announcements as the saviours of the coal mining industry, but their track record tells a different story, and the truth simply does not align with the impressionistic painting of this government that it's there for you. Make no mistake, last night we saw urgent response to cost of living because the government's only woken up to it in the last couple of weeks. For three terms, they have allowed the conditions to exist that have eroded safety and security for Australian families and increasing insecurity in work. They do not deserve another decade. They simply do not. As with all of the other budgets brought down by Mr Frydenberg, this one is about keeping his government in office by spending our taxpayer dollars like it's their Liberal Party money to buy seats. This morning I heard uh, Mr Chalmers, the opposition treasurer, describing the reality of what happened overnight is the equivalent of this government using your dollars and attaching it to their how to vote. It's a vote buyer. That's all it is for a short-term hit. And this morning, Mr Frydenberg was completely unable and totally unwilling to answer reasonable questions about the $3 billion of cuts that lie on the other side of the upcoming election. $3 billion, and you can bet your bottom dollar that it will be coming out of your pocket. It won't come out of the pocket of multinationals or, or huge businesses that aren't paying their fair share. It will be ordinary Australians, once again, who have paid with wage stagnation, who will pay once again if we get this government back. They do not deserve another term. The rorts under this government have reached unprecedented levels, with hardly a budget going by that doesn't overrule departmental and other expert advice in favour of their political agenda. They're not using our money to benefit the nation, putting money where it's needed on merit. They're out there with their colour-coded charts, figuring out how they splash money where it's best for their election. That is not a plan for the country. That's a plan for the Liberal Party and the disgraced Mr Morrison, whose own team don't even support him and are willing to put on the record that he is a man who lacks character, a man who will lie to the Australian people. The infrastructure agenda for this country for the last four years has been dictated by that set of colour-coded spreadsheets, by a list of marginal seats, by the Treasurer's desire to save his own seat, to which he allocated a great amount of money for train station parking, commuter car parks. Couldn't be delivered, and in the end he's had to pull the money. That's how chaotic, that's how chaotic the government's vote-buying exercises are. The $660 million commuter car park fund was a slush fund for Liberal marginal seat holders, so badly put together, so shambolic, that, like the Treasurer's own seat, several have had to be cancelled due to their uh, being completely unfeasible. Two were to be built next to stations due to clothes, and others have been announced, cancelled, and now we're up to the re-announcement in time for the upcoming election campaign. <laughs> My dad always used to say, well, you can fool the people some of the time, but you can't fool them all the time. And Australians cannot and should not be fooled 
into another term, a fourth term, of this government in decay. 77 per cent of those funds, your Australian taxpayer dollars, were funnelled by the coalition into its own seats. 77 per cent, despite they only have a bare majority in the House of Representatives. It's hardly representative of need, other than the need for this government to buy its way into office. They do not have a plan for the future of the average Australian. They're merely about planning for their own They will do it, even if it leads to gross mismanagement of our national economy. Every Australian knows about the sports rorts, Mr Morrison's sports rorts, the funnelling of hundreds of millions of dollars to Liberal and national held electorates, in a desperate attempt to pork barrel their seats. Though one minister fell on her sword, the money remained spent, and Labor electorates missed out again. It's an economic campaign of punishment. The only savings this government seeks to find are in not spending any money in Labor seats, where they don't think they can win. If you live in a seat that they don't think they can win, they don't want to give you anything, even though it's your money. They are not investing. They are not investing wisely. They are not investing fairly. They are investing in themselves and a small part of our country. And that's because they have a miserly and small vision. It's time to be done with the Morrison government. Today's analysis in the Guardian newspaper shows that just 15 per cent of projects that were announced <coughs> under the government's multi-billion infrastructure budget splurge have actually been endorsed by Infrastructure Australia. The very agency that is there to weigh up where do we invest our money as Australians in our country to get the best value for our dollar. 15 per cent of the projects advanced by that body, Infrastructure Australia, were supported by the government. The rest of them they made up themselves for their own advantage. That is a failure of government. It's a sign of a rotten government that does not deserve another term. Imagine how much more debt they're going to plunge us into over another three desperate years of trying to keep office if they get back. And, and if all of that wasn't low enough, the government even rorted the disaster relief fund. In the middle of one of the worst floods ever to hit the Northern Rivers, the government denied funding to the local government areas in the federal seat of Richmond, so ably represented by my colleague Justine Elliott who has worked so hard for her constituency, alongside Janelle Safin at state level, fighting for a bit of a fair go. I mean, people are there with everything they've ever owned floating down the street, mud running through their houses, and the country has to wait for Mr Morrison not to show up. Sad enough, he had COVID. That we can accept. But he could have sent someone. He could have sent someone to stand up and say, I see your suffering. I understand the trauma of your community, and I will support you in your hour of need. But instead of doing the right thing, he failed to exercise a moral compass. He can pretend all he likes, but when Lismore was in flood and in need, not only did he not show up, he didn't even bother to send somebody to represent him and do the job that we should have a, that we have a right to expect of our leaders. Now, the fact is, when the rain falls and the fires burn, disaster doesn't discriminate. Whether it's a Labor voter or a Liberal voter or a Labor seat or a Liberal seat, disasters upend lives and they ruin dreams. And people can be powerfully resourceful. They can do a great job in their community, and they will. Australians will rise to the challenge. 
But there are some things that are bigger than just a handful of people can hold. And that is why we collectively elect a government. That is why we pay our taxes, so that the government can wisely invest our money to ensure we all benefit and we're all protected and we're all looked after. And not in an arbitrary, selfish way that gives them a good grab for the TV or the radio, but in a way that actually supports a community in need. And every single time in the last three years of Mr Morrison's shambolic and morally bankrupt government, he has failed that test. And it's no wonder, given that, that he shut down entire streets because he's too cowardly now, too cowardly to meet locals anywhere in the northern rivers of New South Wales. I want to talk about debt. Now, the clarion call from former Prime Minister Tony Abbott was that Australia had to live within its means, that we had to address an alleged disaster, a, a debt and deficit disaster. But right now, thanks to the rorts and the many wasted programs, the Liberals and their junior partners, the Nationals, have raised Australia's debt to nearly a trillion dollars. That is five times, five times the level of debt that Labor left when we left office. Five times. Mr Abbott called it a debt and deficit disaster. Look what this Liberal government that pretends to be great economic managers have done to our country. And what have we got to show for it? I was in the seat of parks talking to people in Dubbo and Wilcannia and Cobar and Broken Hill and out of the Menindee Lakes at Sunset Strip. How did they benefit from the regional infrastructure program that funded a swimming pool in North Sydney? They laugh. They laugh when I point that out to them. And they know that this government has completely walked away from telling the truth to Australians. It's so twisted and bitter and cynical in its representation of what they've done to this country. So many liberal lies, just like the one about no cuts to the ABC, no cuts to education, no cuts to health. Every Australian knows this government is unfit to govern and it certainly has no economic credentials on which to stand other than its own fanfare of a mythology about the Liberals being good with money. Australians deserve better, they deserve value for money and they deserve integrity in government. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I first would like to thank those senators that have contributed to this debate. These additional estimates appropriation bills seek authority from the parliament to additional expenditure of money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. Passage of the bills will ensure continuity of government programs, commencement of new activities <coughs> agreed by the government since the 2021-2022 budget, and the Commonwealth's ability to meet its obligations for the remainder of the 2021-2022 um, as they fall due. Details of the bills were considered in the additional estimates process, and once again I thank all senators for their contribution and commend these bills to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bills be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Appropriation Bill number 3, 2021-2022. Appropriation Bill number 4, 2021-2022. <clears throat> so no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? No. Um, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move that this bill is now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. Appropriation Bill number 3, 2021-2022. Appropriation Bill number 4, 2021-2022. The 
President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following <coughs> bills for concurrence. Supply Bill No. 1, 2022-23, Supply Bill No. 2, 2022-23, and Supply Parliamentary Debates Bill No. 1, 2022 and 23. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Supply Bill No. 1, 2022-2023. Supply Bill No. 2, 2022-2023. Supply Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 2022-2023. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to exempt these bills from the bill's cut-off order. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Minister. I table a statement of reasons justifying the. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. I move that the provisions of the paragraphs five to eight of the Standing Order One 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 not apply to these bills. So the question is: the motion is moved by the Minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And I think I'm calling Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam <coughs> Deputy President. I rise to speak on the supply bills number one and supply bill number two, as well as the supply parliamentary department bill number one. 2022-2023. These bills are required to ensure continuity of government for the 22-23 financial year, and Labor supports these bills. But in, in supporting these bills, there are uh, a few short remarks I'd like to make. Those office opposite have been in power for almost a decade. That's nearly 10 years that they've had to act on some of the pressures that are clearly here with us now. But they take their lead from their Prime Minister. Apparently, you've got to wait for a problem to become a crisis before you can act. Wait until wages haven't just flatlined but actually go backwards, leaving the average worker hundreds of dollars worth off before you can do anything about it. And it's never meaningful action once a problem has become a crisis, is it? They don't have the vision to come up with a plan that will actually help Australians for the long term. It's all about political management with the Morrison government, short-term fixes, one-off payments to get through the media cycle or, in this case, the next election. This is a government that is long on politics but short on plans, and this budget is just another example of that. What are they doing about the crisis that remains in aged care? Oh, there's a one-off payment for staff. That's it. And no real commitment uh, to implement the findings of the Royal Commission, including in minimum staffing levels. On wages, they've come up short 52 of the 55 times they've presented wage forecasts, but they want us to believe that this time they really mean it. And still, wages in this financial year go backwards. What they've handed down in this document is a band-aid, not a budget for the future. All of the announcements in the world can't cover up the fact that they have tucked billions of dollars away over the course of this term in office in slush funds that they wrought all the way to the election. And there's no reason for us to believe that this budget is anything different. With a, nearly a trillion dollars in debt and deficits for as far as the eye can see, yet the only thing that the Treasurer and the Prime Minister have their eyes on is how they can hide billions in the budget to pork barrel their way through the election and save their political lives. The Safer Communities Fund got a top up last night. We know that this is one of the government's favourite funds to rort. 91 per cent of round three funding went to coalition's target seats. We wonder how much of that $50 million top up is going to be distributed genuinely, or is it going to be just happen in the same way? The same way that we saw 77 per cent of the commuter car park funds funnelled into coalition seats, the Building Better Regions funds wrought, sports wrought, so many examples of this government using the budget as the Liberal Party's own re-election fund. Is this really a budget for everyone? 
or is it a budget for those who live in the electorates that Mr Morrison wants to pick up votes in? No wonder they haven't funded the Federal Anti-Corruption Commission uh, Mr Morrison promised over 1,200 days ago. With these kind of statistics, I'm not surprised they're worried about what it might find, not to mention the colossal waste we've seen at the hands of this Prime Minister and his Treasurer. Over half a billion dollars has gone out the door to major consultancy companies in just the first eight months of this financial year alone. $20 billion in JobKeeper that went to companies whose, profits or whose revenue increased during COVID. $20 billion. Billions of dollars on a second-rate NBN blowout. Billions spent on the submarine deal with the French before it being cancelled and with damages still to come. $6 million on a COVID safe app that didn't work. The list goes on and on. And one of the most concerning things in this year's budget, which there hasn't been much discussion on yet, but I expect there will be, is the $3 billion worth of hidden cuts forecast for after the election. So what we see from this government, and it sums up their approach around political fixes versus governing for everybody, is that there's a big load of expenditure this side of the election and then secret cuts to services after the election. And we don't know what they are. And this morning, when asked, the Treasurer didn't know what they were either or just wasn't telling us. $3 billion. Is it cuts to Medicare? Is it cuts to um, payments? Is it cuts to uh, Great Barrier Reef? I mean, who knows? We have no idea where these cuts are going to be made. What we do know is that they come in after the election. So that's what this Prime Minister has done. That's what this Treasurer has done in this budget, is say, look, here's a bit of a Band-Aid to get us through the next two months, three months, four months, and we're going to give you this. But then, when the election's over, if we are to win, this is what we're actually really about. So these secret cuts have to be called out and the government needs to explain what they are. They cannot sneak their way through an election campaign when their own budget documents show $3 billion is going to be cut from spending programs after the election. We need to know the answer now. It's not good enough to hide it in the decisions taken but not yet announced column of the budget. We saw what they did with that last time when they hid $16 billion there. Oh yeah, we've made all these decisions. We're just got not, not going to tell you until it politically suits us. Well, this is the, exactly the same thing that's happening here. In decisions taken but not yet announced, in the years following the election, we are going to cut services. We're just not going to tell you what they are. Could be Medicare, could be aged care, could be the NDIS. Who knows? But the Treasurer knows, the Prime Minister knows, the Cabinet knows, presumably, because they signed off on the budget, and nobody's talking about it. Well, with a few weeks to go before the election, we need to call this out, and the government needs to be upfront with what they have hidden in that part of the budget. Because I think we've cottoned onto it, Australians have cottoned onto it. They know they can't trust this government. They know that um, this government doesn't tell the truth. They know this Prime Minister doesn't tell the truth. They know it's all about marketing and quick fixes, never taking responsibility, never, being, never planning, never preparing, only managing a crisis in a media cycle. And that's what this budget is. It's a political fix. It's not a plan for the future. And what Australians need is a plan for a better future. And that's what the Labor Party, under the leadership of Anthony Albanese, will offer and will campaign on and will deliver if we win government. And that's our plans to get wages moving, our plans on cheaper childcare, our plans on cheaper energy, cheaper and cleaner energy and the jobs and the economic opportunities that come with that, 
on free TAFE and skilling the nation after years of neglect that have let us in the situation where we have, at the moment, low unemployment and massive skills mismatch across the country. That's because of the failure of this government to deal with the skills crisis in this country, which has led to the skills crisis through lack, lack of planning. And most importantly, for many Australians, how we deal with Medicare, how we guarantee Medicare, how we protect Medicare from this mob on the other side of the chamber. Because strengthening Medicare and protecting Medicare is in Labor's DNA. We created it, we've protected it, we will continue to do so. And we need to know whether those $3 billion in cuts that have been outlined in this budget after the election are about cutting people's access to Medicare. And until the government comes clean on that, that's what we will presume, because they've got form on that. Uh, so I would challenge the government to come clean on what those $3 billion worth of cuts are. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I must uh, rise and correct Senator, Senator Gallagher. She, um, uh, perhaps in, uh, uh, in the interest of brevity, forgot to mention the $3.5 billion of, uh, of uh, spending on utility helicopters that, have, that has now been cancelled as well, and the Army battle management system that has been withdrawn from service. Oh, thank you very, uh, very much, Senator Gallagher, for leaving that for me. That's good. Um, because because there is uh, you know, a huge problem in, that, in the defence space. <clears throat> Everything the Prime Minister is doing is targeting 2040. We're going to have a submarine in 2040. We're going to have uh, uh, submarine bases in 2040. We're going to have an upsized ADF in 2040. When right now we have uh, trouble in the Ukraine, that's a, a uh, spark that may let off the tinderbox that is uh, Taiwan and China. We've had uh, Chinese warships travelling through the Arafura Sea, lighting up P-8 aircraft with a laser, uh, regular deployments to watch Talisman Sabre, and now we see that likely we're going to have uh, a, a military base set up by China in uh, the Solomons. And yet the government focuses on 2040. Can I just remind the chamber and all those, those listening that the only way a 2040 submarine uh, delivered to the Royal Australian Navy will be able to properly uh, help us in defence is if it's got a time machine to be able to come back to the present moment where we need to have good ADF capability. And, uh, you know, I was disappointed in the budget last night uh, you know, with some of the uh, spending commitments uh, envisaged for the future submarine, I'll come back to those. I do want to talk about the fuel uh, excise uh, cut, and uh, I note that I do have a second reading amendment uh, in relation to this. Uh, on the 22nd of February, I called on the government to reduce uh, the fuel excise, and I did that because, uh, whilst it was before the Ukraine. Uh, crisis, we could see the Russians mounting up at the border, and it was almost inevitable that uh, the Russians were going to cross into the into Ukraine. And uh, so I made a call for a cut in fuel excise. Then, of course, uh, we've, uh, we saw uh, a whole bunch of ministers uh, responding uh, to that call on Ben Fordham's show uh, on the 9th of March. Uh, ben Fordham says, are you absolutely ruling out any change to the Fuel Act excise between now and Election Day? Angus Taylor, what I'm saying is that we have no plans to do that, Ben. We have no plans to do that. Scott Morrison on the 15th of uh, March at a presser, you don't go and completely recalibrate your budget based on fluctuation in, in oil prices. They've gone up, they've, they've gone down. seen those comments. We go to the 17th of March, ask whether we're cutting uh, the, the, the tax uh, would, that would help with the cost of uh, living. The, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister said, no, it won't. But what we'll do is, uh, is I'll take, it'll take the, the, the money away that we spend on roads. And it's quite an irony that when uh, the Treasurer gave a hint uh, 
early in the week, or in fact over the weekend, that the fuel excise would be cut. At the same time, he announced $18 billion in infrastructure programs, including roads. So the Australian public have to make sure they understand this. Fuel excise is not connected to road spending. Fuel excise, by law, must go into consolidated revenue, and it is politicians who decide how much is spent on roads. So there's a fallacy there. But um, the government has been dragged, kicking and screaming, uh, to yesterday to have a reduction in fuel excise, which is desperately needed by Australians who are suffering from increased rents, increased groceries. We've seen pr fuel prices go from $1.80 to $2.20 per litre, and that's crippling. You can't, uh, uh, you can't ease off on your, your fuel expenditure. You have to go to work. You have to take the kids to school. You do need to go to uh, a doctor. And in, indeed, if you're in the country, that situation is worsened because all of the distances are much greater. So it was obvious we needed some form of relief. But what did we see last night? We saw a, a halving of the fuel excise for six months. For six months. Let me tell you, the reason the fuel prices are high is because there has been uh, an unla unlawful invasion of Ukraine by Russia. That's driven up the fuel prices because of sanctions. And if you look at what's happening in the Ukraine, it, the Russians are bogged down. They are not going to annex, thank, thank goodness, they're not going to annex Ukraine. They might get part of it and stop, and there will be some sort of negotiated settlement, no doubt. But uh, before that, there will be an insurgency. And these fuel prices are going to remain high until uh, that insurgency concludes, because the sanctions are going to stay. There is no way that this is going to be over in six months. No way. And the government should know that. The, sh the government should be aware of the strategic circumstances. So why is it only, it only given uh, six months of relief? Because that's what it takes to get through the election. That's why we've only got six months of cut in the fuel excise, because it's about buying votes. In fact, when I look at the budget as released last night, it is a budget to buy power, with a whole bunch of short-term sugar hits, you know, billions and billions of dollars being spent to buy uh, power, and that money will be a debt for our children and grandchildren. That's what's, uh, that's what's going on. And when I look at the budget last night, and particularly as a South Australian, I'm very disturbed. It is clear to me that uh, Mr Morrison has delivered a budget that is a payback budget for South Australia. It's a payback budget because South Australian electors decided to elect uh, Premier Malinouskis as, as, the, as our leader in South Australia, state leader. And so I'm sure that what's happened is the government's gone through and struck out, deleted all the bits about South Australia and said, here's our punishment to you. Here's our payback to you. If I look at the expenditure that's taken place, um, it, it delivers so little to South Australia. The percentage of infrastructure spend for South Australia has gone from 22 per cent last year to only 16 per cent this year in terms of um, proportions. South Australia has also been left out of the government's regional transformational infrastructure program, which is basically $7.1 billion, $7 billion targeting at the Northern Territory, North and, and Central Queensland, the Pilbara and the Hunter. Let's make no mistakes, and I, I, I've just glanced at a, a Greens resolution uh, a, a amendment in relation to this. But let's not make no mistake. That is, that is pork barrelling. That is pork barrelling uh, to win an election. Now, I just want to make sure the chamber is really clear on this. Pork barrelling is corruption. I'll say that again. Pork barrelling is corruption. It's taking taxpayers' money and directing it. Uh, in, uh, at, uh, at projects that are intended to buy votes, 
to, to allow people to stay in power. That is using taxpayers' money for personal benefit. And we really have to think about change here. I'm sick and tired of uh, us sitting there watching uh, t uh, time go by and then just prior to an election suddenly a whole bunch of announcements are made. And they're made directed depending on a red or blue square in a spreadsheet. There are people who live in safe seats, and I'm talking about safe Liberal seats and safe Labor seats, who sit back and they get nothing. And you know what? There's likely to be a need for those people that is simply not being met because of political corruption. It's wrong. And I had someone ask me yesterday on, on Sky, but that's how it always has been. It, that might be the case, but it's wrong. It's wrong. We've got to change that. We've got to stand up and act with integrity. Let's start having projects planned out, going through a proper uh, needs analysis, <clears throat> a proper uh, check for value for money, making sure that we spend our money wisely in a coherent manner that seeks to grow the economic pie, to make the economic pie much tastier. None of this corruption, please. The, the Australian public are over it, including those people that might be the beneficiary of some of this pork barrelling. So I foreshadow, um, and, and I will, uh, as, uh, at an appropriate time, circulate an amendment to future appropriations bills related to that program to include South Australia. And I would think that. Uh, if Senator Lambie is listening, she'll do the same for Tasmania. And I, th I think that if, uh, if Zali Stegall is, is listening, she'll do the same for people in her electorate. Okay? Now, that will be harder for people in, in the Labor Party or the Liberal Party because uh, they have to stick within party lines. But us independents don't. And I can assure you that that amendment will be circulated in, in due course. I look at the, the budget spending for South Australia. The North-South Corridor, that's all we ever seem to get in our budget spending. There's so much that we need in South Australia that is just not being uh, addressed. I look on the Air Peninsula. We need a desal plant there. Just as Thomas Playford brought a, uh, a pipeline from Morgan to Wyala that totally transformed regional South Australia, we need to have proper water resources on the Air Peninsula. We need to have uh, uh, rail on the Air Peninsula. We need to have uh, proper power uh, ca capacity on the Air Peninsula. We need to have an extended runway at Cooper Pedy. We need to fix up the road that leads to the ferry uh, down at, uh, at Kadena in Wallaroo. We need all of those things, except this is a punishment budget for South Australians voting for the Labor Party. Make no, no, make no mistake. And I just want to give a wake-up call to, to Rowan Ramsey. Liz Haberman may well run in your electorate, and you've got to get off your butt and stop just getting uh, road funding, which is you know, just a normal share, and then you, then you stand up, you wave a flag and say, I've done a great things for the Air Peninsula or for Grey, and you simply haven't. Perfunctory. Perfunctory at best. Okay? And we saw what happened with Sam Telfer in, uh, uh, in Flinders, where Liz gave him a really good shake-up and good honour. She's taken a, a long-term safe Liberal seat and turned it into a marginal seat. And that's going to be great for the people of Port Lincoln and Sejuna and all up the west coast of the Air Peninsula. I look at the shipbuilding uh, plan. I looked at the, the, the graphic that the, the government had put in the, um, uh, in the budget around, the, uh, around uh, shipbuilding. And for South Australia, for jobs, they included the air warfare destroyer and they included the Hunter project and they included the Collins uh, full cycle docking work and, and life of type extension, but there's no graphic there that shows a future submarine. And that's because it's, dec it's a decade away. The government keeps promising uh, to South Australians projects 
like the Future Submarine Project, and we are obviously the most capable state for delivering something like that, but in actual fact nothing uh, really in the budget in relation to that. We are not going to be building a, a submarine in South Australia for a decade, if ever, because the government's realised the mistake of the 2040 deadline rolling it all the way back. Uh, they're, they're trying to roll it all the way back now. And as they try and uh, crunch that schedule, they're going to try and remove risks, and they're going to point to South Australia and gonna say, you know, no, you know what, we're not going to do that there. Just as we saw Minister Reynolds making an announcement that we're going to build a HADR ship uh, in Australia, and then, of course, because of changing strategic circumstances, we've now decided to buy that offshore. Okay? And that's, uh, you know, that, that's just the way this, uh, this government ha uh, has, has worked. So, sadly, for South Australia, there's payback in this, and uh, people should remember when they go to the election that that's exactly what's happened. We have been ignored and punished because uh, people chose to uh, vote in Peter Malinowskis. Thank you. Um, just, just before I give you the call, Senator Cox, uh, Senator Patrick, you have to uh, move your second reading amendment. Thank you, Mr Acting Dep Deputy President. I move my second reading amendment. Thank you. Senator Cox, you have the call. Thank you. Uh, we are in a climate crisis and the government is pouring fuel on the fire. We need to ensure that this budget doesn't fund opening up the climate bomb in the Beedaloo. That is why we will be taking the unusual but not an unprecedented move to seek to move an amendment to the supply bill today. We are not seeking to block supply. We will not vote against the bill, and this amendment will not affect the passage of the bill. What this amendment will do is not reduce the money being provided to the government, by the government, but it will prevent them from spending our money turbocharging massive gas projects in the Northern Territory, from the Beedaloo to Middle Arm to Barossa, just as the climate crisis has started arriving and the levy has been breached in Lismore. We are at a time in history when every moment matters and what we do matters, but unfortunately we are running out of time. We must keep coal, oil and gas in the ground. But what we see and continue to see in this place is the government's infatuation with gas projects. And this continues. It means approvals are being fast-tracked left, right and centre in this country without consent, without proper process and approvals that truly assess the damage being caused to the environment and, again, without true free, prior and informed consent. Last week I had the privilege of chairing the Environment Committee's hearing in, on the Beedaloo and I heard from traditional owners, pastoralists and other people living in the Northern Territory about how they don't want fracking on their traditional lands, how they don't want this to affect the fragile and precious ecosystem in the Northern Territory. And there's no doubt the drilling will have consequences on the flora, the fauna, and also the cattle. And this is what I heard from those farmers. And it's further compounding the impact on endangered species and savanna ecosystems. The fracking will pose a serious risk to our precious groundwater. And groundwater especially is critical in the Northern Territory because it's 90 per cent of the water that is for human purposes, including drinking water, and it's drawn from the aquifers. But here we continue to ignore the independent review of fracking in the Northern Territory, the Pepper Inquiry, the climate science that has noted the environmental, social and economic risks from fracking in the Territory. And it's clear from the evidence that I heard that our legislative frameworks that allow big corporations to get away with the destruction of country and the, led, the regulatory policy framework that's still on the drawing board for the Northern Territory government, which means there are no checks and balances. These risks are unacceptable. But despite all this, despite the significant risk, despite the wishes of the people living in the Northern Territory, 
This government gives the green light in this budget to fast track those approvals and continues the destruction of country that threatens the health, the well-being and the livelihoods of the people in the Northern Territory. Granting public money to party donors for this climate wrecking project that no one wants and that is unethical, wasteful and a danger to our children's future. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. I'd like to thank all senators who have contributed to the debate on the Supply Bill No. 1, 2022-23, the Supply Bill No. 2, 2022-23 and the Supply Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 22-23. These supply bills seek authority from the parliament for the appropriation of money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the first five months of uh, the year 2022-23. The total of the appropriation sought through these three supply bills is just over $91 billion. These bills must be passed in this session to ensure funding is available to all entities from 1 July 2022, thereby ensuring the continuity of program and service delivery in the early months of next financial year. And I also wish to emphasise that these bills only seek to appropriate money to fund government expenditure on an interim basis until the annual appropriation bills have passed. Accordingly, no new measures for the 2022-23 budget are included in these bills. Uh, in relation to Senator Patrick Their forecast is but by the time we have got to the end of September this year, they're expecting the oil prices to have fallen by then. Uh, in New Zealand, by way of contrast, they've done it for the next three months, not six months, as we, ha as we have here. We think it will take longer than three months, and that's why we've kept it uh, over the six months period through when the fuel price increases are forecast at this stage to abate. Our excise cut halves the rate, which is currently 44 cents. This is broadly consistent with the reduction proposed by Senator Patrick. And for these reasons, the government does not support uh, the proposed amendment. Uh, once again, I thank all senators for their contributions and I commend these bills to the Senate. I intend to put the question in relation to Senator Patrick's um, second reading amendment. I put the question that the second reading amendment of Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those with the question say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. I now put. I think it's, uh, that motion was uh, passed in the negative. I now put the question that the bills now be read a second time. Those with the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Supply Bill Number One, 2022 to 2023. Supply Bill Number Two, 2022 to 2023. Supply Parliamentary Departments Bill Number One, 2022 to 2023. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken? Sorry, Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Can I ask that my vote be recorded in favour of my amendment? You can Second ask, reader. And, I'll, and it will be recorded. Okay, to proceed now, Senator Patrick. Thank you. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or requests. Senator Cox. Uh, I move amendment 1571 on behalf of the Australian Greens in my name.
With the concurrence of the, of the Senate, the statements of reasons accompanying the, the request circulated for this bill will be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate. There being no objection is so ordered. Now I put the question for Senator Cox's amendment. Uh, those for the amendment uh, say aye. aye. Against, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the Lock the doors. The question is that the request for an amendment be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. And I appoint Senator McKim for the ayes uh, and Senator Urquhart for the noes. The result of the division is the result of the division is eyes nine, nose thirty one. The question is resolved in the negative. <coughs> and I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I advise that the Senate that One Nation is moving amendment on sheet 1589. These bills that are before us include an additional $690.4 million to extend the COVID vaccination program until the end of 2022. While One Nation does not oppose extending the period these vaccines are being offered, we oppose any attempt to mandate these vaccines and to extend the use of these vaccines to infants and toddlers. We support freedom of choice and acceptance of a person's choice. We oppose totalitarianism and we oppose control over people. Last night, Health Minister Hunt did indeed reveal that planning is underway to extend COVID vaccines to children aged zero to four. Babies, newborn infants, to four-year-olds. Now, the four-year-old has been described as the height of human civilization. I won't go into the reasons why, but it's quite clear. This is the precious future of our, of, our, of our species, of our nation. Clearly, this government, and I hope the Liberals are listening, this Morrison-Joyce government is intending on using the cover of the election to vaccinate infants and toddlers for a disease with a 100 per cent survival rate for a child that age. The injections are known to be killers, and now the Morrison-Joyce government wants to push it into babies. Into babies. I wish to observe these bills allocate additional funding to extend the vaccine injury compensation scheme 
to cover the administering of COVID vaccines to infants and toddlers aged zero to four. Clearly, if we are to inject these poisons into the arms of our youngest, then compensation should be on offer when the inevitable and needless injury and death results. Those injuries, those deaths, will be at the hands of this parliament and everyone who votes for these provisions. For two years now, the Liberal Party and their sell-out sidekicks, the Nationals, the Labor Party and the tail that wags the dog, the Greens, have been acting as a pharmaceutical company parliamentary lobby. Vote after vote has lined the pockets of foreign multinational pharmaceutical companies that are selling products on the basis of spurious provisional approvals, of untested or slightly partially tested experimental gene therapy treatments. Quoting the Health Minister, Greg Hunt, the world is engaged in the largest clinical vaccination trial. And yet what we've seen in this country is people forced, coerced, bullied into taking an experimental gene therapy treatment or else losing their livelihoods, their ability to food, feed their children. The notion of my choice, of my body, my, sorry, the notion of my body, my choice, such a stalwart of the Greens party, has been trashed and Greens voters have noticed. People see now the Greens are about globalist control, camouflaged behind a cloak of green. The Greens pretend to talk about being, uh, standing up to corporates, but they're the patsies of the corporates. <laughs> Everyday Australians are quite rightly asking questions around vaccine harm, prompted by the sheer volume of Australians experiencing major vaccine side effects. I met a mother last week whose 23-year-old daughter died as a result directly of a vaccine, a COVID vaccine. I've heard of many others, and I commend Senator, Pat, Senator Rennick for, for his work on this. These side effects were obvious right from the start. If a target had bothered to look, that's why we're here protecting, because they haven't bothered to look. We know that the testing, the limited, highly limited testing of these injections, COVID injections, was compromised, corrupted and falsified. We know the TGA and ATAGI failed to obtain de-identified clinical patient data from the trials. Had they done so, they would have seen the trials indicated an unacceptable level of harm and loss of life. The Morrison-Joyce government made the wrong decision in approving these vaccines, and it knew or should have known at the time the, decision, the wrong decision was made. The Australian Health Practitioner Regulator Regulatory Agency has been intimidating and threatening medical practitioners in order to suppress the truth and maintain their loyal service to the pharmaceutical industry. I've been to meetings with doctors that can now see their industry has been trashed, their profession has been trashed. We don't go in to see doctors now, we go in to see ATAGI, we go in to see TGA, we go in to see AHPRA. The doctor-patient relationship has been trashed in this country. A 3,000-year-old tradition that started with the Greeks, trashed. We now consult with the regulators. This, and now we can see doctors starting to stand up. We see the rates of miscarriages increasing 50% for some instances, 75% for others. 75% is now the rate of miscarriage, sorry, not the, not the increase in miscarriages, the rate of miscarriage amongst people at fertility clinics. 75% of women miscarriage. The Australian Health Practitioner Regula Regulation Agency has been intimidating and threatening medical practitioners in order to suppress the truth and maintain their loyal service to the pharmaceutical industry. Decisions around COVID vaccinations have been made by expert committees with unacceptable, massive, open conflicts of interest within, with the pharmaceutical industry. University academics sitting on TGA expert panels are often funded by pharmaceutical companies. Career progression for academics depends on subservience to big pharma. The provisional approval process was conflicted to a criminal degree. A royal commission is needed to unroll the layers of disinformation, corruption and conflicted decision making that has harmed so many Australians and taking at least 800 lives that we know of, with many, many more not reported because of the suppression of reporting. 
Madam Acting Deputy President, the register of childhood vaccinations was recently expanded to include flu shots. Is it the intention of this government, Minister, to include COVID shots in that register? In effect, this would make the COVID shots compulsory for children under the no jab, no play rules. Now, we do not oppose vaccines. We, we insist on freedom of choice, freedom of choice and for acceptance of that choice. Could this government and this health department be so evil as to make COVID shots compulsory for children under the no jab, no play rules? Could it be so evil? Could it be so inhuman? I do not want to find out. Today I'm moving an amendment on sheet number 1589 to ensure that these funding bills do not allocate funds for the extension of COVID vaccines to children under the age of zero, from birth to under the age of five, from birth to age four. The 47th parliament are, of course, free to make that decision. It's your decision. It's your conscience. I can only hope the debate will honour the democratic process and the right decision will be made and humanity will be treated with respect and reverence, as humans should be, especially infants to four-year-olds, newborns, newborns to four-year-olds, the height of civilization. I ask the Senate to move to, accept, to support my amendment, and I so move it. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, I was about to put the question, but the, min the minister. The minister, yep. uh, Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy. Um, President, uh, the government also opposes this amendment, just as we did for Senator Cox's request for an amendment to this to the supply bill, uh, which we believe is contrary to the bipartisan convention that supply legislation ought not be amended, unduly delayed, procedurally obstructed, or rejected. Uh, the government opposes this amendment uh, on those reasons. Uh, money bills only assign portions of consolidated revenue. Uh, by outcome and separate legislation. It is then used to give detailed legislative authority for the expenditure consistent with the High Court's Williams decision. An amendment such as this, therefore, does not belong in a supply bill uh, but in other legislative artefacts. And it's for those reasons that we will not be supporting this amendment. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, you're seeking the call, Senator Roberts. Uh, Occasion of money, Minister. We're opposing the spending of that money, the extending of that money unannounced to cover vaccinations, injections on newborns to four-year-olds. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. The question is that the supply bill number one Uh, thank you, Clark. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is a division required? Oh, I've on, I have only heard one voice at this stage. Is a division required? Uh, a division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Uh, and I appoint Senator Hanson or Senator Roberts. Tell a, I appoint uh, Senator Roberts, teller for the ayes, and Senator McCarthy, Senator, uh, teller for the noes. The result of the division is eyes to nose 34. The question is resolved in the negative. I'll give senators a moment to return to their seats. Uh, and, uh, Uh, the question now is that the Supply Bill No. 1 2022-23 be agreed to without requests for amendments and the Supply Bill No. 2 2022-23 stand as printed. Um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, the question now is that the bills be reported. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Report from Committee of the Whole. Uh, the committee has considered the supply bill number one, 2022-23 and two related bills and agreed to them without amendments. The question now is that the report be adopted. No, I'm calling the minister. Thank you. I uh, move that the report of the committee now be adopted. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, minister. Uh, the question is uh, that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The minister. I move that uh, the bills now be read a third time. Uh, thank you, minister. The question is that the bills uh, now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the Ordinary Annual Services of Government and for related purposes. 
a bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for certain expenditure and for related purposes, a bill for an act to appropriate <coughs> money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for expenditure in relation to the parliamentary departments and for related purposes. Uh, Senator Roberts, you're seeking the call. Mr. President, I just want my uh, name recorded as vo having voted no. Okay, it will be so noted. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call the clerk. Government business orders of a day number two, Treasury Laws Amendment, Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill 2022, debate on second reading and amendment moved by Senator McKim. Senator Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I am in continuation on this, so Labor supports this bill and knows that something needs to be done to combat the rising insurance premiums that North Queenslanders face, uh, due to the, the growing threat of natural disasters through that region. Uh, we have seen between 2007 and 2019 average home insurance premiums rose in real terms by 178 per cent in Northern Australia, and combined house and contents rose by 122 per cent but decreased by 3 per cent in real terms in the rest of Australia. So that gives you a real sense of the challenge facing those in North Queensland. The government tasked the ACCC to look at what could be done, uh, and the ACCC did an inquiry into Northern Australia insurance and recommended a number of measures to improve insurance affordability. However, it's important to note they did argue against creating a reinsurance pool, uh, yet the government has uh, taken up none of those recommendations of the ACCC report, but instead gone ahead with the reinsurance pool. Uh, many of those ACCC recommendations would have made a difference to insurance premiums uh, over the course of, of this government. The LNP government has had nine long years to do something to help insurance reduce insurance premiums, and yet they have only acted in the final, day, final days of parliament and days before an election is called. And after all this time, we still can't get any details from the government about the supposed savings to average insurance holders. Uh, Australians know they just can't trust this government's claims uh, when it comes to this. The PM first said it would save uh, those people in North Queensland 10 per cent on their premiums. And now you have Mr Sukkar saying it will save 46 per cent for home and contents and 58 per cent for strata insurance. Although the government have been using the language that those savings would apply to people with the most acute cost pressures, they still actually won't detail or define how many people would fit this category. Um, so we have no idea how many people they're claiming would benefit uh, from these savings. So if you have the Prime Minister first saying it would be 10 per cent, and now you have Minister Sukkar saying something different, and they won't actually release any modelling or any detail to give proof to their claims. The government have been very secretive about this modelling that underpins this, these apparent savings claims. Even despite the Senate Economics Committee inquiry into this legislation, the government continues to claim public interest immunity. The government's refusal to release this critical information has made it extremely difficult for the insurance companies to assess these claims and be able to model the impacts to their customers in North Queensland. We heard this in the Senate Economics Committee inquiry into this bill. A number of witnesses raised concerns about the lack of transparency on this modelling. The RSEQ submitted to the committee that, and I quote, to date RSEQ cannot assess the impact the pool will have on our members' home insurance premiums, primarily because we have not received proposed pricing rates or associated modelling from the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation. Uh, during hearings, the representatives from the RSEQ confirmed that they still hadn't heard anything regarding the modelling, saying, the reality is that we cannot determine the savings at this point in time until we see inf more information, and that includes the price from the ARPC. We need to understand what the pool is going to cover. Similarly, the Northern Australia Insurance Lobby said it would like to see the modelling, uh, as it was uncertain who would actually see the savings, saying that, we would love to see the modelling and how that will impact policyholders, because it says up to 46 per cent. Are 90 per cent of people going to get a 5 per cent saving, and only 10 per cent get the 46 per cent saving? Sure Insurance, which has a lot of coverage in North Queensland, 
uh, were concerned about these changes could result in their policyholders actually receiving an increase in insurance premiums. The prospect of some policyholders being potentially handed a non-negotiable price rise because of the pool's introduction is clearly not acceptable for Shaw's customers and may potentially be viewed as a failure of government policy in its stated public commitment to insurance affordability. So that's someone who has grown a business in North Queensland, providing affordable insurance to those people, saying that they are nervous that this could actually lead to an increase in their premiums for their customers. As you can see, it's not only Labor who's been calling for transparency of the modelling, it's the companies who are providing insurance to North Queenslanders, which makes it more outrageous when North Queenslanders are paying record prices for insurance and yet this government somehow claims that it's not in the public interest to release this information. How can North Queenslanders trust this government, who still hasn't acted on the findings of the ACCC report and has spent nine long years in power and has done nothing to ease the cost of living and now trying to pass reinsurance as at last moments of parliament, and yet won't release the critical modelling underpinning this legislation? Labor in the Economics Committee raised concerns about the claims period. Uh, currently, the legislation has a 48-hour claims period following a downgrade of a cyclone by the Bureau of Meteorology. Many groups are saying that this is completely inadequate. These calls were presented in the report and are made by groups like the RSEQ, the Insurance Council of Australia, the National Insurance Brokers Association, Northern Territory Chamber of Commerce, the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, the Council of Small Business Australia, and the North Queensland Regional Organisations of Council. So a wide array of organisations who are concerned about the limiting nature of this legislation uh, for insurance claims as well. This is best evidenced by the North Queensland Regional Organisation of Councils, who stated in its, its submission to the committee, in our opinion, a claim period of 48 hours is inadequately short. For example, the Herbert River and Burdekin catchments are over 132,330 kilometres, or about 7.6 per cent of Queensland. In catchments this size, it takes several days for the full effect of cyclone-related floods to be felt. It would be unfair for communities affected by trop tropical cyclones, related floods, to miss out on the benefits of this legislation simply because they live in a large catchment where floodwaters take more than 40 hours to reach them. For North Queensland, a 48-hour claim caveat is inadequate and needs to be extended. Labor has called on the government to be spending more on mitigation as well. Labor is committed to spending $200 million a year on disaster prevention and mitigation. The Morrison government set up a $4 billion emergency response fund. It's now got $4.7 billion in it and has accrued $750 million in interest while the government has not spent a cent in mitigation projects. I've seen firsthand how crucial these mitigation projects are. In April last year, I travelled to Roma with Labor's Shadow Assistant Minister for Financial Services, Matt Thistlewaite, and we met with Mayor Tyson Golder, who showed us the benefits of the, the flood levy had brought to Roma and how it has led to reductions in insurance premiums for those in town. The levy was a great example of how governments can deliver important infrastructure projects that prevent flood damage to houses and businesses but lead to ongoing savings in insurance premiums. These are the kind of projects we need to see the government invest in to protect businesses and households but also help to reduce the cost for insurance premiums in North Queensland. But unfortunately, as we've seen uh, with the reinsurance pool and the issue of ongoing uh, exorbitant costs of insurance in North Queensland, uh, this is a government that have not had nine years to act. Uh, they finally tried to act now before parliament finishes and we are days before an election being called, but you can still have little confidence that this is going to lead to a reduction in insurance premiums for those people in North Queensland who need it the most. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to make a contribution as um, ha happily having been a member of the Northern Australia uh, infrastructure committee and travelling quite extensively in particularly health uh, committees across the north of this country. And invariably, no matter what policy we were interrogating, invariably the issue of insurance for people in the north would come up. And it's like they're the canary in the coal mine for the rest of the country. I'm a senator for New South Wales. 
Overnight, people in Lismore were once again having to evacuate because the reality of what is happening with our climate, which has been long denied by those opposite, has actually been doing its work and changing the way in which our planet is operating and the way in which we are able to live going forward. Not everybody has insurance. Sometimes you might have just forgotten to fill out the form, but many times it's because people hit a point where they simply cannot afford to do it anymore. They weigh it up. The risk, the reward. Household insurance now can cost $2,000 in a non-high-risk environment. What happens when you get to the point, as has happened in northern Queensland, and I see Senator Malandiri McCarthy here from the Northern Territory, Senator Watt, they know all too well that there has been a 300 or 400 per cent increase in insurance in the north of this country. I'm delighted to see people back in the building and here in the gallery because you know what I'm talking about. The Mayor of Alice Springs, well, I'm sure the Mayor of Alice Springs, I recognise you here. It's great that you've joined us in the Senate. And I bet that you and your council and your state government know about this issue. And this government knew about this issue. It's known about this issue for three terms, for nearly 10 years. And in just a matter of weeks, they're going to line up and they're looking for us to re-elect them to have another crack. So here we are, just the very last day that the Senate's sitting. So urgent was this need that has been known to this government for a decade, so urgent that they finally get the car into gear and bring a piece of legislation in here that's beautifully titled, because you know, with a government that's all about marketing, the title matters. Forget about the substance. It's the con job from the top, from Mr Morrison, whose character was revealed in this chamber tonight by Senator Fiavanti Wells. And she knows it. The longer that guy hangs around, the more Australians are learning about him. The ultimate con artist, the ultimate marketeer, not a man for leadership and not a man of integrity. Because this is what he's called it. Treasury Laws Amendment. Well, it's got to come from the Treasury Department. Cyclone and flood damage reinsurance pool. And doesn't that sound good to people who can't afford their insurance? Oh, great. Well, the government are, come, are going to come and rescue us. And because I can't afford 2,000 times 2, 4,000, or 2,000 times 3, 6,000, or 2,000 times 8,000, because I can't afford two to $8,000 to insure my house, the government are charging in, albeit belatedly, on their white horse at the last minute, and they're going to make it possible for me to insure my house. You missed the battle? Absolutely. They've missed the battle for sure. But you know what else? They're riding in on a horse that's a pretense. Because when you start to look at the fine print in this piece of legislation, you see it shrink and shrink and shrink about who might be eligible to get some bit of assistance with their insurance from this particular piece of legislation. That's the problem. Senator Watt made a fantastic contribution yesterday, and I also acknowledge Senator Chisholm, who fight here every day for the people of Queensland. They talked about the market failure. They talked about outsourcing of government responsibility to make policyholders pay and pay and pay for what has been emerging as a failed market in the last several years. And I believe it was Senator Watt who drew my attention to the fact that this legislation indicates that it, people with the mo most acute cost pressures might just might get something. And if you're one of those lucky few who are subject to what needs to be classified as a cyclone damage, not flood damage, that's not included, that's, that's part of what will be implied by the marketing man who is no leader, 
you might get something. And if you're one of those few lucky ones, at the very, very best, you might get 46 per cent. Well, that's the line that goes out from the government. And that's what we see here day in, day out. The con job. What's the biggest way we can gild this lily and pretend we're actually caring for the people of Australia? All announcement. All announcement. No delivery. Bringing this bill in at this point of time, as little as it is and as little as it does, Labor will support it because people need something. God, they absolutely desperately need something. But, and if, if this is the best that this government can do, well, we're not going to stop the people of Northern Australia from getting the relief that they can get, that small bit. But we've got no confidence in what they've told us. And we know that despite the press release and the numbers that they put out, the fine print reveals a different story. And in fact, the claims that they make and the numbers that they pull out of the air are in fact really pulled just out of the air. They, they can't produce the modelling. You know, smart people, remember when you were at school and the kids were fantastic at maths, they go on to be actuaries, they do their job for the country, they tell the truth, they write the numbers, they do the sums and they figure out what it's going to cost. That's modelling. The government claim they have it. They also claim that it's not in the public interest for you to know about what's in that modelling. Like, it's breathtaking, breathtaking in the art of cons, a con man and trickster. And that's what happens when you have a man who's leading the country by PowerPoint, by marketing plans, not with an ethical bone in his body, with no moral compass, with no integrity an inability to tell the truth to the people of Australia. And the people it's going to hurt are the people who will be sold this false promise by this government. People in the north. I'll tell you who else is struggling today. is those people in Lismore. Now, we all know that the Prime Minister doesn't ho hold a hose when the fires are burning. And I will acknowledge that the Prime Minister had COVID in the time that Lismore was suffering its worst in recent weeks. So, We'll give him a leave pass for that. But surely, surely he could have sent someone from the government. I mean, he has got a treasurer, he's got a whole raft of ministers who could have actually done the job of going to Lismore, seeing what was really going on, and giving people hope, heart, comfort, and resources, and a plan. They talk a big game for business, but they fail to deliver. It took Mr Morrison nine days. People's houses were awash. Mud-stained walls. Houses, 3,000 houses, I believe it was, declared unfit for habitation in a community where rents are going through the roof and the market is already very, very small. The need was desperate on every single level. Instead of sending somebody, no, Mr Morrison, hung on, hung on, hung on a bit more until nine days when he could show up and do a photo, a photo op. What did he actually deliver? Well, he shut a few roads so that he wouldn't have to meet the community. He's a prime minister who is running from responsibility and he should run fast and hard because he is incapable of leading us in the way that we deserve. He's incapable of leading for people who are profoundly vulnerable right now in Lismore. And there's a contrast. You know, we have amazing people at state level in the Labor Party, and I've been waiting for the Prime Minister to come out with some sort of a plan that was digestible for the people of Lismore to give them hope to actually provide money, resources and targeted planned support for businesses. Businesses in regional communities are the heart of the community. No businesses, no jobs. Labor understands 
and you need businesses that are successful. All that can work together in an ecosystem when it's properly supported by a government that doesn't waste money and rot money and buy seats for itself. So when Mr Minns, the leader of the opposition, went up to Lismore, he had a flood response plan. Haven't heard that. Haven't heard that from the government of Australia with all its resources. And it's practical in nature because all the weasel words, all the magic words, all the marketing words, all the pretense of the Prime Minister cannot actually meet the reality of ordinary Australians. They needed a plan. And this is what a plan might sound like. So Mr Min said, what do families and businesses need? They need the waiving of local and state government fees and charges for those impacted by the flood. Well, Mr Morrison said, oh, not my responsibility. We're talking about local and state costs. But where's his conversation with the state to say, I know that you're going to have a big financial burden there. How can the government of Australia help you? That hasn't happened. Mr Min said, waive or defer payroll tax for small businesses in flood-affected areas. I'm pretty sure Having grown up in a family business and continuing to have a business with my husband, that if I was in Lismore and I was inundated, that would be good news to hear. And what can Mr Morrison do about it? Hands off, do nothing, pretend. And perhaps somewhere down the track, if he is elected again, Five minutes to midnight, we'll get another bill like the one that we're debating today. Wholly inadequate, full of contradiction, unable to be verified because of a failure to release modelling. If we're lucky, that's what we might get from Mr Morrison and his climate deniers. That's where we are. That's where we are, Australia, at the tail end of a decade of denial of climate realities. And you can only pretend for so long before the game's up. Well, the game's up, the time's up. Mr Morrison's time is absolutely certainly up. It's time to elect a decent government that will stand for all Australians. And when you are in need, a government that you can count on to deliver the basic things you need to get back on your feet and have a little bit of hope. We're capable of doing that. We are capable of doing that as a nation, but not with this party and government and not with the soulless, heartless, valueless Mr Morrison in charge. Senator Hanson, I think you've got a short contribution. I, I, I do, thank you, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to contribute to this debate on this bill, uh, a bill that is being debated right when we are seeing the effects of the climate crisis before our very eyes. The climate has changed. These floods that we have experienced and witnessed, and sadly many have lost their homes and their livelihoods as a result of, have been fuelled by the climate crisis. I wanted to write, take the opportunity today to contribute to this debate because something extraordinary happened in this place yesterday. And it was that the Environment and Communications Committee was forced to make an interim report about the conduct of a US company. This was, into, this was as part of the inquiry into the Beedaloo Basin. Now, this US company, called Tamboran, has previously, just in the last month, received $7.5 million in public money from the Morrison government. This company, which is a uh, wholly owned subsidiary Sweet Pea Petroleum, a company registered uh, to a notorious tax secrecy building in Delaware, is now involved in getting public money from the Morrison government to frack in the Beedaloo Basin. As part of the Senate inquiry into the Beedaloo drilling program, the committee wrote to this company on three occasions, inviting them to appear and to answer questions in light of receiving this public money. In the first two requests, the company replied saying they did not want to appear, with the last request inviting them to reconsider and there was a delay in the response. 
but they again refused and made the claim, and I'll quote here, we understand we absolutely we are absolutely entitled not to appear if we wish. Let me be very clear about this, Madam Acting Deputy President. A Senate inquiry asks a company that is in receipt of public money to appear before us at a hearing to answer questions, and this company says they don't have to come. The committee then resolved to issue a summons to compel this company to attend. Senator Smith. I just want to confirm that we're actually debating the Treasury Laws Amendment Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill. Uh, if Senator Hanson wants to make a contribution in regards to a Senate committee report, there are opportunities later in the day to do that. Senator Hanson, I would draw you to the um, debate in question in relation to the Treasury Laws Amendment. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I appreciate that. And the reason this is being put on the record today is because there will be changes uh, to the sitting schedule later. And I just want to Senator, make it clear that this relates directly Senator Hanson, to this bill. Senator Hanson, Senator Smith, on a point of order? Or? I think we conduct the business based on the red that is before us. And whether or not what Senator Hanson is speculating about is accurate or not, um, we'll have to wait to see. But the matter before you and the chair is the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill, not consideration of a committee report. I think Senator Smith, uh, in fairness, Senator Hanson does have a point. Uh, I would draw you back. I have given you indulgence to, to speak at the end of this debate, uh, and uh, I would draw you back uh, to the subject matter at hand. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The reason why it is related to this uh, piece of legislation is because what this company is doing is making climate change worse. What this company is doing with taxpayers' money is making climate change worse. And our job here in the Senate is to scrutinise and to hold government to account and to hold those who take and are in receipt of public funds to account. Now, it is absolutely disgraceful that a company, despite being given a summons, refused Senator to Smith. appear. Senator Hanson, Senator Smith. Deputy President, I'm prepared to match Senator Hanson's persistence with my persistence. So, if we'd like to continue in this fashion, toing and froing, then I'm happy to oblige. Senator Hanson, I think we've traversed this issue. I don't want to. Uh, I've made my point clear. I really do think that uh, unless you are speaking on this piece of legislation, I would invite you to draw your comments to a conclusion. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, the conclusion in this, uh, on the end of this debate and this bill, a bill that is uh, spending and asking for public money to be spent on cleaning up the climate crisis in response to the climate crisis, and here we have uh, a company that refuses to apply by a summons. And let me be very clear here: this is a bad precedent for any any company, for any process for this Senate to not take seriously. I would appreciate I would appreciate the Senate actually gives proper time to debate and discuss this matter because it is about the powers of this place. So I will conclude my speech here. But let me say, it's a, it's a message to the government and to the opposition. Please give us some time this afternoon to make sure we can discuss this properly, because otherwise the powers of the Senate are useless. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Firstly, I would like to thank those senators who have contributed to this debate. This bill will establish a reinsurance pool for cyclones and related flood damage, the pool, backed by a $10 billion annually reinstated Commonwealth guarantee. Access to affordable insurance is vital to the economic prosperity and resilience of Australians who live and work in Northern Australia. This bill will deliver on the government's commitment to maximising Northern Australia's potential and to ensure that Australians in cyclone-prone areas have access to affordable insurance. The bill will improve the accessibility and affordability of insurance for households and small businesses with cyclone and related flood damage risk by, ensuring, by reducing the cost of reinsurance. This is estimated to reduce premiums by $2.9 billion and cover more than 800,000 households, strata and small business property insurance policies in Northern Australia. 
The pool is also expected to increase competition by encouraging greater insurance participation, insurer participation in cyclone-prone areas and support high levels of insurance coverage for property owners. The savings generated by the pool uh, will be targeted to policyholders with medium to high exposure to ensure that the Northern, the Northern Australians facing the largest insurance affordability pressures receive the greatest benefits from the pool. Following a direction from the government, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission the ACCC, has begun work to monitor and collect data from, uh, to ensure that savings are passed through to policyholders and that the reinsurance pool is delivering on its intended outcomes. In addition, the Treasury will also undertake a 12-month review of the pool. Finally, I would like to thank the Senate Economics Legislation Committee for their consideration of the bill and for their recommendation that the bill be passed, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. I understand, Senator McKim, you have a second reading amendment. Uh, um, would you like to move that? Oh. I, I, Senator McKim, thank you. I've been reminded that uh, you've already moved it. The question is that the second reading uh, amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order, there being eight ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'm now moving uh, to the second uh, amendment that was put during the second reading debate. That's the amendment by Senator Watt. So the question is. Oh, I thought it had. Uh, Senator McAllister, are you moving that? Yes, I do. I move the amendment circulated in the name of Senator Watt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister in the name of Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. Um, division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
the doors. I will give the whips a few moments. Uh, I'll give the whips a few moments. Right, the question is that the second reading oh, stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone, tell her for the eyes, and Senator Smith, tell her for the nose. There have been 26 ayes, 27 noes. The question is resolved in the negative. I'll now put the second reading of the bill. The question is the second reading be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now just let the Deputy President step in. to amend the Terrorism Insurance Act 2003 in order to establish a cyclone and related damage reinsurance pool operated by the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together as a whole? Thank you. There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills stand as printed. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I uh, move on behalf of the Australian Greens the amendments on sheet 1559. They're standing in my name and they have been circulated. And just extremely quickly, um, just, uh, I want um, to make— Just a moment, Senator McKim. Yes. Are you seeking leave to move them together? Uh, yes, please. Is leave granted? Yeah, there's no objection to leave. It's being granted. All right, thanks, De thanks, Deputy President. Uh, I just want to be very clear that uh, it is more equitable uh, that more Australians get the benefit of cheaper insurance through a government not-for-profit not reinsurance scheme. And these amendments would also mean that it would be less administratively burdensome because it wouldn't require insurers to distinguish the risk of non-cyclone-related floods and seek private market insurance for non-cyclone-related floods. In other words, all reinsurance for all flood damage uh, will be covered under this scheme. 
So this expands the scope of the scheme. It makes it more equitable, and it means that more Australians would benefit through lower insurance premiums, which are only going to continue to climb because of the climate emergency that we are living in, the breakdown of our planet's climate, which is being turbocharged by this government, uh, not least of uh, which they have turbocharged it in the budget they released last night, which has about $10 billion per year to encourage the accelerated burning and extraction of fossil fuels. I mean, make no mistake, the budget is a budget brought down by a government that is turbocharging the climate crisis. And I also observe that uh, every single dollar of those public subsidies to encourage the extraction and burning of fossil fuels is also supported by the Australian Labor Party. And what are we now about to see? Both major parties colluding to vote down a Greens amendment that would mean that more Australians get the benefit of a reduction in, the, in their insurance premiums as a result of nationalising reinsurance. And, uh, as we move forward, uh, we will see that more and more Australians need this benefit. Now, I'll, I'll conclude by making a prediction. At some stage in the not-too-distant future, the Senate will be here doing exactly what this amendment does. It will be increasing the scope of this scheme until ultimately this country—and this will be a great thing if it happened—nationalised reinsurance for all climate-related so-called natural disasters, which of course means that we will nationalise reinsurance in regards to flood, in regards to sea level rise and in regards to bushfires. And that can't happen quickly enough. It will happen one day. Mark my words. So the uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. I just wanted to place Labor's voting position on the record about this amendment. Labor won't be supporting this amendment. Uh, but I do want to reiterate some of the views I put during the second reading speech. It is not as though this government has not been warned by insurance companies for very many years about the risks that climate change pose to the frequency and intensity of natural disasters. In fact, after our second reading debate, I just went upstairs and had a bit of a look because I remember when IAG took a national leadership role, undertook research back in 2006, put a very public, a very public position about what climate change would cost, what it would mean for premiums, what it would mean for the economy. And what did the Howard government do? What did the Abbott government do? What did the Turnbull government do? What did the Morrison government do? Absolutely nothing of substance to address climate change. And here we are, 15 years later, after the insurance companies first started ringing the bell about what climate change would mean for premiums, what it would mean for communities and what it would mean for the economy. Here we are. Even in this term of government, report after report provided to this government, privately commissioned, publicly commissioned reviews about the costs and risks and the problems of underinsurance that arise. Day of the Senate sitting before an election, and the government is finally getting around to legislating their promise. Not with any data on the public record, of course, and they just all voted against putting the data that underpins their policy decision on the table, not with any data on the table, but wanting the Senate to support their position. Well, we will support the legislation, we'll vote for it, and we want the relief that is promised by the government to flow through to communities as quickly as possible. We don't intend to hold up this bill by supporting the Greens amendment. The Greens amendment is a very, very significant change indeed to the scope of the program that's proposed by government. It is of uncertain cost. 
We have no information about what the Greens' proposal would cost for the scheme, and we've got no information about what it would mean for policyholders and consumers. We're not prepared to hold up the bill. Labor would look at the inclusion of flood coverage as one of the terms in the statutory review that will already take place as a consequence of this legislation's passage, but we do not intend to vote for the amendment today. Senator Watt. Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can I just add one quick point as well? Um, the Greens flagged their intention to move this amendment um, a few days ago. And I want to put it on the record that our spokesperson on these matters, the member for Kingsford Smith, Mr Thistlethwaite, uh, wrote to the Greens asking them, you know, indicating we thought that was an idea that was worth considering, the extension of this pool to the flood areas, wrote to the Greens uh, expressing that and asking them to advise what the cost of such an amendment would be. What would be the cost to taxpayers? What would be the cost to uh, insu in, uh, insurance policy holders, and you'll be shocked to know uh, that the response from the Greens was there won't be any cost, oh. because of course that's that's Greens economics for you, um, that you can do things and they don't cost any money. Now, as Senator McAllister has indicated, uh, and as I indicated in my second reading contribution, uh, we do think that it is worth considering extending the reinsurance pool to. Uh, areas that suffer from floods. But I think if we're going to do that, we should have some idea of what it's going to cost. Uh, and it's not surprising um, that the Greens don't think that's worth considering. Um, we think the responsible way to proceed is to support the reinsurance pool as it is currently proposed and to consider this possible extension as part of the statutory review when we can understand what the cost would be to the taxpayer. Uh, and to insurance policyholders. So I think it's very important that people understand why Labor has taken the position that it has. I might just very quickly also note um, that it's disappointing that the previous second reading amendment um, that I moved was defeated by One Nation and the government. Uh, that amendment simply asked the government to come clean and release the modelling that it has, uh, which it claims shows how much North Queenslanders will save as a result of the reinsurance pool. I asked Senator Hume to release this information at estimates, uh, and she amazingly told the estimates hearing that it was not in the public interest for North Queenslanders to see the modelling that the government says it has about the savings that, that people will receive. That's why we now move this amendment, to try to get the government to release the modelling. They, they've been making all sorts of claims in the media about how much people will save, but they refuse to release the proof that they say they have. And I have to say I'm extremely disappointed that One Nation voted with them uh, to stop that information being released. Uh, as I have mentioned many, many times in this chamber, One Nation love to run around North Queensland pretending that they're on the side of battlers in North Queensland. Well, here what they've done today is vote with their allies in the LNP to stop North Queenslanders being able to see how much they will actually save from this reinsurance pool. So One Nation is now in on this with the government uh, in saying that North Queenslanders can't be trusted to see uh, the information that the government says it has about what people will save. That is very disappointing, but it is true to form because we know at the end of the day that One Nation is just another arm of the LNP and they've rolled over and backed their LNP mates once more. Uh, Senator Rice. Um, thanks, Deputy President. Um, I just wanted to put on the record of Labor's excuse for not voting for this bill and how it is completely um, not supported by the communication and the discussion that the Greens had had with the Labor Party. In fact, Labor asked us, yes, what would be the additional cost to government? And we replied that there would be no additional cost. And as was noted in the speech on the bill, the scheme has been designed to be cost neutral to the government over time. Because basically, although this is government reinsurance changing who pays for the insurance, there will still be insurance that will be purchased by people. It will reduce the cost of insurance from these massive events. 
um, by na essentially nationalising that insurance, but the cost is designed to be neutral over time. And expanding the scope of the scheme to include all flood damage wouldn't impact upon this objective. The Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation would price the additional flood damage, risking on a cost-neutral basis. I mean, insurance is a really interesting um, rep representative of the issues that we are facing by living in a climate emergency, and it's not going to go away. The costs to Australian society, the costs globally of our climate emergency are going to continue to increase. And the reality of the floods that we have been experiencing over the last months are just an indicator of what we face in this country. And it's not just flood damage from cyclones, as has been shown with the floods across Queensland and New South Wales in recent months. None of these would have been eligible um, for, for this insurance scheme because they're not cyclone related. But we know that the impact of the climate emergency is going to be increasing intensity, increasing frequency of flood events, not just from cyclones, but from those heavy downpours that come because, frankly, the science shows. Why are they happening? Because we have got a warmer climate, there is more moisture in the atmosphere, there is more ability for these flood events to occur. What we need to have is uh, the only way to be dealing this, with this is for Australia to be playing its part globally, to be acting at emergency speed, to be safeguarding our future, to be reducing the damage from our climate emergency. And that means we've got to get out of the burning, the mining, the burning, the export of coal and gas and oil. Full stop. That is what the science says. It's the only way that we're going to tackle with the damage, the loss that is being felt by Australians, that is being felt around the world. And anybody, any government that is trying to delude themselves that there is any other way out is just that, and they are misrepresenting the situation to the Australian community. It is very clear that we do not have a carbon budget left. There is no time to waste. We need to have that emergency shift, that emergency transition to get out of the mining, the burning and the export of coal and gas and oil. That is the reality that humanity is facing, and that's what this parliament needs to face up to. And We need to work out how to do it in the best way to support workers in that shift, and the Greens have got plans on the table as to how we would support workers who are currently working in those industries to be transitioned into new industries. We need to work out how to um, cope with the fact that there is already that climate change which is locked in. We've already, we're going to see floods and fires and other natural disasters due to the climate emergency continuing, and so hence measures like this reinsurance pool are important. But the reality is they're not going to be enough. The only thing that is going to be taking the required action is to be getting out of the mining, the burning and export of fossil fuel. And both parties in this government need to realise that and need to be taking the action, joining the Greens into taking the action that's required if we are going to safeguard our future. Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair. Uh, and I thank senators for that searing insight into what a Labor Greens coalition might look like. Along with the Senate Economics Legislation Committee, the government supports the passage of this bill without amendment and therefore will be opposing this amendment. Insurance affordability from cyclones has been a long-standing issue in the north of our country. The ACCC found that it was the main driver of high premiums in northern Australia, and that was na higher natural hazard risk and primarily dri driven by cyclones. Including all flood damage in a reinsurance pool would likely reduce the premium reductions available to residents in northern Australia. And we know that in other jurisdictions, such as the United Kingdom, flood reinsurance pools have required a levy to ensure that financial viability. We will be opposing the amendment. So the question is that the amendments as moved by Senator McKim on sheet 15591-33 by leave together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the amendments on sheet 1559, 1 to 33, uh, moved together by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes.
order, there being eight ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I uh, move amendment, uh, the amendments on sheet 1569 standing in my name. And are you seeking oh, leave to move them together? I do seek leave to move those thank together. You. Is thank leave you. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you. I move the amendments. So the question is that the amendments on sheet 1569, 1 and 2 moved together by leave by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Do, do you require a division? No. Thank you, Senator McKim. I'll give you the call again. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Deputy President. I uh, move the amendments on sheet 1570, standing in my name, by leave together. Thank you. Uh, you didn't need leave that time, <laughs> but that's fine. So the question is that the amendments is just moved by Senator McKim on sheet 1570, number one, that those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Can we ring the bells for one minute? Yes. Thank you. Ring the bells for one minute. One. You okay, sorry, the whips want the bells rung for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that um, Amendment 1 on Sheet 1570 revised is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes. Order. There being eight ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the, affirmative, in the negative. It being 12.15, the committee will report. The committee reports progress. Senator Birmingham, are you seeking leave? I do, uh, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business for is, today. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I move the motion is circulated and move that the question be now put. So the question is that the motion, uh, as moved by Senator Birmingham, which I understand has been circulated through the chamber, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So I am now going to move the motion. So the question is that the motion is Senator McAllister. Uh, Madam Dep Deputy President, I rise uh, just to seek um, some indulgence from the Chamber about the motion before us. I understand that there is a view from some senators um, that they are seeking um, some additional elements. Callister, you need leave. To oh, speak. my apologies. Um, look, I am seeking leave from the Chamber to make a brief contribution. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. 
Yeah, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Uh, well, I understand that there is some discussion about the program for today that's taking place. Um, I suppose I'd make this observation that it is now Wednesday. Uh, we've been here since Monday. It's regrettable that the government couldn't have progressed this um, a little more expeditiously, um, but I do understand that we are now at a point where we can deal with these matters. So thank you. Thank you. So the question is: the motion is order. Order. Senator Patrick, are you seeking I leave? I seek, seek leave to make a short contribution. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Yeah, Patrick. thank you very much. Look, I just uh, point out that there are over 15 bills yeah, that, that, uh, that, that are being effectively guillotined, rammed through the, through the parliament. And uh, this, this motion has only been circulated in the last couple of minutes, so it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty ordinary conduct on behalf of the government to do this, and it's, a pretty, it's pretty undemocratic to ram this many bills through in, a, in an hour of desperation. Senator Hanson. Seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute. Senator Thank you Hanson. very much. I'm not impressed with this at all about the government actually pushing this through and would have had the support of the Labor Party to do it. And Senator Patrick is right. There's about 15 bills that are being passed here. My grave concern of one of them is the offshore petroleum. Laminara and um, Colorina decommissioning cost recovery levy, levy, which that's been stuffed up by the government, and the whole fact is that it's costing us four million dollars a week for that, and that should be actually discussed in this parliament to see what is happening there. These bills are going to be pushed through. There's nothing to that. Senator's statements that's been wiped, and also I've been told I can't do a budget reply speech tonight because I'm being shut down. As a leader of a political party in this place, I am not giving the opportunity to speak on behalf of millions of people to give that speech tonight, and I think it's disgusting. You have rammed this, shut down this parliament. You have not allowed enough time for sitting to deal with your bills that needed to be dealt with before the election. This is not being representative of the people of this nation, and it's a disgrace on the Liberal Party and the National Party uh, thank you, to actually Hansen. do it. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. I intend to put the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved. Uh, Senator Lambie, are you seeking? Uh, request leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Lambie. Yeah, I have to say uh, you've got 15 bills here. You're going to ram it through. Here we go. We've got the Labor Party here wants to win the election. Here we go. We've got the same same already. I'm sorry. I just can't distinguish between the both of you. Is this what if you get government? Is this what it's going to look like? Are we going back to the same thing? Because quite frankly, you might as well keep voting for the ones over there. You've got to be kidding here. You have got to be kidding. Fifteen bills here, because you're in chaos over there. Some of us would like a reply this evening, and this is how we get treated. How disrespectful. Disrespectful. So I want Australians to know the same people you've got here, and if you intend to vote for the red over here, you might as well vote for the both of them, because they are exactly the same. We're going to get the same crap in the next three years as what we've got in the previous three years. It is absolutely shameful. Thank you, Senator uh, Lambie. Senator McKim, are you seeking I'm leave? I'm seeking leave to make a, a one-minute statement. Uh, uh, one minute. Thank you, Senator McKim. All right. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, look, this is no way to legislate, and it's no way to run this Senate chamber. There are 20 pieces of legislation covered by this hour's motion. They are going to be uh, uh, ultimately rammed. inevitably rammed through without debate. There are, uh, there are a large number of those which are extremely complex complicated pieces of legislation, and in some cases they have extremely complex and complicated amendments. Now, I know that Senator Steele John has particular concerns about the NDIS bills, which he has a number of complicated amendments to. And I just want to place on the record his and the Australian Greens' frustration that those amendments and amendments to other bills are going to be put through this place without adequate debate and the legislation is going to be gagged through without adequate scrutiny. Sad day for the Senate today. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. 
I'll just refer senators to Standing Order 57, uh, which does not allow for divisions at this particular time of the um, uh, program. So, uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. So, if there is a uh, requirement for a division, it will have to be deferred because, under the current standing orders, because this motion hasn't been passed, there is no division. So, the motion is now carried. Senators, I have deferred that, so the order, this um, routine of business variation is now carried. So, on the ruling, this motion uh, was uh, was moved at the normal point in terms of the transition of, uh, of debate in the Senate, uh, immediately following the conclusion uh, of a division, um, uh, to accommodate um, the wishes of the crossbench to put opinions, uh, leave was granted. However, leave was granted um, in the midst of a motion uh, that had already been moved for the question to be put, uh, Deputy President. Uh, and so I would ask that the question be put uh, in accordance with the motion that had been put to the chamber. The, the, at the moment, because we are under the current standing order, we are actually at Senator's statement, so I appreciate your attempting to move a motion. And under that um, part of the current program, no divisions can take place. We agreed that when we put Senator's statements in. However, I understand that uh, a division can take place if leave is granted. Because we don't currently have any amendment before the chair, we are at senators' statements. So you can create, you can allow for a division if if a senator seeks leave and that leave is agreed to. Um, Sen uh, senator Wong, Senator Patrick was standing. Senator Patrick. So I, I'm just seeking clarification. Because no division is is uh, allowed, I presume that we continue with the uh, current uh, program. Is that correct? That's correct, unless leave is sought. Uh, Senator Wong. Yes, just to clarify, I think um, I understand you've taken advice, uh, and obviously the opposition will support the ru ruling that's based on Clark's advice. Uh, and uh, as I understand it, the fact that this has not been voted on means we now return to set the red unamended, and the government will have to consider how it wishes to do with that, which means we'd move to Senator's statements now, unless the chamber gives Senator. Birmingham leave for the division to occur, which I would infer from the previous conversations uh, contributions that is unlikely to occur. So I'm going to move to Senator's statements. And I'm going to call Senator Billick because we're now at Senator's statements. Order. Order. We are now at Senator's statements, and I understand Senator Billick has the call. I uh, beg your pardon, Senator Billick. Senator Birmingham. President, I'll, I'll test the will of the chamber at least, and uh, I seek leave to have the division uh, on the motion and then conclusion of those motions uh, that would be uh, consequential to the initial motion um, uh, considered by the Senate. Is leave granted? No. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Leave is not granted. Senator Billick. If you're not participating in Senator's statements, I would ask that you remain quiet or leave the chamber. Senator McKim, so, excuse me, I'm Senator speaking. McKim, you are standing between myself and Senator Billick. Thank you, Senator Billick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise this morning or this afternoon to speak about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the need for the global community to pressure Russia to end the war and withdraw its forces. For those senators who are not aware, my surname is Ukrainian. It comes from my husband, Robert, whose father emigrated decades ago from Ukraine. Not only does Robert have family ties to Ukraine, but he is an active member of Tasmania's Ukrainian community, and I am a regular attendee and speaker at Ukrainian community events. I speak to Ukrainians on a regular basis. I hear them speak with patriotic pride about their motherland, 
but I also hear their anguish and their grief about what their families and close friends are going through. So the situation in Ukraine, as you might imagine, is a very personal one for me. While Ukraine used to be part of the USSR, most Ukrainians have always had a sense of their own unique identity and culture, and the Ukrainian language is clearly distinguishable from Russian. Sadly, the recent invasion of Ukraine is the culmination of a long series of attacks by Russia on the country's sovereignty and territorial integrity since it gained independence in 1991. Russia was suspected to be behind the poisoning of Viktor Yushchenko before he was elected president of Ukraine in 2005. In 2010, Russian-backed Viktor Yankachevich was elected president in an election fraught with allegations of fraud and voter intimidation. He was removed from power by the Maidan Revolution in 2014. Millions of Ukrainians protested and they were met with batons, tear gas and bullets. More than 100 died and over 1,000 others were injured. Shortly after the revolution, Russia illegally annexed Crimea and gave support to separatist mil militia in Donbass and Luhansk. It was these Russian-backed rebels who illegally shot down Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 on its way to Kalula Lumpur from Amsterdam, killing 298 passengers and crew, including 38 Australians. Since the invasion of Ukraine, it is estimated that over 6,000 civilians have died, according to Ukrainian authorities. The civilian death toll is so high because Russian forces have targeted areas clearly identified for use by civilians. They have destroyed apartment buildings, schools, hospitals, civilians' vehicles, ambulances and shopping centres, and fired on civilians trying to flee to safety. It is these actions that prompted US President Joe Biden to call Vladimir Putin a war criminal. While I understand the difficulty of gathering evidence of war crimes in the midst of war, it is vital that every effort is made to investigate these hideous crimes and to bring the perpetrators to justice. To give you an idea of the hell that Ukrainians are going through, I'll share a few stories that came to me through the Tasmanian Ukrainian community. And I do advise anyone listening that if uh, they might want to stop now because some of these stories are more than distressing. The first story is that of Sergei. Sergei, who was staying with family in Trigaski, Sergio and a group of friends tried to flee uh, the Kiev region after staying in an underground shelter for days. The group was caught by Russian soldiers and they were tortured. The soldiers had checked their mobile phones and, after finding patriotic messages on their phones, shot one of Sergio's friends in front of the rest of the group. Sergio was released, but only after having his teeth smashed with a rifle. And another story is that of Olga and her seven-year-old son. After the war started, they sheltered in the basement of their apartment building every day. It was dark and it was cold there. In, it's winter in Ukraine, and I'm sure everyone can appreciate from the images on TV, the snow-covered streets, exactly how cold it was. During this ordeal, Olga's seven-year-old son stopped talking. He just remained silent for the whole time. They were running low on food and supplies but couldn't find transportation to leave, and driving away was way too dangerous. But what eventually prompted them to come out of the basement and to leave was the terror of a missile striking their apartment building. So they managed to get on a bus full of civilians heading for the Polish border, but the bus also came under attack by Russian forces. They changed buses six times during their journey and finally arrived at the border, thankfully uninjured, after two days of travel. During those two days, they had no food, no sleep, and stayed overnight in a tent by a fire in sub-zero temperatures, all the, while, all the while with a constant fear of another attack. Thankfully, Alga and her son are now safe. And I was also told of a family, um, another family in Curzon. Curzon was captured early in the war and has been occupied by Russian forces for weeks. During the early days of the invasion, they saw Russians shooting at cars. They are now too afraid to leave their apartment, despite running low on food and medicine. And some of the locals have held rallies to protest the invasion, but Russian soldiers have used tear gas 
and fired bullets to disperse the crowds. Now, I actually think that a lot of these stories would, horror, uh, would horrify many ordinary Russians, but of course Russians don't get to hear them. Russians who rely on broadcast television as their main source of news are being fed a steady stream of propaganda, including from Russian state TV, which is the mouthpiece of the government. Television and radio broadcasters, which have had the courage to report the truth, have been shut down. A new law threatens journalists with jail if they report anything about the war that goes against the reporting of the official Russian sources. In fact, media outlets can go against this law simply by referring to the military operation as a war or an invasion. Russia is also centering social media at a phenomenal expense. And it begs the question, would Vladimir Putin's actions be tolerated by a truly democratic Russia with a free media? Despite the Russian government's efforts to control the narrative, many Russians know that what is being done in Ukraine in their name is wrong. According to human rights groups, more than 8,000 Russians have been arrested for publicly protesting the war in Ukraine. It's a small number compared to Russians' population, but when protesters face the prospect of being imprisoned for up to 15 years, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to speak out. And I commend the bravery of those protesters, and I recognise that not all Russians bear responsibility for the actions of the Russian state committed in their name. Russia is a democracy in name only, and many ordinary Russians are also victims of Vladimir Putin's despotic regime. It's right and it's just that Australia has stepped up and joined its allies in not just opposing the evasion diplomatically, but, but by putting real pressure on Vladimir Putin's regime. This conflict is happening on the other side of the world, but it's still Australia's concern for a number of reasons. Australia has a responsibility to its citizens, which includes thousands of Australians of Ukrainian descent, just like my father-in-law, whose friends and family are in peril. We also have a responsibility as good global citizens to do our part to maintain peace and order in the world, not just in our region but across the globe. But those are not the only reasons. Russia's unprovoked aggression is an issue that concerns Australia for the same reasons it should concern every sovereign nation. Its actions go against the rules-based order that has maintained relative peace and stability in the world since World War II. Not only does the global community need to send a strong message to Russia that their actions will not be tolerated, but we need to ensure that the price they pay economically and militarily is so high that they and other countries are pressured to withdraw and effectively deterred from taking similar action in the future. Labor stands shoulder to shoulder with the government in applying pressure on Russia in the form of targeted economic sanctions and providing support, support to Ukraine through the creation of special humanitarian visas and the supply of lethal and non-lethal aid. And I also thank the Ukrainian diaspora. Through their representative organisations, such as the Australian Federation of Ukraine Organisations, the work they are doing to support their community, I have witnessed at first hand, is just amazing. The Association of Ukrainians in Tasmania, an organisation which is entirely volunteer run, has done an excellent job providing information and updates on visa options and application processes and where to go for financial assistance counselling and other support services. They have been raising funds to support their countrymen and holding weekly rallies on the lawn of the Tasmanian parliament and in Launceston. The ultimate responsibility for this war and the bloodshed and suffering that has and will follow rests squarely on the shoulders of Vladimir Putin, Putin and his regime. The global community has shown they will not just stand idly by while invades a sovereign democratic nation. They will act, they will not forget, Thank and they will Senator ensure Billick. that Mr Putin and Senator his supporters— Senator time has expired. I've got to set it, Sarah. <coughs> Senator Henderson, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, last night the Treasurer handed down the 2022-2023 federal budget, which delivers Australia's plan for a stronger future. Cost of living relief now, a long-term economic plan which creates jobs, record investments in essential services and stronger defence and national security. This is a budget which delivers for all Australians. The government recognises 
Households are facing cost of living pressures as a result of the invasion of Ukraine and ongoing global supply chain issues from COVID. And so, as part of the budget, we've announced some very significant cost of living measures, which will be delivered as a temporary and practical support for households right across this nation. For the next six months, Australians will save 22 cents a litre every time they fill up their car. A family with two cars who fills up once a week could save around $30 a week or around $700 over the next six months. This cut in fuel excise, which takes effect from midnight last night, will throw, flow through to the Bowser over the next two weeks. This temporary reduction in fuel excise will not come at a cost to road funding, very importantly, uh, which we will see more than $12 billion spent in the coming year on roads. There's a new one-off $420 cost of living tax offset, which will benefit more than 10 million low and middle income earners. So taxpayers already receiving the low and middle income tax offset will now receive up to $1,500 and couples up to $3,000 from 1 July this year. There is a one-off new $250 cost of living payment which will be delivered within weeks to six million Australians, pensioners, carers, veterans, job seekers, eligible self-funded retirees and concession car holders will all benefit. Together with existing indexation arrangements, this will see a single pensioner receive more than $500 in additional support over the next six months, just when they need it the most. Very proudly, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Morrison government is helping more Australians own a home and more Australians combat and deal with housing affordability. Of course, we have Home Builder, the First Home Super Saver Scheme and the Home Guarantee Scheme. Uh, but now, uh, in the budget, there is a doubling of the Home Guarantee Scheme which will provide 50,000 places a year. This will help single parents to buy a home with a deposit as low as 2 per cent and will help more home buyers to buy a home with a deposit as low as 5 per cent. I know this is going to be very much welcome in the region that I represent as patron senator in the electorates of Bendigo, Ballarat, uh, Karangamite, Karayo and Gorton, all very fast-growing areas where so many are moving to these regions but are looking for that additional support. There's a new $2.8 billion investment to increase take-up and completion rates. Uh, as part of our skills investment, uh, we'll be providing a $5,000 payment to new apprentices and up to $15,000 in wage subsidies for employers who take them on. There'll be $3.7 billion to support an additional 800,000 training places. Of course, small business is a massive recipient of the measures in our budget. We know small and family businesses are the absolute lifeblood of our economy uh, right across this nation, employing nearly 8 million Australians. And from budget night, for every $100 spent by a small business on training, uh, those businesses will receive a $120 tax deduction, 120%. Of course, this will drive more resilience, more jobs right across the nation. We're also backing small businesses which are embracing the digital revolution by providing the same tax deduction for investments in digital technologies. Of course, local manufacturing, a, a very big passion of mine, receives a huge shot in the arm with a, a wide range of investments to drive collaboration between our universities. CSIRO. Of course, in Victoria, we have the incredible announcement with the manufacture of mRNA vaccines, uh, and there's a new patent box to support, um, to, to support agriculture and low emissions technology sectors. So uh, that's going to make a huge difference in terms of innovation. The regions, and I am proudly a regional senator for Victoria, have received unprecedented regional investment. Uh, a new $7.4 billion investment in more dams and water projects to improve vital water security. There's a new $2 billion regional accelerator program. Of course, there are the transformational investments in other parts of the country, the Hunter, the Pilbara, the Northern Territory and North and Central Queensland. 
and uh, a wonderful $1.3 billion telecommunications package. And I know our incredible Liberal candidate for Corangamite, Stephanie Asher, has been advocating uphill and down dale for more funding for mobile coverage in places like Armstrong Creek and the Ballerine Peninsula in Corangamite. She's doing an incredible job. And uh, we are very hopeful uh, that we will see more news about how that $811 million in mobile connectivity is uh, going to be um, distributed across the nation. But uh, we've both been advocating for an extension of the pump program, the Perry Urban Mobile Program. So I'm keeping fingers crossed, as is Stephanie, that we're going to see some very significant funding flow into our region. Of course. Uh, massive infrastructure projects are underway uh, in all the areas of regional Victoria that I represent as patron senator. The Warren Ponds to South Geelong rail duplication receives another $274 million in this year's budget. The Bowen Heads Road upgrade, stage one, receives $105 million. There's $37 million flowing into the budget for Geelong Fast Rail, so we are seeing stage one construction begin next year. That's the section between Werribee and Laverton, which puts cry to, which, um, which really does, uh, I think, remind those critics when they talk about uh, pork barrelling in Corangamite. What an absolute joke, Mr. Acting Deputy President. That two billion dollars has gone into Western Melbourne, uh, which has been so badly ignored by Daniel Andrews and State Labor. So we are very proud of what we are doing to deliver faster and more affordable and, and, and more efficient train services, including through our massive $2 billion investment in Geelong Fast Rail. There's some other very significant investments in the electorate of Gorton, uh, the Melbourne Intermodal Terminal Planning and Development, $20 million is flowing in this year's budget. In Ballarat, we've got $31 million flowing. Uh, the Western Highway project, Ballarat to stall duplication, a very, very uh, significant uh, investment as well. And of course, there's also very significant money flowing into the Bendigo electorate, including through the Bendigo Echuca rail line and the Sunraysia Highway upgrade as well. So this is a budget, as I said and I, as I started in my contribution, which is delivering for all Australians. Uh, in health, uh, Medicare is guaranteed. With bulk billing rates at a record high, uh, we've now approved more than 2,800 new or amended listings on the PBS and following on from the very significant $2.3 billion investment in mental health, we're seeing more funding flow for uh, community-based treatment centres, headspace services and digital mental health support. There is a massive women's safety, health and economic security package, uh, including another $1.3 billion to combat violence against women and children. There's more frontline services, more investment in emergency accommodation, uh, in support for legal and health services, and this builds on the incredible investment that we have made uh, in many, many different ways for Australian women. We've now also included an enhanced paid parental leave scheme, providing more accessibility and particularly standing up for sole parents, for single mothers and fathers who can now access the full 20 weeks of paid parental leave. Of course, our commitment to the NDIS and disability continues. NDIS funding grows every year. We're uh, again making an even further massive contribution to older Australians with more home care packages, additional training places personal care workers, there's record funding for education, for environment and, of course, for national security and defence. So incredibly important, including the 10-year investment in our cyber capabilities. Uh, only the Morrison government can be trusted to deliver a stronger economy and a safer Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Cox. Thank you. Acting Deputy President, if there's one clear message out of last night's budget, it's this. This government has been sold to the highest bidder on our watch and in our name. When Morrison's Treasurer announced the bill last night, it was not a plan. Instead, what we heard was a last-ditch plea for votes in the dying days of this shambles of a government. 
It doesn't take much to see through the lies and the bluster with these mob. While last night's speech began with Morrison's Treasurer playing lip service to the climate floods, extreme, extreme climate events like these being fuelled by the coal and gas, dirty, polluting fossil fuels that Liberal and Labor only want to increase. This budget gives $37.6 billion in fossil fuel subsidies of taxpayer money that will go directly into the profits of the massive corporations that bankroll the Liberal Party's coffers. Instead of investing in the restoration of Australia's biodiversity, public money will instead be spent on bypassing environmental protection to fast-track environmental approval for their fossil fuel mates. Further billions will be spent on dams that will destroy critical habitats and pollute our Great Barrier Reef. But when you read the budget, it's clear that they can't keep people safe and they can't manage the economy. They are selling us out. There are over three million people living in poverty. There are millions of people trapped in insecure work, on low wages and in unaffordable housing. For the people who are worried about bushfires or how they're going to cope with the next heat wave or how to rebuild their homes after worsening disasters, once again, you have been abandoned because the government is spending more money on fossil fuels that are accelerating these climate catastrophes. What a joke! Are they trying to buy their way back into office? Their claims on wages are farcical. Wages growth has been below 3 per cent for the entire time this government has been in power. But now we're expected to believe that the wages are going to suddenly grow by 5 per cent over the next three months? Well, Here's the real story. This budget funds and fuels the climate crisis. Morrison and his cronies are hell-bent on destroying country, the land, skies and waters that First Nations people have cared for and sustained for generations. Our environment is in crisis and this budget is making our land sicker. It makes housing more expensive. There is $13 billion of public money going into housing investors, but nothing to build more affordable homes. It won't lift wages. It, won't make, it will make the cost of living increase, and it will lock us into tax cuts only for the wealthy. This is another bu budget for the billionaires and the big corporations. They're looking after their mates, after their donors, while squandering our precious resources. The climate crisis is caused by mining and the burning of coal and gas. And they just don't want us to burn more of it, they also want us to pay for it. Coal and gas corporations are not only getting huge handouts, they're offshoring their profits tax-free, and it's costing every single Australian. 23 gas companies who sell gas overseas together made $49 billion in revenue. Between them, they didn't pay a single cent of tax. If that were you and I, this would in fact be criminal. In 2020-2021, Woodside donated $232,000 to the Liberal, National and Labor parties. In return, they've given them handouts to build one of the worst gas projects in the world. They're robbing teachers, nurses, Childcare educators, aged care workers to pay Woodside, Santos and Whitehaven. And that's not how you manage the economy. You can't keep people safe if you keep backing more coal and gas. Right now there are 114 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline across this continent, on country. These projects will increase the amount of pollution in the atmosphere by 1.3 billion tonnes per year. Yet, in a mere 240 years since colonisation, our people have watched in horror and dismay as these governments of this country, one after another, have acted in their own short-term interests. This government fails to see the full picture. It's failing our children and our future generations to come. For First Nations people, this budget is just more of the same. If the government is serious about justice and equality for First Nations people, there needs to be real investment 
for First Nations communities. Our people are dying in custody. There is no treaty with the First Nations people, only Band-Aid solutions from a government with no real vision for the future. Nowhere is this felt more than in my own state of Western Australia. Western Australia is already one of the hottest places in the world. It's been identified as a climate hotspot. This year alone, the Pilbara hit 50 degrees. The number of days per year over 40 degrees in Perth has doubled. But this government isn't just fast-tracking projects like the Scarborough Gas Project. They're also giving them, in this budget, an additional $300 million to fund gas projects in the Northern Territory. Scarborough alone will wreck, not, won't just wreck the planet, but it will do irreversible damage to the Murujuga Rock Art and the Seven Sisters songline. So your taxes are paying to destroy our cultural heritage. Shame. That's why we have to kick the Liberals out and put the Greens into balance of power. We have a plan to build one million affordable homes. We will cap rents. We will give renters more rights. And we will abolish the outrageous tax breaks for people who are investing in their fourth, fifth, 20th and 30th home, driving up prices so other people are forced to live in their cars. We will ban all new coal and gas projects and invest in the transition for a cleaner, greener economy. And we will pay for it by making billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share of tax. And that's not all. In balance of power, the Greens will get dental and mental health into Medicare. Where this government has let us down, the Greens will keep fighting for our communities, our climate and for a safer future for all of us. Thank you. Senator uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I would like to uh, firstly commend Senator Cox for uh, bringing to the attention, especially the people of Queensland, what the realities will be if the Labor Party does win the next election. I was listening very carefully to Senator Cox at the, uh, in terms of her previous, in terms of her previous, in terms of her previous uh, contribution the other day, where she talked about sharing, the sharing of power in the event that Labor forms the, uh, the next government in this place. And that's the reality. And Senator Cox pursued that theme in that last contribution that they will use, the Greens will use, they will use their numbers. It doesn't matter what Senator Farrell thinks, they will use their numbers to take the Labor Party to the extreme left. That is the reality of the situation in the event that there's a change in government in this place at the next election. And the people of Queensland the people of Queensland should consider their choice very, very carefully, because the only, way, the only way in which the Labor Party will be able to get legislation through this place to pursue their agenda, to abolish the ABCC and do whatever else they want to do, is to do deals with the Australian Greens. And that is a potential—well, Senator Farrell, I'll take that interjection. I will certainly not be voting for the abolition of the ABCC. Certainly won't be. And believe you wouldn't either if, uh, if you had the power not to. But the reality is, the reality is, if the Labor Party wins the next election, it will be power, to use Senator Cox's words, sharing. Power sharing with the Australian Greens. And that is the reality. That is the reality that faces the Australian people at the next election. So, Senator Cox, uh, I commend you on that contribution, and I do hope. I do hope that the people of Queensland have listened very, very carefully because they've seen the reality, the reality of life in the event that the Labor Party wins the next election. And it's not pretty for the people of Queensland. Not pretty for their jobs, their economic prosperity, or all those industries which provide so many jobs and generate so much wealth and opportunity for the people of Queensland. That is the reality in the event that the Labor Party wins the next election. Power sharing, quoting the Greens, power sharing between the Greens and the Labor Party in the event that Mr Albanese becomes the next Prime Minister of this country. I would like to make some contributions, uh, a contribution in relation to the situation in Myanmar, which I'm sure all senators in this place are deeply concerned about. During the last uh, week, I had the opportunity to attend a roundtable discussion with members of the Australian Myanmar community in Queensland. And Firstly, I'd like to sincerely thank them for taking the time to meet with me uh, and to convey personally their concerns in relation to what is a deteriorating situation 
in relation to Myanmar. I'd also like to say in this context that I'd like to associate my remarks with the comments of Senator Billick in relation to the uh, situation in the Ukraine. And I think um, Senator Billick was uh, very effectively very effectively conveyed uh, the concerns many of us have with respect to that awful, awful situation in a region that has borne so much tragedy over the last hundred years. In relation to the situation of Myanmar, I commend all senators to have regard to a report that was re recently released by the United Nations High Commissioner for Human, report Human Rights. The report is dated 15 March 2022. To read from the summary, and I quote, Myanmar is caught in a downward spiral of violence, characterised by the increasingly brutal repression of individuals actually or seemingly opposed to military rule. By violent resistance to the coup and by several active non-international armed conflicts, action must be taken to stem the pace at which individuals are being targeted by the military authorities and stripped of their rights, their lives and their livelihoods." End quote. Just emphasise that point. Myanmar is caught in a downward spiral of violence. A downward spiral of violence. And in this report, uh, there is plenty of evidence, a shocking amount of evidence of the human rights abuses and violations which are occurring in Myanmar. I quote just a few sections, again, for the information of all senators, and I commend all senators to read this report dated 15 March 2022. Paragraph 19, I quote. Credible sources have shown that between 1 February 2021 and 31 January 2022, at least 1,500 persons died at the hands of security forces and their affiliates. That total is above and beyond the numbers of civilian deaths resulting from pre-existing armed conflicts. Over 100 children, over 100 children, including at least 90 boys and 15 girls, were killed. End quote. Paragraph 22. Security forces first employed lethal force at peaceful assemblies. In many instances, police and military personnel used live ammunition, sometimes directing it at individuals to disperse demonstrations. Interviewees described snipers being stationed near protest sites. The relative of one source was reportedly shot in the back by a marksman at a protest held in March. Paragraph 25. Over 20 per cent of fatalities, about 325 people, including 16 children, occurred in custody, with a significant increase in the number of cases starting in July 2021. Paragraph 26. Many interviewees indicated that they remained unaware of the whereabouts of numerous detainees. The corpses were disposed of without informing or receiving the consent of families, and that requested information about relatives was simply withheld." End quote. Paragraph 27. Individuals have also been killed by the security forces during, in quotes, clearance operations. Beginning in July 2021, a series of mass killings during military operations have been reported. Paragraph 29. Since 1 February 2021, the State Administration Council illegally amended laws to confer to the security forces unchecked powers of arrest and detention. Initially, the military detained hundreds of individuals from the executive and legislative branches of government. Subsequently, it targeted doctors, nurses, celebrities, students, educators and others for criticising the coup, for participating in peaceful demonstrations or the civil disobedience movement. Paragraph 30. Credible sources indicate that between 1 February 2021 and 31 January 2022, the State Administration Council and its affiliated armed elements detained 9,307 males and 2,349 females, 240 of whom were children. Additionally, another 1,971 individuals were wanted by the State Administration Council, forcing them to go into hiding. Paragraph 44. Myanmar is wrought with devastation. The increasing prosperity that many around the country have in recent years begun to enjoy has come to a halt. Concurrently, ethnic minorities who have been persecuted for decades face even more violence and insecurity. In attempting to crush the armed oppression, the military dictatorship has continued its four-cuts policy 
and conducted offensives using airstrikes, helicopter gunships, artillery and mortars. Paragraph 45. Many armed actors persistently used landmines and hidden improvised explosive devices, killing and injuring individuals around the country. And so it goes on, Mr Acting Deputy President. A litany of human rights violations which are occurring as we sit here today in this Senate in safety in Australia. And I would like to commend the work of the Australian Myanmar diaspora in terms of advocating in relation to these issues, bringing these atrocities to our attention, bringing these atrocities to our attention, and also for their generosity in terms of doing all they can, in terms of doing all they can to raise funds in Australia to help the hundreds of thousands of people in need in Myanmar. Finally, Mr Acting Deputy President, I would like to acknowledge the statements made on the weekend by our Prime Minister, the Hon. Scott Morrison. The Australian government is providing 2,000 additional visas under Australia's humanitarian program for Myanmar refugees, and it is fit and proper we do so. It is fit and proper that we do so, because our Myanmar diaspora, our Myanmar community in Australia makes such a wonderful contribution, makes such a wonderful contribution to Australia in so many ways. In addition, there is going to be an increase in targeted aid for the for Burmese in refugee camps in border regions. And indeed, this financial year, Australia will deliver over $95 million of assistance to the people of Myanmar. And lastly, Mr Acting Deputy President, I would like to pay uh, tribute to my colleague, uh, Senator Dean Smith, in relation to his advocacy on behalf of the Burmese diaspora. He has been tireless in his efforts to bring these matters to the attention of this Senate. Thank you, Senator Scott. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Well, last night's budget was nothing less than sugar and spin. Nothing but short-term, one-off sugar hits which do absolutely nothing to fix the real challenges that Australians are facing every single day under this government. The Morrison government has said they want the Australian people to give them another 10 years. They say it's time to stick to the plan, that now is not the time to change course. But Australians cannot afford another 10 years of this government. They literally can't afford it, because for the last decade this government has done nothing to address the challenges that real Australians face. Nothing to help them live better. Nothing to deal with the rising costs of living. Nothing to get wages moving and nothing to deal with rising job insecurity. Last night, while the Treasurer and the Prime Minister congratulated themselves on their budget full of short-term payoffs and no long-term plan, I sat with five aged care workers and I got their response firsthand. Teresa, Curtis, Shin, Karen and Marina, aged care workers who were once again completely ignored in last night's budget. I was with them as they waited for any sign from this government that they had any plan to fix aged care, any sign that this government finally recognised the sacrifices that they have made over the last two years, any sign that this government understood that at the heart of the aged care crisis is a workforce crisis. And I was with them when they heard promises of further one-off payoffs in this budget, when they still haven't received the last payoff that they were promised by the Morrison government. I was with them when they realised that once again this government refused to acknowledge their value, their skill, their sacrifice, and they were angry. They were angry. They were angry that once again they have been neglected. Once again they have been undervalued. Once again they have been left behind by this government. They were angry, but they were not surprised. This is exactly what they have come to expect 
under 10 years of this government because it's what they've had for the last 10 years. No respect, no action and no plan. Aged care workers can't afford to wait for the Morrison government to find a plan when they are still waiting for bonuses that they were promised back in February, when they are literally sleeping on couches and living in caravans because on their wages they can't even afford to pay rent. Aged care workers can't wait for the Morrison government to fix their problems when they are spending their days feeding our loved ones but can't afford to feed their own. And that's why aged care workers across the country are taking matters into their own hands. They are standing up and demanding real action to fix the aged care crisis and to fix aged care wages, because they are done working without enough staff. They are done being exhausted and burnt out. They are done being undervalued, and they are taking action. They are taking to the streets, they are standing up, they are speaking out, they are taking action because this government refuses to. These dedicated aged care workers are standing up not just for themselves but for the residents and the families who rely on them. And what they know is the only way to change aged care is to change the government. And I stand with the aged care workers who are standing up and speaking out today. Aged care workers are not alone in their anger and their frustration with this budget. Australians need more than one-off payoffs from this government. Is this all the government really has after nearly 10 years in office? One-off payoffs. That is it. What Australians really need is a pay rise, because everything is going up under this government while wages continue to go backwards. People are struggling to even afford the basics. Under this government, more people than ever before on record are having to work two, three and even four jobs just to make ends meet. For the last almost 10 years of this government, we have had the lowest wage growth on record, and it is set to continue under this government and under their budget. And on top of that, on top of the low wages, there are three million Australians in insecure jobs, and the government has nothing for them, nothing. It is a complete disgrace. It is a disgrace because after almost a decade, the Morrison government still has no plan to get wages moving. Last night's budget literally had nothing on wages except a sentence in the beginning. And sitting back and waiting for wages to move on their own is not a plan. It is not enough. The short-term band-aid responses by the Morrison government are simply not enough. One-off payoffs instead of real pay rises will not cut it. But offering short-term payoffs is the only plan that this government has. It's all they can offer Australians. And last night's budget was full of them. One-off, short-term, vote by secure jobs. This is not a plan to get wages moving. This is not a plan for the next 10 years. It is barely a plan for the next eight weeks, and Australians do not buy it. They do not buy it. Australians cannot afford these quick political fixes from the Morrison government when what they need is long-term plans, long-term plans to get their wages moving. But this is all the Morrison government has to offer for the next 10 years. This is a government that is ready for opposition. I asked three Australians what they thought of the prospect of another 10 years of the Morrison government. Jane, an early childhood educator, Cooper, a hospo worker. And Jane and Cooper were very clear. Cooper said, and I quote, I am terrified of the prospect of living any more of my life under a Morrison government. 
Jane said, and I quote, we can't afford another three years. It's a frightening prospect. It would be a catastrophe. Terrifying, frightening, a catastrophe. This is Prime Minister Morrison's Australia. This is it. This is what Australian workers are saying about their government. They quite literally fear another term of this government. The Morrison government says they've done a good job with the economy, that we should stay the course. The lived experience of millions of Australians proves otherwise. Australians have gone backwards over the last almost decade of this do-nothing government. And only Labor will stand with essential workers, essential workers like Jane, essential workers like Cooper, essential workers like Grace, an aged care worker who I spoke to, who is also terrified of the prospect of another 10 years of this government. It is only Labor who will stand with these workers. It is only Labor who will fight to end job security. It is only Labor who will lower the cost of living for Australians. And only an Albanese Labor government will get wages moving in the right direction. Because Labor knows just how difficult the last few years have been for Australians. Because we have been out there listening to Australians. We know that Australians simply cannot afford the Morrison government. They literally can't afford it. Not for another day, not for another three years, let alone the decade that this government wants Australians to give them. Senator Patrick. Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, it's been over a year since the Royal uh, Commission into Aged Care handed down their report. Now, one of the recommendations of that uh, report was that we should have nurses in aged care facilities 24-7. It's a very simple idea and most people can absolutely understand the necessity of such a recommendation. Now, unfortunately, since October, the government has simply uh, not dealt with this at all. In October, I introduced an amendment to the government's Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response No. 2 Bill to get this crucial recommendation actioned immediately. And what happened? The government stopped the progression of their own bill because they were of the view that I had the numbers in the Senate to pass my amendment, to finally help people in aged care, to finally help people in aged care by having a nurse available 24-7. That is an absolute disgrace. The government holding up its own bill to avoid implementing a very sensible recommendation of the Royal Commission. Now, we know the aged care system is in crisis. You don't have to listen to me. The Prime Minister has conceded that. And only just recently we had to send the Australian Defence Force into our aged care facilities to deal with part of that crisis. Now, because the government hasn't introduced this uh, legislation or hasn't uh, pushed this legislation. I've tried to work constructively with the minister. I've had a conversation with the minister, and I've even conceded, uh, that, uh, conceded to him that whilst my bill seeks an immediate introduction of the requirement to have nurses in aged care facilities 24/7, I've said to him, I'm quite happy if we roll this back to the exact recommendation of the Royal Commissioner. I offered him that. I said, your, your bill going through the, the Senate is an important bill. It makes important changes and it has the support of the Senate. And I'd like to help you get that through. And all I'm asking you to do is put in exactly what the Royal Commissioner recommended. The response from my negotiations with the, with the minister 
was to offer me a review. A review. We've just had a Royal Commission into aged care and the minister wants to do another review looking into one of the recommendations. Now that is a slap in the face for every person in aged care and every uh, person who has a loved one in aged care. Now any suggestion that my amendment is at odds with the Royal Commissioner's recommendation, Royal Commission's, I'll say, say that again, any suggestion that my recommendation or well, my amendment is uh, at odds with the recommendations of the Royal Commissioners is just simply wrong. Today we're going to have a guillotine motion that's foreshadowed by the debacle that happened in the chamber just before Senator's statements. Now I, I, I foreshadow that when we next rise to uh, to deal with a time motion with a list of 20 bills, I am going to seek to amend that to put that bill, the Aged Care Royal Commission Recommendations No. 2 bill, on the list. Because this is too important. This is too important. We cannot ignore what is happening in our aged care facilities. Ageing is a privilege. It shouldn't be a punishment. But that's exactly what is happening right now. And the government could be acting, but they're refusing to. This parliament is about to come uh, to the end without having uh, taken any serious action in relation to the Aged Care Royal Commission recommendations. It's a disgrace and it's a great disservice to all of our loved ones in aged care facilities. Now I wish to switch to another topic, which is the Murray-Darling Basin. I was up in uh, uh, at Tolano Station uh, a, a few weeks ago, seeing the wonderful water flowing down the Darling River. But I don't want all of that water to drown out the failure that is the Murray-Darling Basin plan. Uh, the history of this, very simply, is that uh, we, we get something like 32,000 gigalitres of inflow into the Murray and we, on average we're taking out 13,600. That number is decreasing because of climate change. Now, we, everyone recognised we, need we needed to do something about this. And so we started off on a journey to come up with what is now known as the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. The whole purpose of the plan was re to return some of that diversion back to the river. Now, originally, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority came up with a scientific number of 3,900 to, uh, to 7,600 gigalitres, except that number was politically wound back to a lesser recovery of uh, 2,750 gigalitres. South Australia wasn't having any of it, and so they negotiated a change to the Water Act, Section 86AA, which returned an additional 450 gigalitres to the river. Where, uh, what, what were the key measures? Buybacks were one of the key measures to get uh, water back. We also had uh, uh, supply measures or SDL projects, and we have uh, the efficiency project, which, which are designed or supposed to get us the 450. Where are we at? Well, in buybacks, we've actually bought back uh, 2,106 gigalitres, and that's the most efficient way to get recovery. With the SDL projects, we've got uh, 36 projects, of which only a 15, a 15 are completed. We've only recovered uh, of the 605 gigalitres we expected from that, that uh, part of the plan. We've only recovered 280 gigalitres. Now. The Productivity Commission reported in 2018 that there was huge risk in these projects, and they're absolutely right. Now even the government concedes that six of those projects are likely to not uh, render any return, and one of those is the big one at Menindee Lakes. And when we go to 
the uh, efficiency measures the 450 gigalitres. Guess how much water has returned for South Australia of the 450? Two gigalitres. Nine years into the plan, and that's all we've managed to find. Two gigalitres. It's a mess, and I haven't even started talking about things like the floodplain harvesting that's occurring in northern New South Wales uh, uh, and Queensland, and indeed uh, the, the cotton that's now uh, sprouting on uh, the Murrumbidgee. So, as, as the plan comes to its proper conclusion in 2024, and we have to deal with uh, a failed plan that hasn't recovered uh, even the politically manipulated number, we're going to need strong advocates. South Australia is going to need strong advocates in this place. And sadly, we look at what happened uh, with the South Australian election. We now know, although no one knows who she is, we now have a, uh, a One Nation representative uh, in the Legislative Council in South Australia. And my really big concern is that uh, at the next election, One Nation may well have a representative in the Senate representing South Australia. And I can tell you when that happens and when we have to deal with the closure of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, which is a failure, uh, this Queensland-led party will be backing big cotton and big irrigators from Queensland all of the way. That's a huge danger to South Australia, and South Australians need to understand that that's what they're staring down the barrel of if indeed One Nation get someone up in the Senate representing South Australia. Senator McGrath. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. For many, juvenile granulosa cell tumour, or JCT, would be a foreign term. On the other hand, ovarian cancer is something we've all come to know a lot more about in recent years thanks to advances in research and general awareness. JCT happens to be a rare form of ovarian cancer that accounts for approximately 8 to 10 per cent of all ovarian cancers, affecting females as young as infants through to postmenopausal women. This is why volunteers, led by Peter Rayburn, will be riding from Canberra to Melbourne over the course of nine straight days to raise funds for vital ovarian cancer research. Peter's wife, Claire, was diagnosed with JCT at the age of 53. Claire is the oldest female in the world to have JCT. The youngest was diagnosed in Australia at the age of 11 months. Overall, 94 per cent of patients with JCT are under 30 years of age. Currently, there is no cure for JCT nor is there significant research to help understand the disease further. At present, clinicians are prescribing treatment methods based on best guess rather than on facts. However, there are strong and amazing people like Claire, her family and her supporters who are working tirelessly to raise awareness of JCT. Research is desperately needed, and that is why the team is riding to raise much needed funding. A special mention to Beck, Claire and Peter's daughter, who wants to emphasise the sheer courage and determination shown by her parents in this fight and their continued efforts to bring awareness to such an important issue. Please head, for those who are listening or watching, to rocinc.org.au to find out more about this great cause and to donate. Best of luck to Peter, Claire, Beck and the rest of the team in this great endeavour. Mr Acting Deputy President, it would be remiss of me to not talk about dams in Queensland uh, being the, the final uh, sitting day of, of this parliament. Every sitting week I have raised to, to to talk about Paradise Dam. And I welcome the $600 million contribution by the federal government to help fix Labor's mistake in Paradise Dam. Paradise Dam is Australia's worst infrastructure fail. But I particularly welcome 
the funding for Yorana Dam, a private project in conjunction with government in North Queensland. Yorana is Queensland for water. Yorana is a dam that is going to help grow Queensland. And Andrew Wilcox, our new candidate for Dawson, will continue to fight for Yorana, taking on the fight led by George Christensen. Mr Acting Deputy President, sadly in Queensland uh, recently we have seen the unedifying spectacle of the Premier sending in goons to the Integrity Commissioner's office to seize a laptop and then have that, that laptop wiped. This is something out of Putin's Russia. So people wonder what is it on this laptop. So I thought I would do a countdown with the one minute that remains to me. And this is what, what people are saying. Uh, number seven, there are seven reasons. There are photos of the former Labor Lord Mayor accepting bundles of cash in a car park. Number six is a list of COVID breaches by members of Labor's cabinet in Queensland. Number five. It's a spreadsheet of all the secret and dodgy donations that the Labor Party has received in, in Queensland. Number four is details of hospital ramping, particularly on a Saturday morning after Labor-aligned lobbyists have long lunches at the port office uh, with Labor ministers and staffers. Number three is Stephen Miles and his lack of conscience. Number two is Labor's secret plans to raise taxes. And number one. It's the real Anthony Albanese. Uh, so the Scarlet Pimpernel of Australian, Australian politics. Will the real Anthony Albanese stand up? Please stand up, Anthony Thank Albanese. You, Senator McGrath. It being 1.30, we'll now move to two-minute statements, and I'll call Senator McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. If the government is defeated in May, its parting gift to Australians will be an increase in petrol prices in September, pay not keeping up with prices, a trillion dollars in debt and rising interest rates. That is of little comfort to people in regional and remote areas of Australia. In Ramanginning right now, petrol prices are over $3. Remote Middle Eastern Arnhem Land is paying $3. In your budget statement last night, CDP, which covers 40, participants, over 40,000 participants across Australia, most of whom are in the Northern Territory, many of whom would be in places like Ramon Ginning, no sense of future for them. You talk about unemployment, but you do not talk about the underemployment. You do not talk about the people that you're leaving behind under programs, failed programs like the Community Development Program. There is no vision, no hope, skirmishes and prevention against what has been challenged against this government around the unfairness and the discrimination of CDP. There is nothing in the budget books that says this is what we're going to do. You talk about re-engagement. Well, the Walpri elders of the Northern Territory were misled to believe that they would be a part of that engagement. Of five trial sites across Australia, one went to the Northern Territory, and yet we are the deepest in need around this underfunded, no hope future uh, program that shows no way out of the disadvantage that we're experiencing in a lot of these communities. The Prime Minister will do and say anything before an election, and even his own side don't trust him to deliver what he promises. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much. Those who follow my social media might recall a recent Facebook post on the terrible situation facing Mr Chow Van Kam, a 73-year-old human rights campaigner who is currently serving 12 years in a Vietnamese prison. Mr Chow is an Australian citizen who was born in Vietnam and migrated to Sydney after the fall of Saigon. The retired banker was arrested within hours of his arrival in his former country and faced charges of being involved with a terrorist activity. For context, Mr Chow is a member of Viet Tan, a pro-democracy and human rights organisation that Vietnam curiously de designates as a terrorist organisation. According to his wife, Mr Chow was only in Vietnam to monitor the human rights situation 
on the ground to see for himself. But now he faces what Human Rights Watch have likened to a death sentence for someone of his health and his age. As someone who fought communism during the Vietnam War and endured years in a forced labour camp, why would Mr Chow return? According to those close to him, he often expressed a dream of seeing the country he still loves become free and democratic. Amnesty International and others consider Mr Chow to be a prisoner of conscience, targeted and jailed solely for expressing his peaceful political beliefs. It's a frightening reminder that the world can still be a hostile place for those seeking liberty and democracy for others. As you might imagine, Mr Chow's family is very deeply concerned and are tirelessly campaigning for his release and return to his home here in Australia. This cause is firmly supported by the Vietnamese community in Western Australia and in particular Mr Day Nguyen. So I offer my voice in this place in the hope it might highlight and even assist these efforts and to sincerely thank all those who are doing everything they can to see justice. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, the budget that we saw handed down last night is not a serious plan for the future. It's just a six-month sugar hit, followed by continuing wage stagnation, three billion in hidden cuts, and a series of diluted projects and extended delivery times buried deep in those papers. Wages are going backwards, and the government should be ashamed of the smoke and mirrors that's been put forward in this budget, the rhetoric that's been told to the people without an understanding and a clarity that the kind of sugar hits are going to end. It is short term. It is short sighted. This is not going to help people in this country. This is not going to provide the structural change, the structural support that we need to bolster wages and to let people build forward for the future. These challenging, challenging sugar hits, it's the bribery of the Australian public. But let's be really clear. Australians are not stupid. They are very, very aware of what is going on here. They know they cannot trust the hollow promises of this government. You only have to look over the last nine years to see that. They said wages would grow. They didn't. They said that they would introduce a national anti-corruption commission. Well, that didn't happen. And we are 1,200 days on from that promise. And in the budget papers last night, there is a zero, a big zero in black and white in those budget papers for the anti-corruption commission. And if there's anyone that needs an anti-corruption commission, it is this government. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak about the speech given by Senator Veravanti Wells last night. Um, of course it upset the, the Liberal Party and of course it upset the Prime Minister. Hence he came out and said she's, it's from a scorned woman. Well, I can say it's not. It's from a woman who's given a lot to this parliament, who's represented the people of New South Wales to the best of her ability. It's about talking about a Prime Minister who is not in touch with the Liberal Party and not in touch with the people of this nation, who's lost the values of conservatism, and that's exactly what has upset Ferraventi Wells, the senator, is that the Liberal Party is not the Liberal Party that should be there to represent the views and values of this nation on the conservative side, a party that's been taken over by the moderates and those on the left, the party with full of factions, the party that is trying to get rid of those, the true conservatives. That's why a lot of the voters are coming across to One Nation who are supporting us. We've stood up for it wasn't the Prime Minister that wanted the apprenticeship scheme and stands there talking about it. It was One Nation's apprenticeship scheme. That's why we have over 100,000 apprentices out there because of One Nation. It wasn't the, the Liberal Party that stood up for many issues that has been supported by One Nation. And when the Prime Minister stands up and says he's, he's against vaccine mandates, but he's now in the supply budget, wants to give the, the money 
to get children from birth to four, month, four years of age to get vaccinated. Yet he does absolutely nothing about it to listen to the Australian people that do not want to be forced, coerced or blackmailed into getting a vaccine into their bodies that is against their will. This is not a prime minister for the people. He's also, he is a bully, and I back the senator up completely with that. He is a bully because I have experienced it myself. He's a man, you do it my way or there's no way. And it's a senator shame Hansen, your time has expired. Senator Betts. In these uncertain times, with Russia brutally invading Ukraine, China's communist dictatorship threatening democratic Taiwan and buying favour with the Solomon Islands, we need people of substance and stability and strength in the leadership of our country. The superficial headline seekers never cut it. They'll opportunistically praise the war criminal Putin one day and then quickly and hypocritically change their tune when the invaders of the Ukraine become a pariah. Consistency, the capacity to read, the writing on the wall is what is required. The backbone, the spleen to call things out early enough even if it doesn't win you friends, is what we need. Leadership isn't about cheap populism. Leadership is about warning, preparing and safeguarding with a view to the future. It's about honestly telling things as they are. Last night's budget did exactly those things by bolstering our defence and national security even further after Labor's disgraceful neglect and underinvestment. As someone who has consistently called out the brutal Chinese communist dictatorship, highlighting its human rights abuses from organ harvesting, religious persecution, genocide of the Uyghurs, along with its devious foreign interference in our institutions, I've been falsely called all sorts of names, gleefully parroted by certain elements in the media. Today, those vo voices are silent. One hopes shamefully silent. Today, the stands that some of us have taken are fully vindicated, and the government's recognition of the threats in last night's budget confirms to me that we are on the right track to build an even stronger future for all Australians with the defence capacity needed. Senator Griff. It's been an honour to be a part of the 45th and 46th Parliament, and I very much look forward to being a part of the 47th. I have worked with many in this and the other place who genuinely want to make a positive difference to people's lives. In fact, some are in this chamber right now. You know who you are, and I thank you for the good work that you do. This place should all be about doing good, and you all meet this in spades. Of course, there are also a good number who excel in the art of frustration and will do anything to stop the government of the day from achieving success. And there are those on both sides who particularly like to eat their own. This is such a pointless exercise that damages their and their party's reputation and, of course, the way in which the public view us. To me, public hearings are the best part of this job, as they often bring about change even before government formally responds to them. And Unfortunately, government has many hundreds that they have not responded to during this parliament. Sitting weeks, well, they are mostly an exercise in frustrating bill, package at all, bill passage at all cost. Now, being on the crossbench has enabled me to push for specific inquiries and projects. Some highlights are the digital platforms inquiry, IVF clinic disclosure, FASD campaigns, and numerous projects that will make a difference to those with cancer. I've also worked with the government on palliative care initiatives, and I'm very pleased that one key project in particular was announced in last, in, uh, last night's budget. There are also many who I'd want to thank for their support and friendship over the 45th and 46th Parliament. To the good humans in this place, it's been a pleasure working with you. And from my office, I sincerely thank Rachel Pace, Renee Brown, Jonathan Deans, Maria Moscatolo, Priscilla Kasbara and Rebecca Hammond. Thank you all for being at all times loyal and professional. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, and I do want to acknowledge uh, Senator Griff's comments there. Uh, it is a great privilege to be able to serve in this place, and uh, we do the best we can with what we have, and I think our staff really are a vital part of that, so I want to acknowledge that. 
and thank you for your service to the Australian Parliament, Senator Grigg. Uh, however, I do want to give the government a basting because you kind of think the government should be actually able to deliver a budget. I mean, there are people sitting here in the, in the chamber today, that the parliament's open and we've got the public back here, and they had to put petrol in their car. I bet they were screaming as they were paying through the nose for so much. So last night, they might be lulled into a false sense of confidence in this government. They're going to get a little bit, bit of relief at the bowels. We'll pay attention because you know, it might not come through for two weeks and what sort of mechanisms have they got in place to make sure it's actually going to get to us where it helps us in our hip pocket. But watch more and more closely because after May, not too far along, once we hit September, that's gone. Now, they won't be talking about that. They'll say that they're there for you because that's what they say all of the time. But the reality is this government is blind to the reality of what Australians are really going through. The budget is, as the Treasurer, Shadow Treasurer described it, a panicked, desperate and tapped out budget by a panicked, desperate and tapped out government. They have embedded in this budget three billion dollars, three billion dollars in cuts. $3 billion that they can't explain, $3 billion that they've hidden, as if we're all too stupid to notice. That is the way this, operates, this government operates. It tries to pull the wool over the Australians' eyes. Well, we cannot allow that to happen again. This government and its budget should be wholly rejected at the next point of election, which will be May 14 or May 21. We cannot afford another decade of a government unable to manage Australia's finances and economy. Senator Lambie. Thank you. I'm telling you what is scaring the living hell out of me right now, what is going on in the Solomon Islands. The Chinese government is this close to getting a deal that will let them set up a military base with one of our closest neighbours. We could have Chinese naval vessels floating around just outside our waters and Chinese military assets and equipment in our backyard. This deal will not make our region more safe. It will just increase tension and, and it increases the chances we'll get conflict. I'm calling on the Solomon Islands government not to sign to a deal that will make our regions less safe. You will not gain anything from running to China, I can assure you. You might make a quick buck, but it will come at the cost of your own sovereignty. It will come at the cost of it, I can assure you. Don't subject yourself to the wishes of a totalitarian government with an appalling track record on human rights. To the Australian government, you took your eyes off the road. You should be ashamed of yourselves. China is making moves in the Pacific. That is quite clear. What happened to your Pacific Island step up? What happened to it? You told us five years ago that you would protect us from this happening. And here it is. It's happening. I can tell you now you failed and you failed miserably. You sit there and you talk about national security. What a disgrace! What a disgrace! What an absolute disgrace from the government. Once again, we have a lack of planning and a lack of foresight. Now Australians are going to pay the price. I don't know if Labor will be any different. Don't get me wrong. But we're the ones at the wheel and it looks like we've fallen asleep. This car is hurtling off the road and I can tell you we could be about to hit a tree. It's not just bad for us. We just signed on to AUKUS. How does it look for the, our UK and US allies that we can't even keep the Chinese military out of our own backyard? I suggest the foreign minister makes a beeline to the Solomon Islands parliament and gets this sorted out immediately for the sake of our national security. Stop talking it up and get it done. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, beautiful black president. A truly successful budget is measured by the good in people's lives. Budgets are choices to do things or not to do them. The Prime Minister has chosen to not support legal assistance services like the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services, the Community Legal Services, the Family Violence Prevention Legal Service and the Legal Aid Commissions. In fact, Mr Morrison announced a budget cut in real terms to Aboriginal legal services and Aboriginal family violence prevention and legal services. This is after he promised during the close the gap process to do things differently. He's a liar. Close the gap isn't worth the paper it's written on. This is how they treat our people. This is a budget for the billionaires and the big corporations, not the people who are struggling in this country. Having access to legal help is critical to enforcing and protecting our rights, 
That is why the Morrison government chose to not support them. Legal assistance services are struggling to clear the COVID backlog and to make do with cuts to their budgets. This is why you need Greens in power. With Greens in power, this is what you'll get an age of legal responsibility at least 14 years of age, independent policy and prison oversight, a charter of human and environmental rights, a better family law system, and we would double funding for legal assistance services while also boosting their funding to cover the cuts by Mr Morrison. The Greens will build stronger and better connected communities, not funnel people into the quicksand of the criminal legal system. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. At the commencement of this parliament, in response to re representations I made to then Senator uh, Cormann, the government undertook to introduce legislation that would improve protections for public sector whistleblowers. As this parliament draws to a close, we find ourselves in an yet another uh, case of all announcement and no substance. The Assistant Minister, Attorney General, sitting opposite, uh, made an announcement recently saying they'd flick it to the next parliament. Sounds a little bit like an ICAC. These reforms are essential. Public sector workers need to have the courage to stand up and, and be able to so, uh, call out inappropriate conduct, illegal conduct, maladministration. Uh, and they can't do that when they don't have any protection. And it's even worse than that. Let's look at some of the people who have been very bravely come forward. Richard Boyle, an Adelaide constituent, came forward and blew the whistle on the tax officer's abuse of garnishy powers. And uh, sadly, he is in court now dealing with the fallout from that because uh, the government, uh, or in fact the, the, the ATO, did not properly process his claim. We've also got others. Witness K sadly already um, uh, convicted. Bernard Killeary, brave, brave person, honoured now by the, uh, by, by the uh, Timor-Leste parliament. And, uh, and David McBride, who, who uh, revealed war crimes in Afghanistan, and all of them are being persecuted for it. We cannot uh, have this situation. It's de it erodes our, uh, erodes our democracy when whistleblowers can't come forward and call out wrongdoing inside government. That just seems to be what the, the government wants. time has expired, Senator Patrick. Um, Senator Muriel Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. On so many levels and in so many ways, last night's budget was a missed opportunity to deliver for South Australians. But what is beyond comprehension to me is that this government, in this budget, failed to deliver a solution for the urgent health care needs in Sejuna at Yadu Health. I have stood in this chamber previously and talked about Yadu Health, talked about the catastrophic situation we have in Sejuna, where this Aboriginal controlled health clinic is in a state of catastrophic disrepair. Mould, asbestos painted over, a roof falling in, unsealed windows, parts of the building condemned, staff members being electrocuted at their desks. It is that unsafe, it is that unfit for the people who work there and the people they deserve. It is appalling. Yadu has been ignored. This community has been ignored. And for far too long, too many people have walked through the doors of Yadu, seen how catastrophic the conditions are there, and just kept on walking. The government knows the situation this clinic is in, and they could have used this budget to fix it. I am deeply proud that Labor has committed that if we are in government, we will spend $13.35 million to rebuild Yadu Health. It's time for the Liberals to match that commitment. Every single South Australian Liberal senator in this chamber should be standing up for Yadu, for the people of Sejuna and for the communities that this clinic serves. And the member for Grey certainly should be doing everything he can to secure this commitment from the Liberals. The people of Sejuna deserve so much more. The remote Indigenous communities that this clinic services deserve so much more. 
if you were serious about closing the gap, if you were serious about the health care needs of people in Sejuna, fix Yadu Health, rebuild it, match our commitment. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. In yesterday's uh, election budget, there was a recycled announcement for nearly a billion dollars in funding for the Great Barrier Reef, specifically 160 million of that for a reef adaption fund to help the reef uh, fight the challenges of climate change and invasive species uh, like the crown of thorns starfish. Uh, sadly, in yesterday's budget, there wasn't a cent for the Great Southern Reef, the Great Barrier Reef Southern Sister, a reef system that stretches from New South Wales down Victoria, around the coastline of my home state, Tasmania, through to South Australia and Western Australia. Um, the Great Southern Reef, over the last 20 years, has received just $4.8 million in funding from the Commonwealth, less than a per cent of what the Great Barrier Reef just got from this budget. This reef system is arguably as significant as the Great Barrier Reef in terms of its biodiversity, in terms of its ecology and its habitat, its impact on local communities right around this country. And I wanted to give a shout out today to the legends down in my home state of Tasmania who, on the smell of an oily rag, are trying to regrow Tasmania's giant kelp forest, this nation's first critically endangered habitat. In 2012, the giant kelp forests were declared in danger and not a cent has come from the government to help regrow those forests. We have legends like Professor Craig Johnson at the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies, Dr, Dr. Ling, Dr Kane Layton and, of course, Mick Barron at the Eagle Hawk Dive Shop Centre. I was lucky enough to go out with Mick Barron and Dr Scott Ling recently to look at the kelp forests and the work that they're doing to regrow them. But they need funding. They need the federal government to step up. Tarfish, the state's biggest uh, recreational fishing group, has recommended that both Labor and Liberal pledge this funding Senator that's Wish desperately Wilson, needed for the Great Southern Reef. Expired. Senator Davey. Thank you, Maddie, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise um, to bring some good news to the chamber. Uh, in, the, in the last few weeks, I've been uh, back up into the Hunter region. I've met with the Singleton and Musselbrook councils, and in previous visits to the area, I've met with the Cessnock and the Lake Macquarie councils. And the one piece of feedback I continually get from that area is that it is poised for a bright, a vivid, and exciting future. And I am so proud of our government for recognising this and identifying the Hunter as a key hub for regional development in our budget last night. We have dedicated $750 million for projects in the Hunter region to establish it as a key regional development and energy security hub in New South Wales. The Hunter already has it all going for it. It's got resources, it's got farming, it's got tourism, wineries, defence, and it's got me standing here happily representing it and very proudly advocating for the future for the Hunter. It's got opportunity for economic diversification, uh, and that is exactly what our regional hub investment is going to boost. In the investment, it includes almost $270 million to build the New England bypass to Musselbrook to improve freight outcomes for the region. We're also investing $100 million to support further activities and early works to make the port of Newcastle hydrogen export ready. This complements the state and federal government's commitment to make the Hunter a hydrogen hub into the future. And we're investing in the fast rail from Sydney to Newcastle because the Hunter is our future. Thank you. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr. President. So, like um, Senator Mario Smith, I searched the budget papers last night to see what investment had been made to Aboriginal medical services, in particular the South West Aboriginal Medical Service, known locally as SWARMS. It sits in the electorate of Forest. Uh, and it's a Liberal member, um, Ms Marino, who's the local member. Now, the South West Aboriginal Medical Service has been after a health hub for at least the last six years, the whole of the Morrison government's time, um, and certainly much uh, shorter time than Ms Marino has been 
the member for Forest, and they've spoken to Ms Marino. So imagine how disappointed they would be to see there's not a cent, not one single cent in the budget for the South West Aboriginal Medical Service, not one cent. They're currently paying $600,000 a year in rent, in funded money, because they have grown so much. There's 20 per cent increase in their services over the last three years, 20 per cent. But they have been ignored by all of those WA Liberal senators. They've been ignored by their local federal member. They've been ignored by the WA Aboriginal Affairs Minister. Um, Ken White, but they haven't been ignored by Labor. So we have committed to SWARMS 18.3 million if we win government, which will help them establish their new health hub. And they will be looking at the budget today to see they got not one cent, not one cent from you, not one cent in one of your own safe seats. You completely ignored the South West Aboriginal Medical Service. Shame on you. And let's hope that Labor wins and we can commit to that health hub to promote a service that's brilliant, that's well-renowned in the area, that's had a 20 per cent increase in its um, customers through the door, and you have completely Senator ignored. Senator Senator McGrath, you have under a minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my fellow now is not the time to vote, vote Labor. I need you to vote LNP because we do not want to let Albanese do to Australia what Palaszczuk has done to Queensland. Uh, just look at Queensland. We've got new taxes. We've got higher taxes. We've got a war on business. We've got a war on farmers. We've got more red tape. Guess what? We've got a premier who sends goons to raid the integrity commissioner's office. We've got a we've got a Labor government who are corrupt. You look up the white pages. You look up. There is corruption there in Queensland. Order. Do not let Albanese do to Australia what Palaszczuk has done to Queensland, and especially do not let those oxygen thieves at that end of the chamber get anywhere near government. Do not let the Greens destroy this Order. country in coalition with those oxygen thieves. Order. Order. Uh, there, there is a matter before the chair. Senator Birmingham, are you seeking the call on that I, matter? I, 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 I am on that matter. Uh, the matter Mr. that President. is before the chair, I um, will be clear. The, uh, that's right. So, Mr. President, I seek leave to, uh, to withdraw uh, the motion I moved in relation to hours of meeting for today, uh, and therefore to avoid the need to call a division. Uh, in doing so, I indicate to the chamber I will bring at the end of question time a revised motion to the chamber. The revised motion includes Senator McKim's request for the consideration of a disallowance motion as part of the revised hours of business. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. I also seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. You have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that Senator Colbeck and Senator Seselja will be absent from question time today, Wednesday, 30 March 2022, for personal reasons. In Senator Colbeck's absence, Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, the Minister for Sport, the Minister for Health and Aged Care, and the Minister for Regional Health. In Senator Seselja's absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction and the Minister for Science and Technology. I thank the Senate. Thank you. Now, I, I will just note we will move to question time now. I will note we are starting a, a, a minute and a half late. And I also will note that I uh, said yesterday that I would come back to the Senate in relation to points of order taken by Senators Wish Wilson and McKim in relation to matters raised in question time. I, I reiterate the point I made at the time that I considered the minister's answer to be directly relevant to the questions asked. I do not see it as my role as president to interpret a question as narrowly as the questioner might wish in circumstances uh, in which the minister, and particularly a minister in a representative capacity, uh, is, take, is talking directly about the government's intentions or actions in respect to the matter raised. This falls squarely within the principle that presidents cannot direct a minister how to answer questions. In answering the primary question, the minister discussed the government's provisioning, provision of additional funding to enhance the management of the Great Barrier Reef in the face of several issues, including the specific matter raised. By speaking further about the scope and aims of the funding, the minister remained relevant to the question asked. 
even though senators may have preferred that the minister had provided a different response. On the ruling, sir. certainly, <laughs> Senator Wong. Uh, uh, I don't wish to delay the chamber. There are another number of issues in that with which the opposition, uh, in relation to which the opposition might seek to put a submission to you. Uh, and in particular, I note uh, the reference to representative ministers. Um, the clerk has previously indicated, or I think Senator Ryan had previously indicated, you know, it's, if a, representative, a, re a minister representing is asked about the state of mind of another minister, then obviously that's not in their knowledge. But I would respectfully suggest that it would be a new um, threshold to suggest that somehow rep ministers representing have a different level of accountability to the chamber to ministers um, in their own portfolio. I don't wish to delay the chamber. I wish to reserve our position in relation to what you have articulated. To we, we have, we do want to consider whether or not what you have just said, Mr. President, um, is consistent with rulings of past presidents. Uh, and I would ask. I note that you said we started one and a half minutes late. I would ask that question time continue until the first, uh, from the moment the first question is asked, not the argy bargy, if I may, beforehand. Thank you. Senator McKim, on the matter. Just in response to your ruling, very briefly, President, if I could just indicate we share the concerns expressed by Senator Wong and um, just uh, place on the record that we may seek to make a further submission to you in regards to that ruling. I would welcome further submissions, uh, but on that we will move to question time. And I saw call Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister confirm that real wages are predicted to go backwards by 1.5 per cent this year, even more than the Morrison government's last budget anticipated. The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Ayres uh, for his question. Uh, Mr President, the budget papers do set out uh, the impacts of what we are seeing are global shocks and disruptions in relation to pressures on inflation uh, in Australia and right around the world. Uh, the shocks, the aftershocks of COVID-19 uh, that are causing disruptions to global supply chains, but most notably the terrible, tragic war that Russia is inflicting upon Ukraine at present, have had enormous implications for inflationary pressures right around the world. Those opposite may not want to acknowledge the fact that oil price spikes are a real inflationary factor, but they are a real inflationary factor. Senator Ayres spoke about uh, the change in relation uh, to inflation figures since the previous budget. Well, of course, since the previous budget, we have seen huge spikes in oil prices, which have a very direct impact in relation to there being higher inflation. Our government's responding to these pressures that Australians face. We're responding in terms of providing a 22 cent a litre reduction in the fuel excise, lowering petrol prices for Australians while this spike is in place, while the world moves through these terrible difficulties caused by what's happening in Ukraine, providing additional support to low, middle, fixed income Australians. And why are we able to do that, Mr President? We're able to do it because our government's created a strong economy, a strong economy that's got more Australians in jobs, a strong economy that's provided a stronger budget position that's enabling us to have lower deficits, lower debt, but also provide additional support for Australians when they need it. Additional support for Australian households, additional support for Australian motorists, farmers and businesses Minister, to ensure they get Minister, the help they deserve. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. I, I take it that's a yes. Uh, can, can the minister confirm an average Australian worker will be $1,000 $355 worse off this financial year thanks to real wages going backwards under this government again. Order. Minister. Mr President, I addressed the impact of inflation before, and it's set out in the budget papers in relation to uh, that interaction between inflation and wage rises. Now, the wage price index is forecast to uh, grow to three and a quarter per cent in the new financial year starting 1 July, following the provision of uh, these additional supports that we're providing. It then grows further to 3.5 per cent, real wages growth put out into the future. Senator Ayres, though, Mr. President, also asks about the dollar value. The dollar value. 
for, uh, for Australians in different circumstances. But when it comes to take-home pay for Australians, Mr. President, there are many factors at play. And when it comes to take-home pay, our income tax cuts play a very big factor, Mr. President. They play a very big factor. That someone earning around $90,000, Mr. President, under the Labor Party would have been paying $21,200 in income tax, but under the Liberal and National Parties are paying $18,600, Mr. President. A very significant Minister, addition to their take-home pay. Order on my left, Senator O'Neill. Senator Ayres, a second supplementary. Well, I'd ask uh, the minister, when he's answering this question, maybe to be a, bit, a little bit less smug. There's aged care workers up there for whom no provision has been made in the budget for an increase in their wages. Given 52 out of 55 of the government's wage forecasts have been wrong in the past, wrong, and real wages went backwards at a higher rate than even the government's last budget anticipated, why on earth should Australians believe anything that you promise uh, on wages on the eve of an election? Order. Minister. Well, Mr President, Australians should have faith because we've demonstrated an ability to increase the take-home pay of Australians by cutting their income taxes. We've demonstrated the ability to increase the ability of Australians to earn a wage by creating more jobs. 1.7 million more jobs under our government, Mr. President, that have been created during our time in office. 1.7 million more Australians who have the opportunity to work, the opportunity to earn an income, the opportunity to support their families, and thanks to our income tax cuts, get to take more of that pay home as well, Mr. President. Now, those opposite I see like to come and they'll grandstand in relation to hard-working aged care workers. I know that, uh, that they will Order. do that, Mr President. I've seen their calls, their calls to say they believe there should be an increase in wages for aged care workers. But will they put a number on that? No, Mr President. They don't have the guts. They won't put a number on it. They won't budget a cent for it in their election campaign promises because they're all just hollow Order. rhetoric with no Order. real action. Order. Sen Order. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please outline how the Liberal and National Government's budget delivers, delivers an economic plan to secure a stronger economy and create a stronger future for all Australians? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, I thank Senator Scar for his interest, and I know the interest of every single Liberal and National and Country Liberal Senator in this place who are committed and dedicated to creating opportunities for Australians in a stronger economy. And last night, our government handed down a budget that delivers a plan for a stronger future, that delivers a long-term economic plan to continue the growth in jobs and our economy that is world-leading that delivers record investments in essential services and necessary and essential investment in our defence and national security. It creates a stronger, more secure Australia. It's a budget that recognises the challenges we've come through from COVID-19 and that we now face in a more uncertain and contested Order. world. It's a budget that recognises the pressures households are feeling right now, which is why we are taking the dividends of a stronger economy to reduce debt to reduce deficits compared with what had been previously forecast. That's why we're also taking some of those dividends to help ease the pressures on Australian households, to ensure that $0.22 cent a litre cut in the petrol excise, which will save around 15 bucks every time an Australian goes to fill up their car, and of course provides additional benefits to hard-working parents who have to run around to work, to school, to Order. sport, provides additional benefits to those in regional Australia who have further distances to drive and for whom these impacts are greater. It provides additional support to low, middle, fixed income Australians by lifting the tax offset provisions, by providing one-off payments to help people get through the temporary spikes that we are seeing in relation to cost of living. But of course it does much more in terms of our plans for the future. It helps first homeowners get more first home buyers into the market. It provides additional support uh, for the provision of housing across the board. 
Mr President, this is a plan that shows we continue Order. to support Australians Minister, in every aspect of their lives. Minister, your time has expired. Order, Senator Watt. Order. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that outstanding answer. What steps is the government taking to address labour shortages, labour shortages to ensure Australia's strong economic recovery continues into the future? Minister. Mr President, this is a budget that backs Australians, their enterprise, their aspirations. The past two years have been tough, but our recovery is world leading. It's ahead of the Order. US, it's ahead of the UK, it's ahead of Canada, much of Europe or Japan. Mr President, Labor themselves—I hear lots of interjections—held jobs up as being the big test for the government in terms of how we manage the crisis. That's what Mr Chalmers said and nearly everybody else over there said. And, Mr President, we have delivered in spades. Unemployment is headed to a 50-year low. A 50-year low, Mr President, at 4 per cent, headed to 3.75 per cent, creating opportunities to get young Australians into skilled, secure jobs. During the pandemic, we invested some $13 billion in skills and training. The results speak for themselves. A record 220,000 Australians Order. are now in trade apprenticeships, the highest number since records Senator began, Thorpe. and last night laid the foundations for even more young Australians Minister, to get an opportunity in an apprenticeship Minister, and in training. Your time has expired. Senator Scar, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Minister for another outstanding answer. I give him another opportunity. Excellent. How will the government's long term plan for a stronger future help businesses and manufacturers and ensure Australians have the services and the supports they need and deserve? All those Minister. Mr. President, small businesses are at the heart of our economy. Nearly 8 million Australians are employed in small businesses. That's why our government delivered lower tax rates for small businesses, the lowest tax rates in 50 years for Australian small businesses. And this, government, this budget builds on that support, providing more tax incentives for small businesses to invest in skilling Order, their workforce, more tax incentives for small business to invest in the digital technologies to uplift their productivity and their capabilities. It's a budget also that invests in securing our supply chains as a nation, in manufacturing, we will see the first mRNA vaccine manufacturing facility in the Southern Hemisphere built in Australia. There's additional support for our universities, for CSIRO and industry to ensure the rapid commercialisation of different products innovated in Australia and an extension of our patent box tax Order. reforms Senator to make Pratt. sure that innovations that happen in Australia can be commercialised in Australia and manufactured in Australia, creating more job opportunities for more Minister. Australians into the future. Minister. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Minister, the budget contains three billion dollars worth of secret cuts. What are they? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, it's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that Senator Gallagher has, uh, has asked that question. I, uh, I thought it was just the foolishness of Mr. Chalmers. Uh, in relation to pursuing uh, this claim of secret cuts somehow. As I've already addressed publicly, uh, Mr President, this budget, uh, this budget oh, well, I'm happy, Senator Wong, to repeat it here, that clearly the failings on your side in the ability to read the budget paper, to read the budget taper. There is a reduction, Mr President. Yeah, Senator Watts holding it up. Go and have a look at his screen. It says a reduction in decisions taken but not yet announced. Guess why, Mr. President? Because we've announced them, Mr. President. Because we've announced them. There's your answer, Order. Senator Gallagher. That in important areas, Order. important areas like women's safety, we had made a provision in my EFO for women's Order safety. We made right. the provision for women's safety. Now we've announced on the spending on women's safety. A very important provision that we put in place in this budget. We did the same, Mr. President, in areas of apprenticeship reform. We made a provision in my EFO, and now we've announced the spending on apprenticeship reform. Do you know what this is, Mr. President? It's careful, prudent budgeting. It's recognising there may be expenses that come forward in the future, Order. and you put some away to meet those expenses. That, of course, Mr. President, is why our government is able to maintain a AAA credit rating. 
It's why our government is able to hand down budgets where the deficits are lower than expected. Oh, those opposite when in government, those opposite when in government, when they announced budgets, they ordinarily had then deficits far greater than what they had forecast. We've come through a pandemic. We've come through a pandemic, and what we have done in every year since facing that pandemic at budgets, budget updates and this Order, budget is Senator reduced Wong. the size of the forecast Senator deficits Wong. thanks to our careful Minister, management. Minister, your time has expired. Order, we are not going to go to the question until there's silence. Senator Wong, you're not assisting the chamber. Senator Wong. I have called both sides during this answer. I have called both sides, Senator Wong, in this exchange. I was going to make a comment about how much clearer the chamber was without the barriers, but I'm not so sure anymore. Senator Gallo. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I look forward to pursuing uh, this at estimates. Minister, in the MIEFO, you had $16 billion worth of decisions taken but not yet announced. In this budget, in the final forward estimates years, you have $3 billion worth of cuts to expenditure. Why won't you just be up front and explain what those cuts are, or are you just trying to get through to the next election? Minister. The, 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 thanks, Mr President. Well, the thing about the budget is all of the lines of expenditure are there and transparent for the opposition to see. They're Order. there for the opposition to see. Yes, we have, we have taken decisions to reverse out some decisions taken but not yet announced and to realise some of those decisions, to announce them, to publish Senator them in the budget Pratt. papers, to make them transparent. Those opposites seem to think, seem to, those opposites seem, Mr Keneally. President, uh, to think that, of course, government shouldn't put away for potentially foreseen expenditure. We think it's prudent to put away for that. It's a bit like, Mr President, what those opposites used to do on commodity prices. Does anybody remember when Mr Swan, who of course is the mentor of Mr Chalmers, the now shadow treasurer, when Mr Swan Order. used to take high commodity prices and assumed they'd right. continue into the future? Little oh, wonder Senator his budgets Keneally. blew out. We assume commodity prices will come down. Another act of careful, cautious, conservative Minister, budgeting. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, wasn't last night's budget nothing more than a pre-election cash splash, only to be followed by secret cuts yep. afterwards? Yep. Minister. Order. No, Mr. President, it is not. This budget represents the economic plan for the future Order. for Australia, an economic plan that has delivered record jobs for Australians. An economic plan that has been built on lower taxes for Australians. Under the coalition, income taxes are lower than they were under the Labor Party. Under the coalition, taxes on Australian small businesses Order. are lower than they were under the Labor Party. Under the coalition, taxes on Australian industry and energy and electricity are lower than they were under the Labor Party. Taxes on housing retirees, investments are lower than they would have been under the Labor Party. Could we imagine Order the disaster that would have right. befallen Australia and during COVID-19 if their $386 billion of higher taxes had been Order. applied just at the time when the economy needed opportunities and room for business to grow? Thank God we won the last election, Mr President, and we will paint a clear Order. choice to Australians Minister. at the next Minister. election. Senator Wong. I don't think he can hear you, sir. I called the minister when his time expired, Senator Wong. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. How do you justify pouring millions of public money into polluting offshore gas? when we're in a climate emergency? I'm not asking you. I'm a, are you the minister? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm not in— I'm not I, talking to you either. Senator Thorpe, 
please. It's not entirely clear at the moment which minister this is being directed at. Is it Minister Mackenzie? Whoever. Uh, okay. Industry, science, and the minister representing the minister for industry. industry Senator lower McKenzie. emissions. The minister lower representing emissions. lower emissions have reduced 20 per cent, and we're very proud of that very as a nation. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of countries that talk a big game with respect to lowering emissions, and they actually don't deliver. And on this side of the parliament, we actually focus on delivery and outcomes, uh, not platitudes. We're focused on delivering affordable, reliable energy to support the economy and new jobs. And Australians' competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy and gas, will be central to our ongoing economic recovery. On this side, we understand that gas is a critical enabler of our economy, which employs so many working-class Australians. For the past decade, the manufacturing sector has depended on gas as its largest source of energy. Gas makes up 42 per cent of manufacturing's total energy use, according to the latest Australian energy statistics. And that is why our gas-fired recovery is so critical. It is a cornerstone in strengthening Australia's sovereign capabilities. You only need to look at what's happening to gas prices in Europe to see the devastation that can occur to the economy when the prices are rising more than 300 per cent. As a result of industry and government working together, we've been able to avoid these international price hikes, with our prices being around 78 per cent lower than prices in Europe, which were trading at over $47 Australian per gigajoule in mid-March. We're taking action to boost the East Coast gas mask market across the entire supply chain. Through the budget, we're backing Order. seven priority projects, as well as key carbon Senator capture and storage and pipelines with a $50.3 million investment. Our investment will get local gas to where it's needed to help keep the lights on and homes heated in southern Australia. This will, in, in our home state, Senator Thorpe of Victoria, it does get quite cold. Having homes heated during winter is important. Minister, this Minister will... your time has expired. Uh, Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. In the interest of human life as we know it, will you introduce a moratorium on offshore gas drilling across this country? Men order. Order on my right. Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President and um, Senator Thorpe. I've just outlined why it is important to back a gas-led uh, recovery post-COVID, not just for local jobs out in the regions and uh, in our industrial sections of our capital cities so that working Australians can earn a good wage in high-paying uh, long-term careers, but it is also important that we have a gas-led recovery to ensure that individual Australians and working families can ha heat their homes at an affordable cost. I tried to outline to you, Senator Order. Thorpe, what the impact of not investing in uh, fuel sources such as Senator gas Hughes. can have, and you are seeing the implications of that in Europe right now. And you know what, Senator Thorpe? It is not the people who vote for the Greens that are actually affected by these type of things. It is not uh, the inner city elites on their very high wages. Uh, that actually Minister, have to worry about Minister, their housing Minister, heating costs. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Thorpe, a second supplementary question. Thank you, President. This government is paying to destroy Gunai Sea country, my country, in Gippsland with the Golden Beach fracking project. Where did you get your consent from to frack my country? Minister. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mr. President. Well, we are very lucky in this country that both state and federal governments over a long period of time have taken very seriously uh, the need to have the right regulatory framework around uh, the development of particularly uh, gas-fired projects. Order, Minister. On a point of order, Senator Thorpe. Simple question, President. Who gave you consent to frack, Senator Thorpe. stop, Gunai country Senator as a Gunai Thorpe. woman. Who gave you consent? Senator Thorpe. 
Senator Thorpe, the minister was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have 45 seconds. So, at a both uh, a state and federal level, there are quite uh, strict regulatory controls on both. Uh, on a whole range of approvals that must be sought in terms of building these Lord, type of projects. But Minister, I absolutely Minister, Minister, Senator Thorpe on a point of order. I am a traditional owner of Gunai Country. My mother Senator is on Thorpe. the Elders Council. Senator Thorpe. Where did you get your consent? Senator Thorpe, that is not a point of order. Minister, you have 33 seconds. Order. Senator Thorpe. Senator McMahon, Senator Scar, you're not assisting. Order. Order. Minister, if you wish to make further contribution, you have 30, 27 seconds remaining. Yes, I would, because I proudly Order, back Senator the resources Ford. industry in Australia, including the gas industry and the tens of thousands of Australians that they employ, hard-working men and women across the length and breadth of Minister, this country. And we do not Minister, take a backward step. Minister, uh, Mr Minister, President, I don't appreciate being Minister, yelled at. Minister, Senator Thorpe, is this a point of order? Absolutely. What is the point of order, The Senator point Thorpe? of order is relevance to my question, and my question is, where did this Senator minister Thorpe. get consent from to, Thorpe. to drill my country? Senator Thorpe, you've had a chance to restate answer your question, the question on two occasions. I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. The minister was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have 14 seconds if you wish. Yes, I do, Mr President. Uh, wish to continue. Without the action that our government is taking to address supply, industry and households will be actually faced with higher prices, disruptions in supply and planned outages, and it is low-income Australians expired. that are going to be most affected. The time has expired. The time has expired. Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe, resume your seat. Senator Thorpe, Senator Henderson. I thank you very much. Thank you very order. much, Mr. President. That's what you said last time, Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Patterson. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. If I could just ask my question now, please. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Mr. Senator Thorpe. Senator Davy. Senator Davey on the point of order. Yep. Senator Sorry, Thorpe. Chair. My point of order is just I would like to carry on with question time. There are other people who have questions, and we, these continual interruptions are not conducive. It's disorderly conduct in the Senate. Senator Thorpe, you had a chance to ask your question. The question was answered by the minister. Senator Thorpe, we must proceed with question time. Senator Henderson, you have the call. I thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the minister outline how the Liberal and National Government plan outlined in last night's budget will deliver a stronger future for regional Australia? Sorry, uh, I wasn't sure how the question was directed, but I know it was to Minister Mackenzie. Please, Minister, you have the call. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Henderson for your question and uh, the way you champion our home state in the regions in Victoria. This is an historic budget for the regions, one that reflects our government and my party's paramount belief that this nation's, this nation's future prosperity is in inextricably linked to the health and wealth and opportunity that exists in our regions. The budget builds on the $100 billion since 2013 that we have already made as a government in infrastructure, digital connectivity, health and education. As the Treasurer stated last night, no government has invested more in our regions than this Liberal National Coalition. And last night we announced an unprecedented $2 billion regional accelerator program that is open to regional centres across the country that have the ambition and plan to grow, seek to overcome challenges and seize new opportunities that this decade uh, will see. It will take a place-based, locally driven, data-focused approach enlisting the private sector to drive catalytic, transformative economic growth in areas such as manufacturing, education, supply chains, export opportunities and industry development. From Mount Gambier and Davenport to Mildura, 
or um, Mildura or Mackay. If these regional centres want to strengthen and grow their local economy and secure a stronger future, this $2 billion program will be available for this purpose. I look forward uh, to prospective councils and regions coming forward with their plans and projects that will create local jobs and build on their own unique local assets. The centrepiece of the Regional Accelerator program, which will be open from 1 July, is the $500 million regionalisation fund, which will deliver opportunities for individual regions to define and invest in their own ambitions for growth. It is intended that the regionalisation fund will provide for larger grants of, say, $10 million or more for transformational projects which will support long-term economic growth and job Minister, creation in the Minister, regions. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Oh, thank you, Minister. Can the Minister outline how this budget will grow and strengthen regional communities? Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator. As I was saying, from Mount Gambier to Mildura, from Dubbo to Devonport, new budget initiatives such as our $2 billion regional accelerator program Order. will provide strategic investment to our regions and transform them. Examples on how the Regional Accelerator Program will unlock those, unlock those transformative opportunities is our, a regionally focused two rounds of our modern manufacturing initiative to the tune of half a billion dollars so that those regional centres right across the country that see their ambition as being an industrial heartland and centre will have the support to make that happen. We're putting $200 million towards the regional stream of the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, which will encourage businesses to build resilience across our supply chain, a fragility that was exposed during COVID-19. And we're putting $118 million on the table for regional universities to boost prioritised research and development with industry partners through a regionally focused trailblazers Minister, program. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a second supplementary. Uh, can the minister explain the risks to regional jobs, families and businesses if regional Australia is not supported by strong long-term investments? Minister. Order. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This budget sees the largest investment in rural and regional Australia in our nation's history, and it is the Liberal National Government of this generation that's delivered it. Those opposite, the, the Leader of the Opposition couldn't even hardly bring his, himself to mention the word regions in his National Press Club address recently. They do not have a plan or the policy initiatives to actually drive economic growth in the regions. Uh, we're seeing a transformation of population shift post-COVID. A lot more Australians are actually recognising that to live in a community where you know your neighbour, you can have a great local job and uh, a prosperous future is out with rural and regional Australians, but it's not going to be those opposite that come to the table with any plan to develop that future. I'm going to be keenly interested uh, in seeing what Mr Albanese delivers tomorrow night and how he focuses on the economic growth opportunities in rural and regional, Minister, but we know Minister, it's only our side of government Minister, that has time, the region's back. Your time has expired. Sorry, Senator Chisholm, just before we go to you, I do wish to draw the attention of honourable senators to the presence in the gallery of a delegation from Papua New Guinea, led by the Minister for Communication and Information Technology, the Honourable Timothy Masiu. Mas Masiu. Masiu. I hope I've got that right. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. <laughs> Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Eleven days ago, the Queensland government wrote to the Prime Minister asking for assistance with Queensland's flood cleanup and rebuilding effort. But last night's budget announced nothing to help Queensland. Why has the Prime Minister once again turned his back on Queenslanders? Shame. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And, um, okay, I, I thank Senator Chisholm for, uh, for the question. Uh, albeit, I think the continued efforts to uh, to play politics with tragic and terrible natural disasters is uh, is at the very least unbecoming uh, in uh, in terms of the way the opposition approach it. Uh, Mr. President, firstly, let me place on record uh, all of our thoughts for those affected by recent natural disasters across Australia: uh, the loss of the loss of life, the loss of property, 
the impacts that that has had upon so many Australians, in uh, particular across parts of New South Wales, southeast Queensland, uh, especially most intently uh, in the Northern Rivers parts of New South Wales. Uh, but those losses being felt across many regions are real. Uh, they have a devastating impact on families, uh, on businesses, and require significant reconstruction efforts. Mr. President, in response to those disasters, uh, our government has provided uh, extensive uh, assistance and support to date. Uh, we have provided, Mr. President, uh, more than one million uh, payments that have been made uh, to families uh, across New South Wales and Queensland uh, in support uh, of their immediate needs and assistance. Uh, we have provided the initial activation in relation to disaster assistance support across New South Wales and Queensland. And contrary to the question that was asked and the assertion suggesting, Mr. President, uh, that there is, uh, was not Order. coverage in last night's budget. In fact, last night's budget provided more than $6 billion uh, of support uh, for natural disaster assistance response across New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, parts, of that response, parts of that response, which I know Senator Watt knows and he's just playing Order. politics with it, is essentially a demand-driven response in elements of Category A and Category B funding in elements of Category A and Category B funding that we will continue to provide for repair of roads, repair of bridges, repair of infrastructure and critical support to those communities. Minister. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. And it's not politics to highlight incompetence, which is what we are doing. Order. It has been 20 days since Mr Morrison announced that his government would provide Order. flood victims in the electorate of Page with assistance payments of $3,000 each. Thousands of homes across South East Queensland were also devastated, yet Mr Morrison has only provided Queensland flood victims with assistance payments of $1,000 each. Why does Mr Morrison think flood victims in New South Wales are worth more than three times as much as those in Queensland? Minister. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President uh, this, is, uh, this is very sad and shallow politicking from, uh, from those opposite who, who, seem, who seem to have decided uh, to turn a blind eye to the facts of the circumstance. The facts of the circumstances around a one in 500 year flood event uh, of such magnitude and natural disaster, the likes of which communities have not seen before in relation to what has occurred uh, in those parts of the Northern Rivers districts of New South Wales. Uh, whilst all of these disasters are a terrible tragedy for the communities involved, the intensity, the severity of that flood disaster uh, in New South Wales, as acknowledged, for example, by former Governor-General Peter Cosgrove and others, was the likes of which we have not seen before. So for those offered to se seemingly begrudge the additional assistance provided to those in the Northern Rivers district uh, is really quite unbecoming, quite Order. unfair, and it is just nothing but cheap politics. Minister. Senator Chisholm, a we can see where the cheap politics is coming from. <laughs> One month on from the floods, Gympie residents are still living in tents and being forced to bathe outside after their houses have been deemed uninhabitable. Why has the Morrison government abandoned flood victims in Gympie? Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. President, it has not. And, uh, and indeed, uh, in Queensland, Order. Mr. President, in Queensland, some 307,045 payments and grants have been, uh, been made. Uh, in Gympie, that is 8,883 uh, to, uh, to date, uh, according to, uh, to the advice uh, that I have. Now, the support does not stop there. The support does not stop there, Senator Watt. Uh, and the way, in which, the way in which you prey on the vulnerable, the way in which you prey on those who have lost, Senator the way in which you seek to achieve political capital Order. at the expense Minister. of people facing Minister. natural disaster Minister. is disgusting. Senator Chisholm on a point of order. On, on relevance, um, this specifically went to those people abandoned in Gympie, of which I have been to and talked to those people. For the Miss Minister to treat them that way is absolutely Senate, appalling. Senator They're living Chisholm, in tents. Senator Chisholm, that's not a point of order. 
Minister, you have 18 seconds remaining. Mr President, we will continue to work under the established disaster guidelines, providing billions of dollars of support into Queensland and to New South Wales in response to these floods, but we won't seek to undertake the type of political grandstanding of those opposite at the expense of the vulnerable. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and National Government's budget is delivering on our commitment to end family, domestic and sexual violence? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Askew for her ongoing interest on in what is a very important issue for every single Australian. Well, in last night's budget, we made uh, an announcement, an historic $1.3 billion of new funding to bring uh, and for new investments to women's safety initiatives. Uh, this brings our commitment to the first action plan uh, under the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children in this country to $2.5 billion. The development of the next National Plan has been the culmination of many, many months of consultation uh, with advocates, with victim survivors, with service providers, with researchers and other experts across the whole of Australia to make sure that we had the most input uh, and engagement we could. Because we know for the next national plan to succeed, we must listen, we must engage, and we must get this right. That's why the plan has been informed importantly by contributions by people who have lived experience of family, domestic and sexual violence, which we have managed to gather that information through forums such as uh, the 2021 National Summit on women's safety, as well as surveys, targeted consultations, uh, interviews and public comments that we have sought throughout the process. And the voices and experiences of victim survivors are absolutely essential when we design the programs and when we deliver the programs, because we need to ensure that our programs are designed and delivered in a trauma-informed way. Importantly, our investment spans the entire life cycle of domestic violence. We need to deal with prevention early intervention, response and recovery, because if we are to end gender-based violence, we must address all areas. Uh, the women's safety package included $22.2 million towards yeah. prevention initiatives, including supporting Our Watch. Uh, it included uh, $328.2 million for early intervention, as well as $480 million for response. Yeah. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, in what further ways is the government investing in recovery measures to end violence against women and their children? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, listening to victim survivors and people with lived experience um, has actually reaffirmed, uh, reaffirmed what we already know, and that is trauma stays with people unless it's addressed. And we must ensure that people who are suffering trauma get access to the right supports beyond the crisis response. That's over months, years and sometimes lifetimes. Uh, our historic $290 million commitment to recovery measures in yesterday's budget sets out uh, a path to ensure that victim survivors are supported so that they can rebuild their lives, participate in their workforce and participate in their community. We are particularly targeting and committing $48.7 million to provide targeted trauma-informed mental health therapies and helping survivors navigate the health care system. Seeking justice uh, must not add to the trauma, and survivors must be supported to work through their trauma sooner, guided by their own goals, and that is why we are spending 87.9 to expand the Lighthouse Project. Senator Askew, a second supplementary. Thank you. And how is the government keeping women and children safe when they do make the brave decision to leave a violent relationship? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, our government is absolutely committed to breaking down the barriers uh, to women when they leave a violent relationship. Yesterday, we announced uh, an additional $240 million extension to the escaping violence payment, which provides women up to $5,000 to help them establish a life free from violence. Uh, this will support another 37,000 women who have made that incredibly brave decision to leave a violent relationship. We have also committed an additional $100 million to build emergency accommodation because we know the most important thing on that day that you make that brave decision is to have a safe place to go, a roof over your head 
where you can start to, to rebuild your life and get back on your feet. We are also providing $54.6 million to support women and children staying in their own homes when it is safe to do so, through planning, personal safety, uh, etc. And this helps women and children remain in their communities, in their schools without disruption, and ensures perpetrators are punished and not the victim. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cox. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Morrison government handed down a budget that makes housing more expensive, locks in tax cuts for the wealthy and funds more coal and gas projects. Minister, as the climate crisis ravages our country, how can you stand by a budget that provides more than $38 billion in handouts to coal, oil and gas corporations but cuts climate spending by 35 per cent? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, there was quite a bit in, uh, in terms of that question, uh, but, uh, but I'll try to deal first and foremost specifically with the, uh, the questions that Senator Cox uh, posed at the end of her commentary there. Uh, and Mr. President, it's incorrect uh, to assert, as she did in relation uh, to climate expenditure, uh, the government's investment in relation to achieving net zero, continuing to drive down emissions from the 20 per cent reduction that Australia has achieved uh, to date uh, and continuing to invest in areas of low emissions technology is real. In this budget alone, building on top of our previous low emissions strategies and commitments, in this budget alone there is new funding uh, for microgrids in rural and regional communities to take them uh, off of diesel power generation to give them both cleaner and cheaper electricity for the future. In this budget alone, Mr. President, there is of course the uh, patent box reforms I've already referenced to ensure that clean energy, low emissions technologies developed in Australia are actually commercialised in Australia to make sure that we seize the advantage. And all of this is building on the fact that in this budget too there's more money for hydrogen. Uh, for ensuring that the hydrogen hubs our government is seeking to develop and invest in that industry also supports the development of demand for hydrogen to ensure all aspects of the supply chain for hydrogen are supported, uh, Mr. President. Uh, so this is very strong. Now, in terms of the uh, claims about subsidies uh, that Senator Cox has made, uh, and this is a common refrain from the Australian Greens, where when you dig down, what they're actually talking about are the diesel fuel tax rebates. That's the subsidies they're talking about, which are essentially tax rebates provided uh, to businesses in Australia, to those in the resources sector, to Australian farmers as well, tax rebates Order. in relation right. to their business expenses. That's not an uncommon thing. It's certainly not a subsidy in terms of their operations. These are some of the biggest taxpayers in Australia, some of the biggest contributors to our economy in terms of jobs and revenue and from that support for climate action, Minister, for example. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Cox, a supplementary question. Thank you. This budget fails to fix the housing crisis. Minister, do you acknowledge that there is $13 billion for property investors in the form of negative gearing and capital gains tax concession but no new money for affordable housing in this budget? Shame. Order. Minister. Uh, Mr. President, no, I don't acknowledge that, uh, Mr. President, um, uh, because I don't agree with it. Uh, there's, in fact, two billion dollars extra in this budget uh, for the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. Two billion dollars of additional support to help them with the low-cost financing that NIFIC provides through community housing providers to support social and affordable housing. But this is also Order. a budget, Mr. President, which we proudly build upon our track record as parties in government of supporting first home ownership. We are proud from the very foundation of the Liberal and National parties to have always supported first home ownership. And the first home guarantee that our government has introduced Order. are is helping tens of thousands of young Australians to get Order into their first home right. sooner than would have been the case, Senator to stop Ford. paying rent, to start paying off a house to have the economic and financial security that comes with owning your own home, and we are incredibly proud of that Minister. achievement. Senator Cox, a second supplementary question. <laughs> if you're a low or middle income earner, this budget gives you a once-off $420 bonus, but under the stage three tax cuts, a millionaire will get an extra $9,000, not once, not twice, but each and every year. Why is the lining of pockets of millionaires more important than helping ordinary Australians with the cost of living? 
Minister. Well, Mr. President, uh, Senator Cox, you mentioned stage three tax cuts. Of course, they're stage three because we've already delivered stage one and stage two. And stage one and stage two prioritise low and middle income Australians first and foremost. Now, I know that if we have a change of government, heaven forbid, at the next election, it won't matter whether you're a low income Australian or a high income Australian, you'll end up paying higher taxes. You'll end up paying higher taxes, which is evidenced from the fact that every one of Senator Cox's questions Order. was about putting more tax on some of Australia's biggest income earners, more tax in relation to Australian property owners, more tax in relation to Australian workers. What you can see there is the Greens. If they have the ability Order. to hold Senator as they Cox. will the Labor Party, hold them to things in government, then the Australian Greens will be pushing for more taxes on Australian wages, more taxes on Australian housing, more taxes Minister, on Australian industry, Minister, and they will leave Australia Minister. far worse off. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister confirm that of the $7.1 billion allocated in the budget to regional areas, none will be spent in South Australia? The Minister, order, order, Senator Farrell, Senator Farrell, the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, and thank you, thank you, Senator Smith, uh, for the question in which you seem to have uh, assumed that there's only one measure in the budget papers relating to regional Australia, when in fact there are many measures in the budget papers relating to regional Australia. Yes, Mr. President, there is there is one measure that is particularly focusing on resource and energy hubs and providing investment in terms of infrastructure and spending in those resource and energy oh, hubs. No. But there is also support, Mr President, in other ways for regional Australia. Two billion dollars of the regional acceleration program that Senator McKenzie was speaking of before, which will help ensure that whether it is across Senator manufacturing or the skills agenda or exporters from regional South Australia, they will have a greater opportunity in relation to accessing those areas of regional funding. In relation to the infrastructure spending, Mr President, I've noticed Senator commentary, Watt. Mr. President. I've noticed commentary in non-South Australian media, in the Financial Review or elsewhere, suggesting that South Australia is receiving a disproportionate share of infrastructure spending. In fact, up to 17% of new infrastructure commitments going into South Australia, Mr. President. So you've got to be careful when you start trying to pick Order. and choose in those Senator regards, because what we've seen in relation to delivery of the North-South Corridor, in relation to investment in the South East Freeway, in relation to support for the Horrocks Highway, is that in South Australia there is a surge in relation to infrastructure spending and investment supporting Order. SA. And of course, Mr. President, then in terms of our government, of our government, there is perhaps the most significant impact for South Australia, which is what we have done to turn around defence industry investment, Mr. President. Those Order. opposite, those opposite, Mr. President, who commissioned zero vessels when they were in government, zero, zero vessels in terms of naval shipbuilding, versus on this side, 70 vessels as part of a strategy Minister. supporting SA and Minister. WA. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Last month, Liberal MP for Barker, Tony Passan, blasted this government, saying that South Australians in the southeast of the state had felt, and I quote, kicked in the guts and re-traumatised more than two years after they were forgotten in the black summer bushfires. Why does the Morrison government keep turning its back on regional South Australians? Minister. Order. Oh. Well, Mr. 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 President, Mr. President, I just I do not accept the premise of that question at all. I just went, Mr. President, I just went through a number of the areas of investment for South Australia. And Mr. President, in terms of generating further wealth for regional communities in South Australia, you need look, for example, only at one of our major manufacturing investments that uh, that we have announced and made. The new investment in plant protein will ensure that South Australian grains and legumes producers have the opportunity not just to be exporters of their grains or legumes to the world, but to benefit from value adding, to actually have a manufacturing industry that invests in higher value products, generating more for our farmers, 
more for our regional communities. It's not just that investment in roads, it's not just that investment in other infrastructure, it is of course also that creation of new industries across SA which are making sure it will be stronger into the future. Senator Smith, a second supplementary question. Senator, as Mr Passon said, during the bushfire, South Australians in the South East felt forgotten. They felt kicked in the guts when they missed out on support. Now they've missed out on the $7.1 billion in regional spending. Even when your own Liberal colleagues call out the Morrison government for re-traumatising, forgetting and kicking South Australians in the guts, why should South Australians feel any different? Minister. Well, Mr President, South Australians should have confidence that in relation to what our government has Order. done in supporting SA, in investing in defence, in investing in infrastructure, in supporting regions, has made a fundamental difference in terms of job creation, in terms of economic opportunities. Senator South Australians, Pratt. like all Australians, are paying lower taxes thanks to our government. South Australian businesses, small businesses, are paying lower taxes thanks to Order. our government. South Australians, indeed, like those across the national electricity market, are paying lower electricity prices thanks to our government. Let's just take that, for example, Mr President. Uh, that electricity price averages, when the Labor Party was last in office, grew by 12.9 per cent. But under our government, we've brought that back to 0.4 per cent throughout the life of our government, or indeed a reduction of 8 per cent over the last two years. That means if you're in SA or elsewhere across the NEM, you get the opportunity as a rural Minister, or regional person or anybody Minister, else for more cost-effective living expired. and business. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, as well as a proud Western Australian, Senator Cash. Yeah. Minister, how will this Liberal National Government's plan, as outlined in last night's budget, help Australian small and family businesses who already provide more than four in ten Australian jobs to create more jobs for Australians and secure a stronger economic future for this country? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Small for the question. And as always, I acknowledge Senator Small as one of those people who does employ Australians, who runs a small business, Small's Bar, uh, down in Bunbury in Western Australia. And uh, Senator Small, you're on the coalition side of politics, so you understand that small and family business, they are the backbone of the Australian community. They are the heart of our local communities. They employ nearly 8 million Australians. And Mr President, currently in Australia, we have more people in work than ever before. We have more people in work now than we did before COVID-19. And of course, a lot of that has to do with the growth of small business in this country. When you look at how small businesses themselves they embraced the policies that the coalition government put in place throughout COVID-19. Employment in small business has grown by around 10 per cent since the beginning of the pandemic. That just shows you how resilient the small businesses in Australia are, and in particular, uh, Mr President, where Senator Small comes from in Bunbury in Western Australia, how resilient those small businesses are Order. in rural and regional Australia. And last night, what did the government do? Well, we backed small and family businesses ever further. They are already benefiting from the lowest tax rate in 50 years and record investment incentives under the coalition government. That is a stark contrast, Mr President, to what those on the other side offer. Under the other side, they were paying a tax rate of 30 per cent. They are currently paying a tax rate of 25 per cent. That is the lowest tax rate in, tw in 50 years. But last night, we invested further, and in particular, we have invested a tax rebate, a tax deduction, a $120 tax deduction they will get by investing in upskilling their workforce. For every $100 a small business spends on training their Minister, employees, they will Minister, get a $120 Minister, tax your deduction time back. Has expired. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Minister Cash, in light of that outlining of achievements for small and family businesses in Australia, doing what they do best, creating jobs, employing Australians and training Australians for future jobs. How is this a budget delivered by the Liberal National Government 
that can ensure Australia's small and family businesses continue to do what they do best, unimpeded by red tape, with easier access to support from this government that understands their needs. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, again, Senator Small, he understands small business, so he understands that, in particular, investing in his workforce, in the skilled workforce, that ensures that small businesses are able to prosper, to grow, and to create more jobs for Australians. Senator Small also understands, though, how important it is for the government to invest in small businesses so that they can embrace the digital revolution. And, Mr. President, you saw it again last night the coalition government further investing in the capacity and the growth of small business. From budget night, every $100 these small businesses spend on digital technologies like cloud computing—we know how important that is—e-invoicing, cybersecurity and web design. That will now see them get a $120 tax deduction. That, again, is getting them into where we need them to be, the digital age. But also, Mr President, what we are focused on is cutting as much red tape as we can for small business, because Minister, when you cut red tape, Minister, they prosper, they grow, Minister, they create more Minister. jobs for Australians. Senator Small, a second supplementary. Th thank you, Mr President. And, uh, we've heard a lot from Minister Cash on uh, I guess the strengths of Australia's small and family businesses in providing those jobs and taking up the support that they get from this government to support the investment that underpins the jobs. But the real question that faces this chamber and indeed the people of Australia very shortly is what are the risks to those uh, jobs and economic opportunities if our small and family businesses in this country are not supported by a government that wants to see them prosper and grow? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I think it's pretty obvious uh, on this side of the chamber what the greatest uh, risk to small and family business is, and that is, of course, an Albanese Labor government. Why? Because the closest most of them have ever come to a small business is to proudly close it down. That is unacceptable behaviour, Mr. President. Unacceptable behaviour. And when it comes to Taxes. There's only one way that those on the other side go, Mr. President, and that is up. It is in their DNA. With us on this side, we know that for small businesses, the best thing you can do for them is to lower their taxes, Order and that is why, under right. the coalition government, Order. they are paying the lowest tax rate, the lowest Order. tax rate, Mr. President, in 50 years. And then you look at the alternative Order. prime minister. You on look at the right. alternative prime minister. minister. Sorry, before I come to you, Senator Patrick, I will ask those on my right. That was getting excessive in terms of the noise. Senator Patrick? I was just going to uh, raise a point of order. I couldn't hear any of the minister's answer. Uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was struggling myself, Senator Patrick, and that's something to say when it's Senator Cash on her feet. Senator Cash, you have 16 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, when it comes to lowering taxes, that is in the DNA of the coalition government. The DNA of the coalition government. We lower taxes, you raise taxes. We look at small business and we say you deserve more of what you earn, and we will give it back. You, on the other hand. Sorry, we did have a little error with the timing there. So, well, no. Sad, sadly, Minister Cash, your time had actually. Your, your time had actually expired. Senator Kennedy, were you on that issue? I was actually seeking the call for the next question. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs and Defence Personnel, Senator Payne. Yesterday, Minister G, Mr. Minister G excuse me, told the House that there was $96 million in the budget to clear up a backlog of veterans' compensation claims. Uh -oh. Can this minister tell the House in which budget paper and on what page that $96 million can be found? Oh, no. oh. Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I uh, thank Senator Keneally for her question. I don't have that budget paper with me. Senator Order. Senator Keneally, but I will note that this government has, and I will take that on notice, therefore, uh, but I will note that this government invests over $11.5 billion each year to support veterans and their families. 
336,000 oh, veterans and their family. Mr. President, I am seeking Order. to respond to what I regarded as, perhaps mistakenly, a serious question from those opposite. If it is not possible to respond to that question by Order. indicating that I will take it on notice and I will return to the chamber and to provide Senator Keneally with further information, then I will decline to answer the question any further. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. On the weekend, Minister G threatened to resign if he did not receive the $96 million in the budget. He labelled the 60,000 60, unprocessed claims within his department a national disgrace. Why does it take a minister speaking out publicly and threatening to quit for Minister, Mr Morrison to take responsibility? And where is this $96 million? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Order. President. And I absolutely reject the, uh, the propositions put Order. by Senator Keneally uh, in her question. As a government, we've invested over half a billion dollars to implement substantial changes to the Department of Veterans Affairs processes uh, and their technology, making it both easier and faster for veterans and their families to access both services and support. We've seen the number of claims received by DVA uh, double, in fact, more than double, over the last three financial year. Order. Uh, and that, of course, requires additional resourcing to manage, and that's exactly what the Australian government uh, is doing. This budget has provided an initial $22.8 million, which will fund 90 extra staff to address that backlog of unprocessed claims. And it will be followed by a further investment uh, to continue to improve the veteran claims processing system and to reduce waiting time. Mr President, as a nation, we have looked very closely at the support we provide to veterans and their families in this country. I want to acknowledge Order. each and every one of them for their service and their families Minister, for supporting them Minister, as well. Your time has expired. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary. Thank you. When asked why it took Minister G threatening to resign for his government to provide the necessary funding, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, I wouldn't agree with that assessment. Given the $96 million required to get through the 60,000 unprocessed claims appears nowhere in these budget papers, isn't it just the latest example of Mr Morrison not telling the truth right. to the Australian people and to his own colleagues? Right. Order, Minister. President, and unsurprisingly, Senator Keneally is absolutely fundamentally Order. wrong. But I'm from New South Wales, so I'm used to that. And the people of the electorate she's going to purport to represent at the next election are going to have to get used to that too, Mr Order. President. But to be absolutely Order. clear and in the absence of Order. any facts from the Order. other side, Mr President, Order. let me— Minister, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order. On a point of order, Mr President, there is no universe in which that contribution was directly relevant to the question. And I'd ask you— Order well, it's in a the chamber. <laughs> so I'd ask you to remind the minister of the question. S Senator Wong, minister, I will. On the point of order. I began by saying in my response to Senator Keneally's supplementary question that she was absolutely and fundamentally wrong. That is completely pertinent to the question. <laughs> so order, 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 Senator Wong. Senator Wong. I've allowed you to bring the minister back to the question. Minister, you have 45 seconds remaining if you wish to add anything further. Thank you very much, Mr. Qu Mr. President. And I do wish to indicate that in addition to the funding I've already discussed and the funding provided in the 21-22 budget of over $137 million, there is also a total increase of 447 APS positions across the DVA, taking the staff to over 2,000 uh, Australian public service staff. The additional funding and the average staffing level received through this budget will be used to recruit additional APS staff, both ongoing and non-ongoing, across DVA. In the claims processing area, this will take into account that absolute requirement to reduce the backlog about which Minister G has been so committed over two years and ensure appropriate staff are available to maintain claims processing at a normal rate into the future, yes, as sir. is required. Your time has expired. Minister Birmingham. Mr. President, Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, Mr. President, I also seek leave, as uh, foreshadowed at the commencement of question time, to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting and the routine of business for today. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted.
Uh, Mr. President, I move the motion as, uh, as circulated and as indicated in my earlier contributions uh, indicate that the motion does uh, contain provisions for the consideration of the disallowance motion at the request of the Australian Greens and I also understand also for the consideration of uh, an aged care bill um, at uh, the request of Senator Patrick. So the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. So, as a result of the passing of that motion, we will move uh, immediately to a condolence motion. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 26th of February 2022 of the Honourable Moses Henry Moss Cass, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Maribyrnong, Victoria, from 1969 to 1983. I call on the leader of the government in the uh, sorry, the Attorney General, uh, Senator Cash. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former minister and member of the House of Representatives, the Honourable Moss Cass. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Cash. Thank you. And I move that the Senate expresses its deep sadness at the death on the 26th of February 2022 of the Honourable Moses Henry Moss Cass, former Minister for the Environment and Conservation and Minister for Media and former member for Maribyrnong, places on record its admiration and appreciation for his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its deep sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Mr President, today we honour the Honourable Moses Henry Moss Cass, otherwise known to his loved ones and friends as Moss. He was the federal member for Maribyrnong from 1969 to 1983 and, of note, was Australia's first environment minister. Moss lived a long and dedicated life to improving the world around him and preserving and protecting its natural environment. As a minister in the Whitlam government, Moss is remembered for his immense contributions to Australian public life and the selfless approach he took towards public service. Moss Cass was born on the 18th of February 1927 in Narragin, in my home state of Western Australia. He was the eldest of three sons of Ben and Esther Cass. His father was a GP and Moss and his brothers all pursued careers in medicine. Moss studied medicine at the University of Sydney and in 1955 married Melbourne-born Shirley Shulman, who was instrumental in exposing him to a world of free thinkers and stirred his discussions on progressive causes. Through the 1950s and the 1960s, Moss worked as a registrar at hospitals in Sydney, in London and in Melbourne. It was in London that Moss undertook work at Guy's Hospital, developing open-heart surgery techniques. Importantly, we acknowledge his work as a research fellow at Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital, where he conducted research into the use of a heart-lung machine for open-heart surgery. Mr President, Moss actually built the first heart-lung machine in Australia. Moss brought his expertise in medicine to the Labor Party's state and federal health policy committees and, from 1964 to 1969, served as the director of the Trade Union Clinic and Research Centre. A man of profound intellect, Moss was deeply, thought deeply about the issues. He took to advancing a number of progressive causes traversing health, media and environmental policy. Upon his election to parliament as the member for Maribyrnong in 1969, Moss advocated for the decriminalisation of homosexuality and marijuana and the legalisation of abortion. Moss was, as you would expect, entwined with health policy during his tenure in the parliament. It was following the election of the Whitlam government in 1972 
that Moss was appointed as Australia's first Minister for the Environment and Conservation. He made this role his own and was instrumental in proposing and securing the Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act 1974, mandating the use of environmental impact statements for federal government decisions. He initiated the influential public inquiries that preceded the end of sand mining on Fraser's Island, curtailing the Ranger uranium mine in Kakadu and government protection of the Great Barrier Reef. Moss also enabled new grassroots environmental organisations through the doubling of federal government grants to these groups. He later became Minister for Media in the Whitlam government. His work in issuing experimental radio licences is widely regarded as leading to the thriving community radio sector we have today. During his time in this parliament, Moss was known as an effective politician with a reputation for listening and a desire to relentlessly pursue reform where he felt it was necessary. Following his departure from the parliament, Moss maintained a keen interest in the Labor Party and all those who were agents for change, from bra pra party branch members to environmentalists. Moss was a serious thought leader and a man who had vision of the type of Australia he sought to shape and he pursued that vision untiringly. Today, let us all be inspired by the contributions Dr Moss Cass made to public life and his reformist approach towards the significant challenges of his time. And on behalf of the Australian government and the Australian Senate, I extend our sincerest condolences to Moss's wife Shirley and the loved ones he leaves behind. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise on behalf of the opposition, on behalf of the Labor Party, to express our condolences following the passing of one of our own, the Honourable Dr. Moses Henry Cass, known as Moss Cass, former member of the House and minister in the Whitlam government at the age of 95. And I start by conveying the opposition and the Australian Labor Party's deepest condolences to his family and friends. Dr Moss Cass was the member for Maribyrnong in Melbourne from 1969 to 1983 and was a minister in the Whitlam government from 72 to 75, serving in the environment and media portfolios. Along with Doug McClelland, Bill Hayden and Paul Keating, he was the last of that group of Whitlam government ministers still with us. And he deserves to be remembered. Um, last survive, I should say he was the last surviving of the Whitlam government ministers. Dr Kaz deserves to be remembered as one of, the, one of the great figures of our movement, and his influence at a time of great change was profound. He not only led policy development as a minister, but he also advanced the case for the reform of significant issues of social concern, including multiculturalism, e education, uh, state aid, reform of social policy, including on drugs, abortion and homosexuality, media reform, health reform, asylum seekers and many more. Moss Cass's contribution wasn't only to the F Federal Parliamentary Labor Party, but to our broader cause, particularly through the, his work as a doctor and to the trade union movement. And his commitment to the cause of labor was, sta was absolute and stayed with him all of his life. Uh, as I begin this speech, I reflect on my own personal engagement with Dr Cass, and I was, because I was the beneficiary of some extensive correspondence from him. Uh, and he wrote to me uh, over the last couple of years principally to provide his thoughts on media policy. Uh, and uh, my office replied on my behalf uh, and engaged in a, quite a lot of email correspondence. He also referred me to the book Moss Cass and the Greening of the Australian Labor Party, which is available from the Parliamentary Library. This extensively covers Dr Cass's career from his role as Environment Minister and Media Minister to the many other causes he championed. Very clear from the book and from other uh, reporting, Moss Cass was well ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time on environmental protection. He was ahead of his time on medical and social reform. Uh, and many of the issues that Dr Cass grappled with remain significant matters of debate in Australian politics today. One of those is the media. Uh, and Dr Cass expressed to, to me his concerns regarding the health of the Australian democracy. 
uh, given what he regarded as biased media coverage, distortion of facts and the impact of free speech as a licence for hate speech. Uh, however, we didn't have many discu any discussions because he told me at the age of 94 he was too deaf to follow a telephone conversation, too unstable on his feet and nursing a couple of cancers so he couldn't travel far from home. Uh, but he was happy to correspond with writing, in writing and what was clear from the written exchange was just how active his mind remained and just how passionate he remained about political causes and the cause of the Australian Labor Party. Moss Cass was born in Western Australia, the son of Jewish Russian migrants, on the 18th of February 1927. His father was a doctor, and this was the career that he and his three brothers would pursue. He, pursued, he first pursued great innovation before turning his talents to delivering quality and holistic health care to working people and developing health policy. After marrying his wife Shirley, a Melbourneian, in 1955, they moved to London where his work developing open heart surgery techniques. Uh, equipped him with sufficient skills so that when he returned to Australia, as my colleague Senator Cash has said, he built Australia's first heart-lung machine. Quite an extraordinary person. Uh, he then was recruited to helm a new community health care centre in the western suburbs of Melbourne in Footscray. The Trade Union Clinic and Research Centre was established by the Meat Workers Union to deliver free treatment and promote preventative health care to workers. It was well ahead of its time. Uh, and his work there provides a window for Dr Cass's focus on broader issues of social inequality. So the meat workers obviously had a direct interest uh, in uh, uh, health, the delivery of health care. They were an occupation that came with a multitude of perils, sharp knives and blades, heavy lifting, variable extremes of temperatures, at risk of disease. And the clinic became an overwhelming success. Although it wasn't established and operated without resistance, particularly from insurers contesting workers' compensation claims. A key component of its work was also research to treat, investigate and eradicate. By undertaking proper investigation and diagnosis and deploying a range of treatments, uh, the clinic was able to see many more workers return to work and to health sooner. Involvement with the Health Policy Committee of the ALP went hand in glove with Dr Cass's expertise. And when it came to health policy, this was a formative time in Australian public policy. The Whitlam government took, first took Medibank, the forerunner of Medicare, to an election in 1969. And whilst Dr Cass had differing views about how these objectives might be achieved, he was a central voice in the debates that led to its development and implementation. He was part of a generation of, of parliamentarians who delivered one of the most substantial social policy reforms in Australian history. And when the Fraser government worked to dismantle Medibank after 1975, as opposition health spokesperson, he became a key defender. Involvement in the trade union clinic had another benefit. It connected Moscas with the left wing of the Victorian trade union movement and the ALP. In addition to the involvement already mentioned in its health policy forum, he held a seat on the Victorian State Executive at a turbulent time in the Victorian branch. There seemed to be quite a few of those, uh, which sought to recover from the split, which had probably its greatest impact there. He obtained support for pre-selection pre in the seat of Maribyrnong and won the election in 1969. If you look at his first speech, it's really quite unusual. Uh, both for the Times but also for a man, he devoted most of his first speech to the subject of abortion law reform. Uh, his experience as a doctor informed his position but also his sense of justice and he consistently sought reform including by moving legislation in, conjuncted, in conjunction with other like-minded members across the parliament. And before, his time, before uh, the Times suited it, he was also amongst those who advanced what was then described as homosexual law reform, working in conjunction with former Liberal Prime Minister John Gorton, Don Chip and Andrew Peacock. Of course, he was also a minister in the Whitlam government. He was Australia's first minister uh, for environment and conservation, and he was instrumental in proposing and securing the Environmental Protection Impact Proposals Act 1974. This laid the groundwork for the ending of sand mining on Fraser Island and, the, and for protection of the Great Barrier Reef. 
As Minister for Media, subsequently he engaged with causes that he would continue to advance in his post-parliamentary life, particularly the power, power of media proprietors, and he was instrumental in the establishment of community broadcasting. So my last correspondence with Moscas was in September last year. I wrote to thank him for his correspondence to me, for his continuing engagement in politics and public policy, for furnishing ideas as for how he saw our nation ad advancement, his ideas about how we could work towards a better future. I told him that whilst I knew of him by virtue of the correspondence uh, he uh, engaged in with me, that I'd learned a great deal more about his intellectual contribution to our party. And I noted then, as I do now, that the many of the causes that he had been championing more than half a century ago were still battles being fought and finally won by progressives at the current time, noting, for example, that my home state of South Australia only recently fully decriminalised abortion. And I expressed my hope that my card would find him in good health, but alas, we now know he would only be with us for a few more months. Uh, sadly, he and his wife both required an increased level of care and had to move out of their home in Carlton, and I regret that I wasn't able to take up his offer to visit him in Melbourne. But I am eternally grateful that I had the opportunity to personally express to him my gratitude. Moss Cass was a giant of the Labor movement, and he has done so much to benefit so many people, and more importantly, to benefit the nation. Moss Cass set a standard and leaves a legacy that few can profess to have emulated. So I close again by expressing the opposition's condolences following his passing and conveying our deepest sympathies to his family and his friends. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I express our deepest collective condolences to the family and friends of Moss Cass. I never had the pleasure of meeting Moss Cass, but a great number of my fellow Greens did, and they've relayed to me nothing but admiration for a remarkable man. Moss was a great many things—a doctor, a medical scientist, a parliamentarian, a photographer, a father and a pioneer. And he was also a voice for those who needed a voice and a voice for the things that didn't have a voice. And in each of his endeavours throughout his long life, he was always collaborating with others, looking to create a better humanity and a world where people are at peace with each other and in connection with nature. Before entering parliament, Moss was a medical scientist. He built Australia's first heart-lung machine. While working as a register in London, he helped develop, op helped develop open heart surgery. He used his experience as a doctor from the very start of his parliamentary career. His maiden speech is extraordinary. Instead of the usual story of self or grand pronouncements about the state of the world, he got straight to business. The entire speech was devoted to advocating for the legalisation of abortion. This included his own admission of criminality for having helped women terminate their pregnancies. If Moss is perhaps less well known than other parliamentarians who achieved lesser feats than him, then the telling is right there in his first speech, because it was not about him. It was about getting things done. And get things done, he did. While serving as Australia's first Minister for the Environment and Conservation, he established Kakadu National Park. He established the National Parks and Wildlife Service and established the process for environmental impact statements that saved Fraser Island from sand mining and restrained uranium mining in Kakadu. Later, as Minister for Media, Moss proposed the establishment of a National Press Council. In scenes that would not be unfamiliar today, Rupert Murdoch turned the full force of his media empire onto Moss and, in fact, onto the entire Whitlam government. But Moss 
stood his ground. And although the Whitlam government did not survive, Moss's cause did, and in 1976 the Australian Press Council was established. Moss continued to work on progressive causes after his time in parliament, particularly those which sought to build alliances. He did so in a way that always sought to foster the next generation. He, would, he didn't seek to big note himself or use his undoubted status to wield influence amongst fellow activists. He was humble and he was generous, and he was always about the collective and always about the many, many causes he was a champion of. Someone who did know Moss well was Dr Bob Brown, former senator and former leader of the Australian Greens. I spoke to Bob earlier today and he asked me to place this on the record from him in regards to Moss Cass. Moss, said Bob, along with Tommy Wren, worked hard to try and save Lake Pedder after the Whitlam government was elected in 1972. Later on, Moss was made Minister for the Environment and Prime Minister Gough Whitlam offered $8 million to Tasmanian Labor Premier Eric Rees for a moratorium on flooding Lake Pedder. But Rees, to the cheers of the Tasmanian House of Assembly, said he'd have none of it. Lake Pedder is still there, 50 metres underwater, awaiting restoration. Moss was a very intelligent gentleman who was to the left of the ALP in wanting social justice and environmental protection. He worked tirelessly to get the World Heritage Convention signed by Australia, which became crucial to saving the Franklin River. I remember Moss very fondly indeed. Those are the words of former Senator Bob Brown. Moss's son, Dan, who has been a Green staffer in the past, wrote of his dad recently that he made it into Cabinet because of his science of hope. That radical honesty wins votes and that power only matters if you do something bold. What great and principal legacies those are to leave the rest of humanity. To Dan and to Moss's wife Shirley and his daughter Naomi, I convey the deepest condolences of the Australian Greens. Vale Moss Cass. In adding my personal condolence to the family, I'll ask all senators to rise and join me in a moment's silence to signify their assent to the motion. I thank all senators. The motion is carried. Pursuant to order, I will now move uh, to uh, valedictory statements and uh, I will, uh, in calling Senator McMahon, I'll just send uh, the, the message out on the broadcast that uh, we are commencing valedictory statements now. Senator McMahon. Um, thank you, Mr President. Um, Mr President, I, I rise today to take this opportunity to thank the Senate and to express my gratitude in a number of areas over the last three years of my time in this place. Uh, now, as we all know, in June last year, the country Liberal Party exercised their democratic right and selected a new Senate candidate. There have been many hours and column centimetres to discuss the merits of this decision or otherwise but I would like to have a few other reflections. Um, on reflecting my time in this place, I want to start by acknowledging those around me who have offered me tremendous support over an extended period of time. I made some initial mistakes in who I chose to receive advice from, 
I have acknowledged those mistakes and they continue to follow me in this place. Personal staff, as we know, can make or break an elected member, and I've certainly experienced both. I've taken the opportunity to bring my current staff to Canberra to witness the budget and see firsthand the parliament in action, which unfortunately they have been unable to do over most of my term. Now let me start with, uh, with some of the staff that I brought with me. Helen Bateman, who has been with the office from the onset and who more than most experienced the highs and lows with me. Helen has seven decades of life experience, many of those in politics, and I am grateful for her tireless work in keeping me on schedule and in her genuine and sincere engagement with constituents. Kylie Banani joined my office last year. Kylie swept into the office and brought with her substantial organisation skills, with her ability to connect to people and create from scratch programs and events for ministers and even the Prime Minister at short notice. I'd like to acknowledge Lance Northey, who's not actually here today, um, but he has been my long-suffering media advisor. And given some of the media attention I have attracted, his has not been an easy task. He has filled the shoes with all of his many years of experience you would expect. And to you, Holly, um, I would thank you for bringing Lance to me. <clears throat> Mary Ann St Clair was a personal friend before I entered politics. She gives me endless joy and laughter, mainly at her own expense, but uh, she doesn't mind. She's a good sport. Um, Mary Ann, thank you for, for working tirelessly for our constituents and being a thorn in the side of Telstra and the NBN. Uh, Riley Ship is a young Territorian who's studying here at ANU. Throughout COVID, he has unfortunately been quite estranged from us, but he contributes to our WhatsApp conversations and is outstanding at making mango daiquiris. Very important skill in uh, a Territory office. Uh, Chris Sivertrees. Big Chris joined my office after helping me fire a pre previous office manager. It's been a gift that keeps on giving. So, um, so sorry, Chris, you're like a boomerang. You keep coming back to us. Uh, sometimes you don't know what you've been missing until you find it. Chris became a confidant of mine and he steadied the office through the use of his own measured temperament and people skills. I mentioned Ashley Manakaros, who took over from Chris when Chris thought that he wanted to return to his home and wife in Tennant Creek. Turns out he was wrong. Um, he came back to Darwin. But um, Ashley was familiar to many in this place through a long career in politics. It seems some of you never appear to leave. He left my office a few weeks ago to pursue other challenges, which I didn't understand because I thought I was a pretty good challenge. <laughs> but uh, perhaps he meant he wanted less, not more. <laughs> Um, to, to Wayne Nader, my husband, who has been the reason I have been able to come to this place over the past three years without a tribe of, as Michaelia said uh, this week, fur babies trailing behind me. Uh, it's often been expressed that uh, we may like a, a Senate cat or dog, and I can assure you that you would have had several um, if I had not been able to leave them at home. Uh, he has also been incredibly supportive of me and my job particularly over the last 12 months. To all of my colleagues, I have and will forever <clears throat> appreciate your candour, your counsel and friendship. And of course, particularly my Nats Senate family of Matt, who is unfortunately not here, um, Susie Perrin and our leader, Bridget. To all of you who have assisted my office by answering endless questions, taking time out of your busy days, <clears throat> and thank you very much to uh, Holly, Keith Pitt and Bridget for particularly for generously lending me your staff. Um, I really, really appreciate the loaners. <clears throat> um, I'll just mention um, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce and, and Vicky Campion, who've been absolute rocks to me during my time here. 
For those of you that know Barnaby well, he is a very, very, very kind and caring person. And as a result of that kindness and caring attitude, <clears throat> he often tends to pick up stray people. And um, I kind of feel like I'm one of his strays, uh, that he just never managed to rehome. On the opposition side, I wish to personally acknowledge Senator Don Farrell, <clears throat> who, despite his personal opposition to voluntary assisted dying, was prepared to offer his assistance in getting my Insuring Territory Rights Bill debated. His interactions with me were sincere and his word was his word. I also want to say thank you for the kind words and um, often random calls and text messages from Senator Malandiri McCarthy. Um, she is obviously a Territory colleague and she has been um, a great friend and support. People think that in the heat of political battle we never work together, but of course those of us in this place know that that is not true. And uh, one of our greatest abilities in this place is the ability to be able to work with each other. And of course, when we work together, uh, the biggest winners from our point of view are Territorians. Um, and I'd also like to mention, and, and I mentioned I mentioned her in the condolence motion on, on Monday, um, Senator Kimberly Kitchen. I spoke uh, of my work with her and the joy that I had in sharing the Joint Standing Committee with her. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge all of, all of my colleagues, and sorry if I've left some out, you are all special and important to me. Um, there has been much written about my resignation from my former party, the CLP, and speculation over why. My losing pre-selection was not connected to my resignation at all. A democratic decision was made. We can argue the merits of that another time, but it was a democratic decision um, and they exercised their right to do that. I have no problem with that decision at all. Uh, my reason to resign was driven entirely by my former staff member, Jason Riley, who did abuse and terrorise my office, including myself, <clears throat> and the party's decision to place him into a position on their central council. To have to sit in meetings with such a person was stressful, a very stressful experience, and one that has <clears throat> not been without me seeking out professional assistance to overcome the anxiety and PTSD it created. Uh, the reported treatment of my fellow Senator Kimberly Kitching, as I just touched on Kimberly, the reported treatment of her by her Labor colleagues greatly saddens me. Whether or not it contributed to her death is a matter of speculation and it will likely never be determined. But that's really irrelevant. If it happened, it should not have happened, <clears throat> and yet it seems it may have, and uh, so it does over and over again, unfortunately. We need to accept that poor behaviour can be part of our profession and that part needs to be eliminated from our game. A great friend of mine once said, politics is a nefarious business. And he is right. My only hope is that we are learning and evolving and it won't always have to be this way. <clears throat> this alleged behaviour towards Senator Kitching should not become a partisan football uh, for it is not constrained to any one particular side of politics. We on this side might lord ourselves over the recent response to claims of bullying and sexual harassment with the Jenkins report. And it was a very appropriate and good response. We will now find ourselves tempted <clears throat> to point to the other side with an attitude of, look over there, see what they did. We should refrain, <clears throat> for bullying, harassment and victim blaming can still be occurring on all sides of politics. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was a subject of a vicious display of victim blaming in the media 
by a former senior staffer. This was in response to my revelation that I had resigned from the CLP due to inaction on my concerns for my personal safety. This public attack was female on female, as is the alleged um, the allegation surrounding Cinder Kitching. It seems it's not a man thing, a faction thing, a party thing, but it certainly can be a political thing. I don't want this to become a finger pointing or point scoring exercise. I want it to be a learning one. I think of the premature death of my colleague Kimberly Kitching. And one thing that haunts me is that so easily could have been me. We can honour her memory by not making this a political issue, but by fixing it. So politics is a better place, particularly for women. I would now ask your indulgence um, to go over a few of the things that have been important to me uh, during my time here. <clears throat> When I entered this place, there was no COVID, uh, the world seemed normal, and then the world came crashing down for the rest of my term. Um, but I, um, I got stuck in and I wanted to achieve things. I didn't realise how short a time I would have in this place, so, so it is lucky that I, uh, I got stuck in and um, tried to make Australia and particularly the Territory a better place. This election, voters will get to elect two members for the House of Representatives in the Northern Territory. It is through the combined efforts of myself working with my colleagues and members opposite that we save these two seats. I want to acknowledge the role of then Deputy Prime Minister Michael McCormack. Barnaby Joyce, Lou O'Brien and Matthias Corman, Bridget McKenzie in this as well. Um, had we failed, then we would be electing one less person to argue our case in Canberra. In the agriculture space, we saw a modification and positive changes to ASIL 3.0 regulations. And for that, um, I thank my national colleagues and Minister Littleproud for his open-minded approach as to the consequences for producers after they were abandoned by even the, the live exporters themselves. I am grateful that I had the support of my colleagues in the Nationals Senate team to convince the government not to appeal the live export decision of the federal court. We could have ex easily extended the pain, but common sense prevailed. The introduction and development of an agriculture visa, which now has Vietnam signed up to the bilateral agreement. Uh, this will assist the industry address workforce shortages, as we did with the seasonal worker and other programs. Mangoes are the second largest value agricultural industry in the Northern Territory, and COVID nearly wiped this out with a lack of access to, um, to pickers. Um, I think um, Minister Littleproud thought that I was, I was haunting and stalking him um, because every time in the months leading up to mango picking season there would be many phone calls. In the end, we managed to save about 80 per cent, 80 per cent of the mango crop. And now with this ag visa, I am positive for the industry going forward. I was also um, able to argue for the removal of the working hours cap for international students, which has eased the pressure when it came to their ability to earn income on the back of COVID and provided the hospitality and tourism industries another source of valued workers. <clears throat> but there are still policy battles to be had starting with the NT's ability to make its own laws. The Andrews Bill is almost a quarter of a century old and it needs to be removed. <coughs> Every other state in Australia is allowed to at least debate voluntary assisted dying laws, and yet we in the NT and the ACT are not. 
We are not second-class citizens, so I ask that we not be treated this way. To quote a member opposite, we don't need voluntary assisted decision-making. The other, the other fight at the moment is in the Northern Territory. I know other states, uh, other jurisdictions, it happens as well, but <coughs> we, are being, um, we are being mandated to, with COVID vaccinations. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm a pro-vaxxer. I'm a scientist. I'm a vet. I'm fully vaccinated and I support vaccination. I support COVID vaccination, but that's my choice. I don't want to have to have this brought upon people that in order to work, you have to undergo a medical procedure. There is also the powers that have been given to our Chief Health Officer, specifically in the Northern Territory. We should never shirk our responsibilities in Parliament, but we are democracy and we have seen the removal of rights, which makes me personally uncomfortable. Moving forward, I also have concerns about the support for business and industry in the term ahead. Labor and their Green partners are anti-energy, anti-industry and anti-agriculture. A Labor Greens government is not what Australia needs right now. I also have grave concerns for the ability of the NT government to expend the Commonwealth funds that we've committed um, in areas, particularly roads and infrastructure. We've delivered a very generous budget. <coughs> the problem is the NT government's inability to actually roll that money out and spend it where it's needed. Um, many people have asked about the future for me what I'm passionate about, what I'm working on. I'll go to my maiden speech where I talked about nuclear energy and how we cannot continue to ignore it as part of our energy mix and our broader solution to reaching net zero emissions. My position is similar, if not stronger, than when I came to the pl this place. The UK, the US, Canada and France all have around a 20 per cent nuclear mix in their energy plants and in their plans to achieve net zero. We can't be blind to this. We must explore every means available to mankind to address climate change concerns. We will do Australia a great injustice if we do not develop gas reserves and if we bury our head in the sand when it comes to nuclear energy. Um, in closing, let me say, when, uh, on this, reflecting on um, what may lie ahead for me in the future, um, I, I have made no decisions at this stage about my immediate future, which may confuse some people. Um, but I am a qualified veterinary surgeon. I was accepted into university as a 16-year-old and completed my degree at the age of 20 and have worked in the industry ever since. Uh, I have that opportunity to return to a successful business or many other opportunities that my time in this place um, has taught me to take advantage of the, the skills and the things that I've learned. <coughs> Mr President, all of us grow into the roles of senators over time. None of us slip into the role and become the most effective politician from day one. I know I wasn't when I first was elected, but given more time in this place, my contributions would have been greater than the opportunity has afforded me. I am lucky my future is more secure than others who depart this place and uh, more se secure than most others facing the next election. <clears throat> I leave clear of mind knowing I did the best job possible and a list of achievements which will last well beyond my time here. 
I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senate, <clears throat> the people of the Northern Territory, and uh, those within the CLP who supported me on my endeavours and expressed sorrow at my departure. My road was bumpy, but then living in and coming from the Northern Territory, the roads are always bumpy. So, um, so thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to all um, members, senators and staff in this place. <clears throat> Thank you for your service, Senator McMahon. And Senator McKenzie, I will give you the call. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, I just briefly wanted to extend, uh, on behalf of coalition senators and uh, obviously the National Party more broadly, thanks to Senator McMahon for her service. Um, Nigel Scullion left very, very big shoes to fill, but you brought a very um, typical territory attitude. <coughs> guts and bravery to the role. Um, you called a spade a spade. You called things as you saw it. You were very, very brutally honest at times with um, your colleagues, in, whether it be in party room, in this place or in the committee work you undertook. Um, you, I think you've listed your list of achievements and uh, you know, they're significant. And it's because you used the processes available to you, the fact that you had a team and a a party that was going to back you in, um, and you're able to deliver real outcomes. I think one of the things you um, really focused on was your um, love of the defence force and your concern um, for defence industry um, and our sovereignty and security more broadly, and the conversations that you had within the committee, but also uh, with Minister Dutton to that effect, I think, um, have been taken very seriously by the government. So I want to thank you. I want to wish you all the best. Um, Look forward to going shooting in the territory uh, when I get up there, uh, and just yeah, thanks for your service. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. I, I would just like to uh, put on the parliamentary record uh, my thanks to you, Senator Sam McMahon, as your fellow senator in the Northern Territory. We sit on opposite sides, and I think that's a really good thing because there's probably not too much we, we agree on. But when we come together, we know that there are issues that are so critical uh, for the people of the Northern Territory. And you mentioned those in, in your speech. Uh, certainly the saving the seat of Lingiari and ensuring that the people of the Northern Territory had two reps in the House of Representatives and maintain that was absolutely critical, Sam. And it was... Uh, wonderful to be able to work with you on that. I certainly witnessed firsthand uh, the enormous pressures that you experienced on your side, and I commend you uh, for your ability to walk through that kind of fire, uh, knowing that you're doing so on behalf of the people that we both represented. I think uh, when I reflect on having first met you uh, in coming into uh, politics and out on the hustings across the Territory, it's funny, you know, you can live in the Territory and they say it's a small place, but uh, we never actually got to meet each other until we were actually on the campaign trail and uh, then started following each other to the different uh, polling booths around the communities. And I have to say that uh, people then were asking, who is this Dr Sam McMahon? And, you know, Sam, you can leave the Senate obviously way too soon, uh, in my view. You can leave the Senate knowing that in the three years that you've been here, with COVID for two of it, and how incredibly challenging that has been, but you can leave knowing that you have achieved enormously uh, on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory with the vote of keeping Lingiari, also supporting the voter ID uh, concerns that we obviously had uh, in the short time frame that uh, people across the Northern Territory would have had to actually understand that bill. And your private senator's bill uh, is a bill that must be debated here before the Senate. And I certainly hope that uh, those who are coming behind you will certainly support that 
and push that through, and I have no doubt that you will continue to support that from the outside. Um, but for me personally, uh, it's certainly been uh, incredibly important to have been able to work with you, agree on things, disagree on things. One of the things I've always found is that when you do come together in an environment of respect, even if you don't quite understand each other's values, uh, but you do respect the fact that we are there representing the people of the Northern Territory. Uh, that's been an important journey for me as well. So all the best, mate, and I'll uh, certainly see you, I'm sure, out and about across the Territory. But thank you for your work on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory. Um, I'll look for guidance from the Chamber. Senator Rustin. Look, um, thank you very much, Mr President. And I just wanted to say a few short words. Um, about somebody I've only known for three years, but what an impact um, you've made in those three years that you've been here, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> you came here, as Bridget said, or Senator Mackenzie said, sorry, using appropriate language, um, uh, came here uh, um, to fill big shoes. I mean, Nigel Scullion had been here for 17 years and he sort of established a tradition here um, that was the, the crazy territory tradition. Um, you know, it was. Uh, uh, and the mango daiquiris became famous and everyone thought, no way the next senator from the Northern Territory can ever possibly go anywhere near touching the sides of, uh, of what, uh, what Nigel did. And I've got to say, Sam, <laughs> you've, done, you've done the Territory proud. I think your reputation as you leave here will be uh, equally as colourful and interesting as that of Nigel. And uh, I think you've made a huge amount of friends since you've been here. Um, and uh, we're, I think we all count ourselves as, as your friends, and uh, we know that uh, when we get to the Territory we'll all be staying at your place. Um, but the other thing, too, um, Sam, I have to say is that you, know, you have always maintained an extraordinary sense of humour. And, um, you know, I, uh, I was actually sort of in considering your first speech. You, you said, uh, you know, in describing your, your beautiful home territories, you know, to many Australians, the Northern Territory is an enigma. They know it exists. It has a rock, a park, and a city named after some guy who discovered swimming iguanas. Um, now, I, I'm not sure that's the way I would necessarily describe Darwin, uh, but uh, I think that just epitomises the way that uh, you, uh, you take life. You, you, you don't take yourself seriously, uh, but you take what you do really seriously. And I, I think those sorts of comments show that. But um, you know, the rest of your maiden speech then went on to explain how you had this extraordinary knowledge about the history, the culture, um, you know, what your, your home territory meant to you, even though it, it wasn't where you were born. I, I believe now, from, you know, and listening to your contributions over the last three years, the territory is your heart, uh, and you came here to represent the territory, and that's exactly what you did. So, mate, um, can I just say um, it has been a, a huge privilege to have uh, spent three years in this place with you. Uh, we've had many colourful evenings, many colourful days. Uh, I'm going to miss you a lot, uh, miss your honesty, miss your directness, um, you know, miss your passion. Um, but uh, the one thing I am super looking forward to is what's the next chapter of, uh, of the life that is Sam McMahon, because I'm sure it will be equally as interesting uh, because that is the person that you are. So, Go with all of our love and uh, all the best for whatever comes next, Sam McMahon. Yeah. Senator Fawcett. Mr President, thank you. Uh, for Senator Sam McMahon, uh, I've had the privilege in the three years that uh, you've been here to chair both the Senate Environment and Communications Committee that you were a member on, as well as the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, where, as other people have said, you showed a great interest in defence. Uh, but also took on the responsibility of chairing the PFAS subcommittee and working with communities around Australia. And whilst I won't echo all the other comments about how you've approached the task uh, more broadly in the Senate in those two particular areas, can I just say thank you for bringing your scientific mind, your commitment to evidence-based policy to the various inquiries and reports that we did through the Environment Communications Committee, particularly in the environment area where there's a lot of passion and a lot of people feel strongly about things, but often the arguments aren't based on fact. And your ability to dig into the science and to bring forward fact was really prescient. And I really appreciate that contribution you've made, as well as the contribution you've made into the whole area of foreign affairs, defence, trade and the PFAS subcommittee. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Senator Wong. 
Thank you. I was just seeing if there were any more government members who wanted to make a contribution. Um, look, I rise on behalf of the Australian Labor Party in opposition to acknowledge and thank Senator McMahon for her service uh, to the people of the Northern Territory, to the Senate uh, and therefore to the nation. I'll just make some brief remarks about this. I want to recognise the approach that Senator McMahon has taken to representing the Northern Territory here in this chamber. I want to publicly thank her for the principled stand she took in relation to the voter ID laws that were proposed uh, and eventually abandoned by the government. Uh, in doing so, she did stand up for the interests of her community uh, at some personal costs. Uh, and I recall an interview with NITV outside Parliament House last Canberra where she said she'd raised some concerns about the bill with her colleagues and expressed concerns about how the, the laws would impact particularly on Indigenous Territorians. Uh, it was, we thought her stance was the right one, but I, we recognise it wasn't necessarily popular on her own side. Uh, and by making public those concerns, uh, she did influence the course of that legislation, which obviously did not proceed. Um, Senator McMahon has also been, uh, as Senator McCarthy said, very principled in her support for a minimum of two seats for the Northern Territory, and you know, that is a, an important achievement for her to have achieved. Um, and as she indicated, she's a strong advocate for territory rights, and we, I, I agree with her views about the Andrews Bill, so I um, wish her well for this next stage in her life. Uh, I understand we're also doing, if there's nothing further on Senator McMahon from the government, I was going to proceed to Senator Carr if that was the, yep, thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, Senator Carr is um, unable to be here today. Um, and I think if we are, depending on what happens in the election and what happens in terms of parliamentary sittings, obviously if we sit before the 30th of June, I would anticipate that Senator Carr would be will come uh, back to, to the Senate uh, and participate in, I'm sure, what will be a, a very um, memorable valedictory. Uh, but in the event, in the event uh, that, in the event that uh, the Senate does not sit again prior to the 30th of June, I didn't want this time to pass without the opportunity to make some remarks about Senator Carr. Uh, I want to, on behalf of uh, the Labor Party, the opposition, my Senate colleagues, I thank our Labor comrade, uh, the Senator, the Honourable Kim Carr, for his service and contribution over what is one of the most significant terms served by a Senator in this parliament. Uh, Senator Carr first entered the Senate in 1993, filling the casual vacancy caused by the resignation of John Button, um, a, re a Labor giant. And it was fitting that Senator Carr replaced Australia's preeminent industry minister. And in his time here, he has been a champion for Australian industry. Uh, most notably, he's Minister for Innovation, Industry, Science and Research in the Rudd and Gillard governments, where he and I were, uh, served as members of the cabinet together. He also held additional portfolios during this time, including in manufacturing, defence materiel and human services. Uh, the, the higher education, science, research and manufacturing communities could not, have had, could not have had a more passionate champion and advocate around the cabinet table. Uh, and in recent years, he has been an invaluable contributor to the Labor opposition <coughs> under both Bill Shorten and Anthony Albanese. In particular, his role on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee has guided scrutiny of an abundance of legislation, particularly in the area of migration, and previously his position on the, uh, the Senate Economics Committee, uh, he, he was the spearhead for the opposition's critique of failures in the government's management of East Australia's defence shipbuilding program. As Deputy Chair of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, he's worked diligently in combination with the Chair of the Committee, Senator Fear of anti Wells, to ensure the highest level of scrutiny is applied uh, to the making of government regulations. Together, these two senators, uh, Senator Carr and Senator Fear of anti Wells, have energised the work of this 90-year-old committee to ensure its continuing relevance and importance for many years to come. Uh, I want to acknowledge the role uh, and honour the role that Senator Carr has played as a contributor to Labor Senate team, and I want to acknowledge and honour his nearly three decades of service to the people of Victoria and the nation. 
and I want to honour and acknowledge uh, his passionate advocacy for the Labor cause uh, and, in particular, for those issues uh, in which, about which he cared so passionately. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. And I, I too rise to uh, share some reflections uh, on uh, Senator Comrade uh, Kim Carr in the event that election timing um, does prevent uh, more fulsome contributions later. Uh, and I note that Kim has been an absolute giant of the Victorian Labor Party. Uh, and I know that as Kim moves to a life beyond his parliamentary work, he will absolutely continue to be a Labor stalwart, a champion of the mighty Victorian Union movement uh, and a warrior for Australian manufacturing and the opportunities it can bring working people. Um, anyone in the Victorian Labor Party who has witnessed Kim Carr at a Labor Party conference has seen uh, a man and a machine uh, like no other in action. Um, always sporting his iconic three-piece suit, um, Kim Carr could always prosecute an argument on the conference floor uh, and in the Socialist Left Caucus. Uh, and I can tell you uh, he didn't lose too many. From the moment Senator Carr set foot in this place, he was driven by a commitment to standing up for working people. That was fundamentally why Kim was here. Uh, and over the decades, he has passionately defended the Australian Union movement uh, and maintained incredibly close and strong ties with Victorian unions. Um, as Senator Wong noticed, being the Minister for Innovation, Industry, Science and Research uh, in the Rudd-Gillard government has undoubtedly been the highlight of Kim's absolutely extraordinary career. Um, Kim championed the links between research, innovation uh, and advanced manufacturing um, really like no other. Uh, and as a minister, he was able to put that understanding into practice, um, defending jobs in the Australian car industry uh, and absolutely fighting tooth and nail to keep those jobs and those skills here in Australia. Um, this really is the portfolio that Kim was made for. Um, it was his vision that brought together the innovation and industry portfolios. Uh, as a minister, he read widely. He was voracious. Um, he consulted widely. Uh, and everywhere that I go uh, in Victoria today um, to meet with industry, to meet with higher education, to meet with unions, Kim is consistently recognised in those conversations as an absolute powerhouse of this portfolio. Um, on a personal note, I want to acknowledge Kim's wife, Carol, um, who has always been at Kim's side uh, and who is just as passionate about the Australian Labor Party and the union movement as Kim is. Um, I'm sure Carol, um, the kids and the grandchildren um, will like to have Kim at home a little bit more. Um, I know as a fellow avid gardener, uh, his, gardener will like, his garden will like to have Kim at home a little bit more too. Uh, but of course, uh, I think as all of the, the colleagues in this place know, um, if anyone knows Kim, uh, we all know that while he's retiring from the parliament, um, he will not be retiring from the mighty Australian labour movement. Uh, and I look forward to many, many more years of Kim's passion for our party, our unions and our people. Thank you, President. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator Scar is rising to pay tribute to uh, who I consider to be a good friend, Senator Carr. And can I just say how much uh, Senator Carr's contribution on the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation uh, Committee, the Scrutiny of Legislation Committee and the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee has had uh, an enduring positive impact on me. Uh, if, uh, if someone had said to me before I came to this place that uh, the senator or one of the senators I would speak the most fondly of and have a lot in common with in terms of respect for institutions and the importance of those institutions in this place was going to be Senator Kim Carr, I would have been surprised. But perhaps um, uh, I would have been naive. And I'd just like to pay tribute to Senator Carr's intellectual rigour his sense of humour, uh, his generosity of spirit in terms of uh, sharing lessons, 
uh, hard-learned lessons, uh, no doubt, over his years of uh, contributions in this place, uh, and pay my regards to Senator Carr. Uh, one of the best speeches I've heard in this place over the last three years was Senator Carr paying tribute to his father-in-law and the background of his, um, of his father-in-law, who was uh, a refugee from Europe. And, uh, I think that speech, uh, to me, uh, summed up Senator Carr. Uh, and, uh, he leaves this place with my enduring affection, having made a very deep impression upon me. Senator Ayres. I um, want to associate myself with all of the comments that have been made. Um, up to now in relation to Kim and thank um, Senator Scar for his generous, uh, generous remarks. I think for those of us in this place who've had a background in uh, manufacturing uh, and with the AMW, um, and there are a number of those uh, here, um, Kim, Kim Carr leaves a um, very important legacy um, uh, in this place and more broadly across the labour movement. He's, um, you know, notwithstanding the fact that you, you know, Kim was and will continue to be a formidable uh, operator in the labour movement, and not everybody always agreed with Kim. Sometimes famously, um, he is held in deep regard in the uh, manufacturing sector, in the scientific community, in the research community, uh, in higher education, as really understanding the connection between Australian research and development uh, and jobs for working class and regional Australians in manufacturing. He understood that connection, understood the role that good, smart, forward-looking industry policy uh, could play in building um, a better country. He had humble beginnings um, in Tumut, uh, and he loves the Snowy Mountains. Uh, for a Victorian, I expect that he's going to spend a significant part of his uh, retirement uh, in regional New South Wales. Uh, Kim, uh, Kim is, in fact, one of the most well-read members of this Senate, uh, 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 deeply engages uh, with uh, writing and research, um, much more in the UK Labor tradition, if I can put it that way, of understanding, you know, having a real connection um, with, uh, uh, with the intellectual work or in, in terms of philosophy right across to science, and that's something uh, that will be missed. He is, I have to say, um, as another member of the Labor's uh, national executive, Kim is the longest serving member of the national executive of the Labor Party in its history, um, which, which was a remarkable achievement. He only stepped down recently. Um, and when you think of some of the characters in the Labor movement's history who served on that body, to, to be in that position where you are the longest serving member ever, that is quite an achievement. Uh, and his contribution uh, to the movement uh, is immense. Uh, as somebody who didn't always agree with Kim on a range of issues, what I can say about it is you would always listen to Kim's view and you should always have respected uh, Kim's view about these things. Now, as I understand it, we may have another opportunity where where, the, where uh, Kim himself may be able to make some remarks, um, and I hope that that I hope that that is the case because he does deserve the opportunity uh, to make some valedictory remarks in this place. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Senator Smith. I'd like to add my uh, and associate myself with the remarks made by Senator Scar. Uh, the Scrutiny of Bills Committee had its last meeting, we suspect, of the 46th Parliament this morning, and uh, Senator Carr was present uh, with Senator Davey, Senator Scar, and myself, and we reflected on the important work that the scrutiny committees of the Senate do. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that this is an institution that evolves over time. Uh, some of us as Conservatives might be surprised to learn that. I've certainly learned that and come to understood that. But I think one of the evolutions of this place that is unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory is the loss of its scrutiny role, uh, the loss of interest that senators bring to their scrutiny functions, and uh, certainly Senator Carr uh, stands as a powerful testimony to the importance of the scrutiny function. And as Senator Ayres just said, Senator Carr is absolutely someone uh, who should be listened to, uh, and certainly on scrutiny matters uh, we paid very, very close attention to. So we are 
thank him very, very much for what is a very, very important legacy that he leaves to that function of the Senate. Senator Pratt. Comrade Carr, I hope that you will get to come back and make some valedictory uh, remarks and that we will be able to play, pay proper, proper tribute to your fantastic career uh, then. But right now, in case we don't get the opportunity to do that, I want to say his uh, absolutely enormous intelligence, his that kind of traditional senatorial, very masculine senator type that uh, he has displayed, his loud, booming voice in this chamber uh, that will certainly be missed. But from everything from higher education, local content, industry policy, the Australian Research Council, manufacturing, uh, the high, higher education, anti-dumping, uh, different uh, elements of human rights, the scrutiny uh, of Bill's committee. There is so much to have uh, learned from and admired in Comrade Carr. He, we, uh, he didn't always agree uh, with everyone uh, in, internally in the Labor Party, but actually that was a good thing because you would always learn from the robustness of that debate. He was never, ever a shrinking violet about stepping up and having the debate, and we are better off for that fact. So in that context, I feel like I've therefore been able to learn a great deal from Senator Carr because of the visibility of the way that he has uh, involved himself very publicly in those debates internally and indeed uh, here in the parliament. Uh, so I pay tribute to uh, my friend and comrade Kim, and I hope to see you back here after the election, should we have an opportunity to reconvene. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, look, I would like to just put my, um, add my remarks to uh, the comments that have been made by um, senators on this side and other side as well. Um, I have worked in this place with Kim for uh, 11 years, um, but for the 20 years before that, um, I worked with Kim as a, an AMW organiser and State Secretary, and I always remember the times when Kim was in the portfolio of industry and manufacturing and science. Um, he was a frequent visitor to Tasmania to come and visit the workplaces that I, was repre uh, that I represented members at, and particularly the couple of um, ones that I particularly remember were uh, a car component uh, facility in Launceston that was having a lot of difficulty with finance and getting orders. And Kim stepped up to the plate, got a delegation of Toyota, Ford um, and uh, executives together. He got uh, the union representatives together and he got the ministers in the Victorian State Parliament together. And we had a meeting and out of that meeting, uh, there was a number of things that were forged and that business continued to thrive for many years after. Unfortunately, with the demise of the car industry, that business is no longer operating, but it was thanks to Kim that it got a number of years after that. The other one was the Cadbury factory, which I had the ability to look after, which was probably one of my favourite places to uh, look after. And I remember um, many hours down there at that factory with Kim uh, talking about uh, manufacturing science and industry and innovation. And at that time, the food industry was going through a lot of innovation with uh, getting rid of a lot of man manual handling work and uh, a lot of machinery and robotics coming in. And uh, we always called on Kim as AMW to come and look at these places to work through processes with us. So, um, you know, he will be missed here. I think Louise said, or Senator Pratt said, you know, his booming voice was never, um, he was never shy in the chamber, um, nor in our meetings. Uh, obviously, in our caucuses, you always heard Kim when he wanted to speak. So, uh, I do hope he gets the opportunity to come back, but I know that he will look forward to being able to walk his two little grandsons to school almost every day now, which he's, I know that he missed during the long lockdowns when he stayed here in Canberra. So thank you, Kim, for your contribution to uh, the, the, um, public, in your public life, but also to the union movement. I believe there being no further contributions, I will just add my thanks on behalf of the Senate for the service of the departing senators. 
and we will move on. Pursuant to order, a ministerial statement uh, will be delivered relating to the Women's Budget Statement 2022-23. I call Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And, uh, I rise to provide a ministerial statement on the 2022-23 Women's Budget Statement, and I do so with great pride, Mr President. I acknowledge uh, my colleagues uh, in uh, the women's portfolio. Uh, the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin, the Minister for Women's Economic Security, <laughs> Senator Hume, uh, and uh, the Assistant Minister for Women, Senator Stoker, and acknowledge the Prime Minister as co-chair of the Cabinet Task Force for Women's Safety and Economic Security. Mr President, the Morrison government's commitment to improving the lives of Australian women and girls is founded on the right that each and every one girl and woman in Australia has to be safe and healthy and to be treated equally. Equality is the foundation of a cohesive community and a strong, productive, prosperous economy. The Women's Budget Statement, released uh, with the budget uh, overnight, builds on the strong foundations established by last year's record investment of $3.4 billion in women's safety, economic security and leadership, and health and wellbeing. Our further commitment of $2.1 billion includes both new initiatives and the extension and expansion of initiatives that are underway and delivering. Our 2022-23 commitment brings our total investment to more than $5.8 billion since 2018 to improve the lives of women and girls across Australia. Mr President, today women's workforce participation has reached the highest level recorded at 62.4 per cent, with 1.1 million more women in work today than in 2013. The gender pay gap has narrowed to now 13.8 per cent, which is significantly lower than the then 17.4 per cent gap that we inherited when we were elected in 2013. We know the rates of violence against women remain unacceptably high. But we can see that awareness of family, domestic and sexual violence is improving and attitudes towards women are changing. And this government is working continuously with states and territories, with stakeholders, with frontline organisations, with communities, with victim survivors and many others to reduce those rates. Currently about 250,000 families with more than one child under five are now benefiting, due to our changes in relation to the childcare subsidy, from reduced out-of-pocket costs on childcare, giving them greater flexibility and choice in the way they live and run their lives. The Australian government is committed to an Australia that is free from violence against women and children, and where women are safe at home, at work, at school, in the community and online. This budget includes a further $1.3 billion to improve outcomes for women's safety. And I particularly acknowledge the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Anne Rustin, for her leadership in bringing this package forward. This brings the Commonwealth's investment in women's safety to $2.5 billion to support the, implementation, the transition to and implementation of, of the next national plan to end violence against women and children 2022 to 2032. We know that ending violence requires the efforts of all levels of government, of business, of non-government organisations and of the community, and frankly, of individuals, of course, themselves. Our investment is targeted around prevention, early intervention, response and recovery. Minister Rustin and I have been clear and consistent to end gendered violence we must prevent it from happening in the first place. That's why the government is investing over $200 million in prevention initiatives. We're expanding the role of the national prevention organisation Our Watch and extending the strong, successful Stop It at the Start campaign. We're establishing a new national consent campaign and investing more strongly in community-led prevention programs. While we pursue that important goal of reducing and ultimately ending violence against women, 
It is critical that women have access to frontline services and that they get the support they need. The government is building on last year's commitment, providing a further $480 million to response services. That includes $240 million to extend the escaping violence payment, providing up to $5,000 for women escaping violence and beginning a new life. That funding has already supported around 37,500 Australian women. We are also committing new funding of over $290 million to enable victim survivors to rebuild their lives. In the New South Wales Illawarra region, we're investing $25 million to establish Australia's first women's trauma recovery centre. This will be a safe place for those women who have been in the most unsafe of situations. And we acknowledge uh, those leaders who have been part of uh, that uh, work in the Illawarra in particular uh, in bringing this forward in this budget. We're spending, also spending $100 million on a further phase for the Safe Places program for emergency and transitional accommodation, delivering about 720 new places. For women who find themselves in violent households, the Keeping Women Safe in Their Homes program provides support to safely remain at home. Around 30,000 women will be supported this way. We recognise too, importantly, that the digital world is increasingly unsafe for women, and that is why this budget provides over $31 million for online safety initiatives led by Julie Inman Grant, the eSafety Commissioner. We will begin phase two of the national online safety campaign to help keep women and children safe online and support the eSafety Commissioner to establish an online safety community grants program for education and support projects for community, sporting and faith groups. As a government, we also have a strong focus on improving women's economic security. And I have referred to uh, those uh, factors of women's workforce participation, the narrowing of the gender pay gap previously. And I would also remind the Senate of the nearly 50-year low we see in women's unemployment. These are important achievements, but we recognise that there is more to do. This year's investment of over $480 million in women's economic security will focus on improving flexibility and choice for women in Australia. It will also support their entry into more diverse industries, into jobs of the future and into leadership positions. We're investing over $346 million to establish enhanced paid parental leave for families. It will enable eligible working parents to share up to 20 weeks of fully flexible leave. We're encouraging fathers to take government paid leave in conjunction with employer-funded leave in the same way in which women are currently able to do. The government is also broadening the paid parental leave income test to include a household income threshold of $350,000 per year. Practically, this means eligible families will have full control over how they choose to use their paid leave, empowering them again to make decisions that work for them. Further measures in this budget are focused as well on helping women into higher paying and diversified sectors. Significant demand, for example, is forecast for the tech workforce. So we're providing almost uh, just over, sorry, Mr. Madam Acting Deputy President, we're providing $3.9 million over two years to support more women into digitally skilled roles. This demonstrates our government's active creation of pathways for women to pursue, for example, a mid-career transition into higher paid careers in the tech workforce. Achieving gender equality more broadly continues to be a priority for the Australian government. Earlier this month, our government fulfilled a commitment from last year's women's budget statement, releasing our review of the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012. We will implement all 10 recommendations of that review. The budget provides further resources for the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to implement those recommendations and to support the private sector, the largest employer of women in Australia, to close the gender pay gap and increase women's workforce participation. Madam Acting Deputy President, we know that having women in leadership positions ensures more balanced decision-making, provides role models and mentors for 
the next generation of young girls, and it works to reduce the gender pay gap. We're making a further investment of over $18 million for the Women's Leadership and Development Program because we know that great leaders also start young. We're expanding the successful Future Female Entrepreneurs Program to develop and grow women's core entrepreneurial skills. Australia has world-leading female entrepreneurs, for example, Melanie Perkins, the CEO and co-founder of the tech startup Canva, and Kayla Itzines, who's using the power of technology and apps to become one of the world's most successful online fitness entrepreneurs. Future female entrepreneurs is an opportunity to grow even more of them. To support women facing unique barriers to leadership and employment, we are also expanding the Future Women's Jobs Academy. I do believe that you can't be it if you can't see it. To aim high, it helps to see others who've had and taken the opportunity to lead and achieve. And I'm very proud of the role of the Women's Leadership and Development Program uh, in what it is doing across Australia, touching tens of thousands of Australian women uh, in, uh, in its work. And on International Women's Day, I launched a new Women's Leadership and Development Program Open Competitive Grants Round, inviting organisations to apply under the Lead and Succeed grant opportunity that will support projects that address the structural and systemic barriers that can impede women's employment and progression into leadership. The health of women and girls is critical to their overall well-being and their ability to fully participate in society and the workforce. And in this budget, we're investing over $330 million over four years to support the health and well-being of women and girls at every stage of their lives. We're investing in, in endometriosis support, in breast and cervical cancer screening, and support for families who've experienced stillbirth or miscarriage. I would venture to say, Madam Acting Deputy President, that there's not a senator in this place or a member in the House of Representatives who has not, through their personal life, their family life and their professional life, encountered a woman who is dealing with those challenges, particularly the ones that I've specifically mentioned here today. And as a government, I have seen, as a member of the government, I have seen the response to these announcements to be um, deeply moving and uh, profoundly important for the many women who deal with issues such as endometriosis and, of course, the many who deal with cancer diagnoses uh, of breast and cervical cancer. Addressing inequities in healthcare, not only between women and men, but between different groups of women and girls, is a key focus of our national women's health strategy. We're investing $4.2 million to fund community-led initiatives and organisations to support women and girls at higher risk of poorer health outcomes, with a focus on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women on migrant and refugee women, on older women and women with disabilities. Madam Acting Deputy, Deputy President, I bring the women's budget statement uh, here this afternoon uh, in this uh, ministerial statement, the second women's budget statement uh, delivered uh, by the Morrison government. Its focus is important. Its focus on women's safety, on women's economic security, on women's leadership and development uh, is important for Australian women and girls. But in doing so, I acknowledge, and I believe my colleagues acknowledge, that although we have made substantial progress uh, in uh, the development of, uh, of these women's budget statements and their predecessors, the women's economic security statements, that we know there is more to do. And that's why these plans are in this women's budget statement, and that is our commitment to the future for Australian women and girls. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the minister's statement. Well, observing the last nine years of the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments provokes an interesting question. What would it take? What would it take? to motivate this government to act on women's issues, to do something. Would the fact that women over the age of 60 are the fastest growing cohort of women, people facing homelessness be enough? Apparently not. Would it be an intractable gender pay gap or the lack of access to affordable childcare? Nope. Would it be that approximately one woman a week is murdered by her current or former partner, or that a domestic violence incident is recorded by police on average every two minutes. 
Not that either. It turns out that the only time that this government has been willing to act on women's interests is when there is a political problem to be solved. Last year, the government restored the women's budget statement, cobbled it together in haste after crowds of Australian women across the country came together and marched for justice. And their demands were clear. Australian women want safety and respect in their work and in their home. They want to be full and equal participants in all aspects of society. They want their voices heard when decisions are made. And this year's women's budget statement has been pulled together in the shadow of a looming federal election. This government has spent nine years, nine wasted years, demonstrating to Australian women that it has no interest in the issues and challenges that we face. All we have seen is neglect, political fixes and election patch jobs. And it is no surprise, no surprise at all, that after a decade of this Liberal government, things have gone backwards for Australian women. Women are facing skyrocketing costs of living, record high childcare fees, stagnant wages, an intractable gender pay gap, insecure work, skill shortages and rising rates of sexual assault. The Morrison government has failed once again to deliver the serious reforms necessary to pursue women's economic security. The budget does nothing on childcare costs, which are adding a bigger and bigger hole in household budgets. And tweaks to paid parental leave are welcome, but the government is just tinkering around the edges of a scheme that they have tried five times to slash. We have long memories. The women's budget statement still doesn't provide a firm commitment to making employers report their gender pay gaps to the public like the Prime Minister's own department recommended, and the government makes no commitment to improve pay or conditions for women working in undervalued care sectors like aged care. The Morrison government is still refusing to fully implement the recommendations of the Respect at Work report on sexual harassment in the workplace, and there is no ongoing funding to establish new working women's centres. Labor acknowledges the long overdue investment in women's safety through the next national plan to end violence against women and children. But of course we still don't have a final plan or the consultation that underpins it. And if you look at the details, the budget shows a short-term sugar hit in the next year, just in time for an election. But in each and every year after that, in real terms, the budget allocation to women's safety declines. And it means that in three years, the funding will be half of what it is next year. And it's reflective of the overall approach. Because as I said at the start of my remarks, this is exactly what it looks like when a Prime Minister sees women's safety as another political problem to fix rather than an opportunity to do real good. Nothing in this budget makes up for a decade of attacks on wages and job security. 77 per cent of Australian women say the cost of living pressures have gotten worse over the last year, and when you look at the details of this budget, prices are rising while real wages are going backwards. The average Australian will be $1,355 worth off. We know that Australian women deserve better than this, and it is why an Albanese Labor government will deliver budgets that, deliver, that work for all Australians. On this, I'd like to acknowledge the work of my colleague, Ms Plibersek, Labor's Shadow Minister for Women in the other place. As part of the Rudd-Gillard government, Ms Plibersek was integral to the first national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. Her energy and her advocacy has not diminished in any way in the intervening period. To stop the decline in women's economic security and get women back on track after COVID, Labor will set up an independent women's economic security task force to help government make smart, targeted investments through our first budget and beyond to advance economic equality. We'll make sure the decisions we make in government support equality through a national strategy to achieve gender equality. We will introduce such a strategy to guide whole of government actions on this key metric. Labor will strengthen the Office for Women so that it can oversee the implementation of gender impact assessment and provide advice on policies that impact on the social and economic wellbeing and participation of Australian women. 
We will introduce gender impact assessments on relative, re relevant cabinet submissions and new policy proposals. Labor will deliver an annual women's budget statement, something that should never have been abolished, to assess the impact new budget measures have on women and examine how the allocation of public resources affect gender equality. Labor is committed to half our parliamentarians being women. Because when more women are at the decision-making table, Australian women know their interests and values are being represented. And finally, Labor will provide the sustained commitment that is necessary to address men's violence. We know that Australian women want a government on their side, and that is what Labor, under Anthony Albanese and his team, will deliver. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Roberts. Madam Acting Dep Deputy President, am I able to make a statement? You are indeed, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a very brief statement uh, in regarding to the women's budget statement that, uh, that Senator Payne just uh, made. Very brief. I think whatever work we do in this space needs to start in this place. And I'm thinking of the lady we farewelled on Monday, and I'm thinking of the very strong lady who spoke very clearly very emphatically, and very confidently and very accurately last night in the German speech, Senator Fierre of Vandy Wells. So that's my only comment. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Cox. Thank you. I move to take note of the um, minister's uh, statement relating to the women's budget statement for 2022-2023. Uh, I want to start by saying that the Morrison government has seriously bungled their last chance to show what it takes to provide women's safety and economic security. And it's seriously um, underwhelming uh, in the half measures and the spin that's been put into this budget announcement yesterday. Uh, but it's no surprise because there's an election looming and it's a wonder that the Morrison government is desperately trying to approve their standing with Australian women, who they've abandoned in droves. But while well, some of these announcements are, are, right, are a step in the right direction, we particularly welcome the $25 million allocation to the Illawarra Trauma Recovery Centre that, the, in fact, the Greens have championed, uh, and I want to acknowledge the great work of our leader in the Senate, Senator um, Larissa Waters, who's not here with us today. Um, but this is, is really a large grab bag of minimum measures that fall sh well short of what we know that it takes to make women safe and ensure the economic security of women here in Australia. Now, I say this because this is my sector, the sector I came to before I joined the Senate, that funding to address gendered violence falls well short of women, what women's organisations say is needed, what they have told this government time and time again. And it is the Greens who have committed to calling for what the sector are asking, which is $1 billion per annum for frontline services to meet the existing demand, because it's actually unconscionable to underfund services which will stop women being killed in this country in this epidemic of domestic violence. And whilst awareness raising and, tra and training is absolutely crucial, it should be in addition to rather than instead of frontline and specialist services that the sector says it needs to meet the critical shortfall in supporting women and children who are fleeing family and domestic violence in this country. So the government's so-called enhanced paid parental leave plan also does not increase the PPL payments. It doesn't add superannuation contributions and does nothing to actually incentivise shared care. In fact, it may have the opposite or perverse effect, leading mothers to take all 20 weeks leave, their parental leave, with fathers taking none. But the Greens have an alternative—26 weeks PPL plan payments, which would match salaries, are up to $100,000. Superannuation would be added. And use it or lose it, incentives built in to encourage shared parenting. The $100 million promise for crisis, transition and affordable housing is pitiful, and it's small 
compared to the $7.6 billion investment the sector says it needs to provide emergency and permanent housing for women, particularly for older women at risk of homelessness. The much trumpeted expansion of the family home guarantee is no help because it simply will increase house prices and encourage people to get into debts they just cannot afford. So again, this government has also shown a lack of commitment to addressing family violence against First Nations women. Instead of a dedicated standalone national plan to end violence against First Nations women in this country, they say there will be a First Nations action plan sitting underneath the national plan. This is clearly not what we, myself and Senator Thorpe, sitting here, have been asking for. But they've also been they baked in real cuts into community controlled First Nations family violence services over the forward estimates and delivered no funding at all for the sector's peak body, which is a disgrace. This budget will not close the gender pay gap. Childcare is still not free, care work is still undervalued, and the minimum wage and income support payments which women and men receive are still too low. This budget will not deliver economic security for women in this country. I welcome the additional funds for the Human Rights Commission to monitor the Respect at Work recommendations, but this is still being undermined by the broader cuts to the Commission's budget. And the fact there is still no commitment to the key recommendation of a positive duty to all employers to make workplaces across this country safe for women. Australian women have spent a nearly a decade trying to convince this government that their safety and economic security are issues that must be taken seriously. We have marched last year, the March for Justice on the front parliament lawn. But in place of divisive and material action, they've been served up talk fests, cabinet reshuffles, flowery speeches, shiny baubles by a toxic, arrogant government that treats women as a PR problem to be managed. This was the PM's last opportunity to stand up for Australian women, and once again he has failed. And he's failed because, unfortunately, he's a sexist dinosaur, and it's long past time to give him up and his boys' club the boot, and the time is now. Hear, hear. Thank you, Senator Cox. There being no further contributions, now, is there a question to be put? The question is, the Senate take note? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Pursuant to order, we will now move to a motion concerning Ukraine. Minister Payne, the Minister thank, of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And I move that the Senate A. Uh, notes the Russian Federation's unprovoked, unjust and illegal invasion of Ukraine has left over 3,000 Ukrainian civilians dead or wounded, with numbers feared much higher. Forced over 10 million people, nearly a quarter of Ukraine's population, to flee their homes and brought countless cities across Ukraine to ruin, including by the unlawful targeting of civilian infrastructure. B notes that the targeting of civilians and strikes on protected objects such as hospitals violates international humanitarian law, the laws of war, and can constitute war crimes. C acknowledges that this parliament and the people of Australia condemn in the strongest possible terms Russia's invasion of Ukraine. D places on record admiration for the remarkable courage and resilience shown by Ukraine and its people. E reaffirms that Russia must withdraw its forces from Ukraine consistent with its obligations under international law, including the United Nations Charter and the legally binding decision of the International Court of Justice. F notes that Australia is standing with our international partners to impose severe costs on President Putin, 
his inner circle and those responsible, including through sanctions and by joining partners in asking the International Criminal Court and the United Nations Human Rights Council to investigate Russia's actions that include allegations of Russian crimes. Notes that, G notes that Australia continues to provide humanitarian assistance to help meet the urgent needs of Ukrainian people, along with military assistance to support Ukraine in defending itself against Russia's unjust actions. And H condemns actions by third countries that enable and facilitate Russia's invasion, including through economic and military support. Uh, Mr. President, the Australian government condemns in the strongest possible terms Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of its smaller democratic neighbour, yeah. Ukraine. This invasion is a gross violation of international law, including the Charter of the United Nations. We have called and continue to call on Russia to immediately withdraw its forces from Ukrainian territory, consistent with the legally binding decision of the International Court of Justice passed on 16 March. Australia has been proud to stand with over 140 countries in condemning this invasion in the UN General Assembly on two occasions in the last month. There is a strong sense of unity around the world about standing up to protect the rules-based global order built on the UN Charter, on international law and institutions, and on respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. Australia is part of this strong, unified coalition against Russia's illegal war. We are working with partners to impose a high cost on Russia and to provide support to Ukraine. Mr President, on Monday I spoke again with the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba. I strongly reiterated Australia's continuing support to his country and its people and our firm commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. I conveyed our outrage at Russia's escalation of indiscriminate attacks, which are exacting a catastrophic humanitarian toll and creating the fastest growing refugee crisis since the Second World War. The reports of atrocities are appalling. The bombing of a school in Mariupol, where a reported 400 civilians were sheltering. Reports of forced deportations of Mariupol residents to Russia. An airstrike on a theatre in Mariupol where civilians were again sheltering. The bombing of a maternity hospital in Mariupol. Over 10 million people forced to flee their, their homes, at least 3.9 million of those to neighbouring countries, more than half of whom are children. Civilian casualties continue to rise. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has confirmed 1,179 killed and 1,860 injured, though we fear these numbers are much higher. Humanitarian convoys have been unable to reach key cities to support those civilians so dreadfully impacted by Russia's illegal invasion. That is completely unacceptable. As I have said, both in this chamber and publicly elsewhere, the targeting of innocent civilians and civilian infrastructure are war crimes, and the President of Russia must be held to account. Let me be clear. There is one reason, and one reason alone, why there is a humanitarian disaster in Ukraine. It is the direct result of the unprovoked, unjustified and illegal invasion by Russia. Mm -hmm. Russia must uphold its obligations under international law, including the protection of civilians, and permit humanitarian access inside Ukraine and safe passage for civilians trying to flee the violence. To support the Ukrainian people, Australia is so far providing $65 million in humanitarian funding working with trusted humanitarian partners, including with a focus on the most vulnerable people—children, women, the elderly and people with disabilities. This week we also announced our cooperation with the United Kingdom to deliver humanitarian relief, including blankets, 
hygiene kits and kitchen sets, and lighting to displaced Ukrainians. We are also supporting Ukraine's energy security by donating at least 70,000 tonnes of thermal coal. To further assist Ukrainians who have been forced to flee, we have issued over 5,000 visas to Ukrainian citizens, with more underway. 1, 000, in excess of 1,100 Ukrainians have already arrived in Australia, and I know that they have arrived to the warmth and the support of the embrace of the Australian people, mm -hmm. who stand with them and with their country at this time. And I thank and acknowledge the Australian people for that. However, Mr President, a resolution to this humanitarian disaster can only come from the withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukrainian territory. It has been both profound and sobering to see the tremendous courage and determination with which the Ukrainians are fighting. Australia pays tribute to their strength and resilience, and in this motion so will the Senate. Mm -hmm. The capabilities of the armed forces of Ukraine the sheer will of the Ukrainian people, as well as the determination of the international community to uphold the rules-based order, were self-evidently not understood by President Putin. The world is working to supply and provide critical military assistance to Ukraine. Australia alone is providing $91 million in defensive military assistance. At the same time, Australia and our partners are imposing a high economic toll on Russia, with a focus on the elites and those who are responsible for this invasion or hold the levers of power in Russia and also in Belarus. Australia has listed more than 500 individuals and entities to date. They include President Putin and his circle of oligarchs and propagandists. This is the largest ever imposition of sanctions by Australia against a single country. Our listings include 80 per cent of Russia's banking sector and all government entities that handle Russia's sovereign debt. Our coordinated action with partners significantly undermines Russia's ability to continue financing President Putin's war. Also recognising the importance of the strategic contest over information, those sanctioned also include propagandists and purveyors of disinformation who have peddled such false narratives about this invasion. We have sanctioned military commanders and members of parliament, as well as those who facilitated the invasion from outside Russia, including, as I said, the leadership of neighbouring Belarus. We also condemn actions by third-party countries that would enable and facilitate Russia's invasion, including through economic, military and political support. We have prohibited exports of alumina, impacting a key Russian industry and, the, and, and also the import of Russian oil, refined petroleum products, gas and coal. A significant portion of Russia's foreign exchange reserves has been frozen, and the Russian economy is increasingly cut off from Western markets. Major international firms have suspended their operations in or with Russia. Many other businesses are reluctant to trade with Russia. While this invasion is an unparalleled breach of international law, and the UN Charter, it is also an escalation of the pattern of repressive and aggressive behaviour by Russia under this president. President Putin's Russia has for years silenced political opposition and critics. Sergei Magnitsky, the Ukrainian-born Russian lawyer who exposed massive fraud committed by Russian government officials, was one of those silenced. Mr Magnitsky was arrested, imprisoned, subjected to degrading treatment and tortured. He died in custody in 2009, having been denied medical treatment. Under laws this parliament passed in December, we will hold the perpetrators of serious human rights abuses and corruption to account. Yesterday, the government listed 14 Russian individuals responsible for the corruption that Sergei Banditsky uncovered and his subsequent imprisonment and a further 25 individuals complicit in his torture and death. Those individuals will be subject to targeted financial sanctions and travel bans. In doing so, we honour Mr Magnitsky and all who defend the rule of law. We also acknowledge former Senator Kimberley Kitching, such a strong supporter of these laws, 
who worked closely with the government to ensure their passage. This is the first of what will be ongoing sanctions using the Magnitsky-style thematic frameworks, which enable us to impose costs on and deter those responsible for the most egregious human rights violations and abuses and serious corruption. Russia must stop its invasion. Russia must get out of Ukraine. Until that happens, Australia and our partners will continue to impose costs on Russia and support Ukraine. We look forward to welcoming, by virtual means, President Zelensky when he addresses our parliament and does us the honour of speaking to our parliament tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Wong. Thank you, Thank you Mr. President, and I rise to speak in support of this motion. Well, it's been just over 34 days, I think, since President Putin invaded the country of Ukraine. Uh, and it was and remains an illegal and unprovoked invasion and a moral war against the in innocent men, women and children of Ukraine. Mr Putin, the Russian forces are laying waste to homes, to schools, to hospitals and towns. Mr Putin's war is inflicting immense loss of life and untold damage. Cities like Mariupol lie in ruin. Over 170,000 civilians remain under siege as we sit here. Nearly a, nearly a quarter of the people of Ukraine have been forced from their homes, including more than half of the country's children. Over three million refugees have fled to neighbouring countries. And Ukrainian community groups have spoken about Russia forcibly transferring thousands of Ukrainian citizens to Russian territory in clear violation of international humanitarian law. Innocent civilians have been targeted. The image of a pregnant woman being carried from a maternity hospital hit by a Russian airstrike will be seared into our memories, a defining moment in this horrific and unjust war. And we have read harrowing reports of rape and sexual violence. This clear targeting of innocent civilians is nothing short of a war crime. And Europe, once again in our lifetime, finds itself in a time of war, something all of us, the whole world, hope never to witness again after what was the tragedy of World War II. Amidst the tragedy, of course, we see such courage people of Ukraine and their government have withstood attacks on their homeland, and they continue to fight bravely, defending their country from this illegal invasion. Russian soldiers have been met with a determined Ukrainian resistance. And the facts on the ground show that Vladimir Putin is not winning this war. The people of Ukraine have been bolstered by a unified response from NATO. The United States, the European Union and the United Kingdom, who have stood united against this invasion. Comprehensive financial and economic sanctions continue to raise the costs of Mr Putin's aggression. And they've been backed by other nations, including Australia, New Zealand, Japan and Singapore, also implementing targeted sanctions against those responsible. And importantly, NATO has been revitalised. It has demonstrated its resolve as a defensive alliance and increased its deployments to Eastern Europe and Germany. Germany has overturned decades of strategic policy by allowing the provision of German-made weapons and material to third countries and by providing direct military support to Ukraine. Chancellor Schulz has rapidly expanded Germany's expenditure on defence and on energy diversification in response to Russia's action. 141 countries voted to condemn Russia's illegal invasion in the UN General Assembly last month. But Russia is not without friends, and one of which is China. Just weeks before the invasion of Ukraine, China signed a no-limits friendship with Moscow. And we've seen China declining to condemn the illegal invasion and in siding with Russia, it ha China has abandoned two foreign policy orthodoxies it has held for decades—sovereignty and non-interference. 
and China has failed in its special responsibility as a permanent member of the UN Security Council to uphold the UN Charter whilst offering Russia relief from sanctions. And there are many reasons to be concerned about these developments, particularly in light of China's growing assertiveness and at times aggression in our region. Mr President, we don't know how this conflict will end, but what we do know is there will be more suffering, there will be more displacement, and there will be more innocent lives lost. We know that more will be demanded of NATO members to help Ukraine defend itself. We also know Russia will increasingly be isolated from the world and Mr Putin's enablers will be held to account, and we commit ourselves to ensuring that occurs. We urge Mr Putin and his, his supporters to heed the calls of the international community to pull back and return to the negotiating table to realise, as Secretary <laughs> General Guterres has said, this is actually an unwinnable war. Our support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity will not waver. Labor has urged the government to impose the most comprehensive sanctions available, and we have welcomed each tranche of sanctions against Mr Putin and his backers, and we continue to stand ready to work with the government on any additional measures. And we will continue to support the provision of both lethal and non-lethal aid and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine at this time of urgent need. As Mr Albanese said some weeks ago now, we all stand, all Australians stand, with the people of Ukraine in the face of Mr Putin's unprovoked, illegal and immoral invasion of their homeland. Thank you. Senator Van. Um, thank you, Deputy Chair. And I'll be very brief, um, adding my remarks to those of the Foreign Minister. I could talk for, for hours on the geostrategic importance of what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, uh, and I've written on it extensively. But at this stage and at this time, um, and given the strength of the Foreign Minister's statement, I'd like to take a different tack, and I'd like to acknowledge the Ukrainian community here in Australia and around the world uh, for their bravery and support. And I uh, feel very blessed to have here at the moment uh, my very good friend Stefan Romanu, who is the chairman of the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations uh, and vice chairman of the global organisation. The Ukrainian community here in Australia are doing an amazing job at supporting the people in Ukraine, the people who are fleeing Ukraine and those who have arrived in Australia from Ukraine. There is so much more we can do. There's so much more the world needs to do. The more military aid that we can send to Ukraine, the better their heroes who are fighting so hard can fight back this Russian aggression. We all need to do more, and I ask the world to do more, and I'll leave my remarks there. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. Um, I rise to put on the record the Greens' support for this motion oh, for the people of Ukraine. And by heart, our heart goes out to the people of Ukraine who are suffering so much from this brutal war that is being waged upon them by Russia. And we condemn Russia's military aggression against Ukraine as we condemn all violent aggression of this type. Russia's war in Ukraine is absolutely catastrophic for global peace. And when talking about the war, you really and the, the, the images the stories that we have heard just reinforce how the cost of war is borne by ordinary people. The sheer figures that a quarter of the Ukrainian population, 10 million people, have had to flee their homes. We've got 3 million people who are either dead or wounded. And the whole country is being traumatised by this appalling war, this appalling invasion. We affirm our support for the right of the people of Ukraine to sovereignty and territorial, to territorial integrity and support the measures that are outlined in this Senate motion. And we call upon the global community to be working 
together even more than they have been to be supporting additional non-violent measures, to be at, um, applying extra pressure on, on Russia to get them to withdraw. There are two things in particular that we would like to see the Australian government be working multilaterally to be getting more global support for. One is debt forgiveness. The world could move to forgive Ukraine's debt, which is worth about $129 billion, which would free up their resources to be able to withstand the Russian um, invasion. The second is that we are calling on the world to be reducing its reliance on Russian fossil fuels absolutely as quickly and as urgently as possible. The sale of gas and oil from Russia is worth around about $120 billion a year to them. That $120 billion a year is what is funding and fueling the Russian war machine. And we know the issues of the energy needs in Europe, particularly in Germany and other European countries, and the fact that they feel at the moment that they have got no choice, that they have to keep on importing Russian gas and oil. But I say the world needs to be working with Europe, working with Germany, to work out how we can very quickly remove their reliance on Russian gas and oil and to be supporting them in shifting to other energy, particularly um, renewable energies, which we as in Australia are well placed to be helping to supply. We've got a situation where you know, potentially further military aggression against Russia, we know the risks of doing that. We know that it's, you know, at this stage, you, it's very easy to say, well, what else can we do? We've got this violence of Russia against Ukraine, but we know that further military aggression, and if, for example, a no-fly zone was instituted, the potential of it escalating into World War III. So to be safeguarding our future, we need to be working on what other measures can we be putting in place that haven't got that incredible high risk, and the incredible high risk of escalation into nuclear war as well. So although it seems really difficult to work out how Germany could wean itself quickly off Russian gas and oil, I say that Australia and the world need to be working with Europe, working with Germany, to work out just how we can make that happen so that we can be safeguarding our future. The world has to, at this moment, be uniting for peace. We've got to be working together. There are more mechanisms that we can be using through the United Nations to be responding collectively and decisively, to be de-escalating the situation and to be working for peace. And my colleague, Senator Steelejohn, is going to be talking more about these measures. Thank you. Senator, I will share the call. Uh, Senator Billick, I believe, was on her feet first, but we will continue around the chamber. Thank you, and I thank the government and um, the minister, Minister Payne in particular, for moving this motion. And I'm pleased to join with Senator Wong and the rest of my Labor Senate colleagues in supporting it. I also had two motions on today's notice paper: um, one in regard to the war in Ukraine, and the second regarding the downing of the MH17. And I have already spoken once today in regard to the issue in Ukraine. I'm spoke in senator statements and I was telling people that my father-in-law immigrated from Ukraine. So my husband Robert is of Ukrainian descent and still has relatives in Ukraine. So as you can imagine, this makes the situation in Ukraine very d deeply personal for both me and my family. As a Tasmanian of Ukrainian descent, Robert is an active member of the Tasmanian Ukrainian community. And the community has been holding regular rallies since the invasion, calling for peace. And I've had the privilege of being able to speak at some of these rallies, both in Hobart and Launceston. In speaking to the Ukrainians at these rallies, I understand that the only desire for their country and for their families and friends back home is for peace. Many of them hold grave concerns about loved ones in Ukraine. And we've heard there's over 10 million people forced to flee their homes. Many cities are in ruin. Even the safer areas like Lviv in Ukraine's west aren't immune to attack. Ukrainian people are deeply patriotic and they're courageous 
and they rightly want the future of their democratic country to be determined by Ukrainians. Mr. President, Ukraine has its own unique history, culture and identity, and the people there are a resilient people. This was the case when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, and it remains the case now that Ukraine has celebrated 30 years of independence. But it seems that the Russian government, particularly under the leadership of Mr Putin, has never truly accepted that. Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity has been under threat by Russia ever since they declared their independence. Russia's leadership was suspected of poisoning a pro-independent Ukrainian presidential candidate. Then they later installed a Russian puppet as president of Ukraine, who was then removed by the popular uprising known as the Revolution of Dignity. They illegally annexed Crimea, uh, Crimea and gave support to Donbass separatist rebels. The invasion of Ukraine is a further illegal act by the Russian Federation. It's an international crime. It's unjustified and it's unprovoked. But in addition to this crime, Russia has committed further crimes through their actions during the invasion. The motion currently before the Senate mentions 3,000 dead or wounded civilians in accordance with the United Nations official figures. But Ukrainian authorities estimate around 6,000 civilians may have been killed. Part of the reason for the high civilian death toll, as we've heard, is the deliberate targeting of civilians by Russian forces. Now, I mentioned in, Senator statements, uh, in my Senator's statement speech earlier the stories of family and friends of Ukrainians in Tasmania. I was saying how there was a group of friends from Irpin who were tortured after being captured by Russian soldiers, and one of the friends was executed. Then there's the woman who fled with a seven-year-old son after their apartment building came under a rocket attack, only to suffer a further attack on the bus, of, a bus full of civilians they were escaping on. And the residents of Russian-occupied Kurzon who have been fired on after, after protest, protesting the invasion. These are just a few of the tragic stories I've heard, in addition to those that we've all heard on the news. And these include a Russian airstrike on a maternity hospital, an attack which injured 17 people, including pregnant women and children. And I think, for me, the most shocking attack was the airstrike on the Donetsk Regional Theatre in Mariupol, where thousands of Ukrainian civilians were sheltering. Large signs clearly indicated that there were children sheltering there, yet the Russians still bombed it. The death toll from the theatre attack could be as high as 300. Mr President, there have also been reports of Russian soldiers firing on civilians who were trying to escape Kiev. These attacks achieved no military objective. The deliberate targeting of civilians is a war crime for which Russia must be held to account. And Labor stands shoulder to shoulder, as Senator Wong said, with the government in, in condemning Russia's illegal actions and making them accountable. This includes support for economic sanctions against Russia, including targeted sanctions against Mr Putin and those officials responsible for the invasion. It includes the provision of humanitarian aid to the suffering citizens of Ukraine and assistance in the form of military weaponry and equipment to help Ukraine defend itself. It also includes support for actions in the International Criminal Court and United Nations Human Rights Council to investigate allegations of humanitarian crimes committed by Russia. Furthermore, Labor continues to offer our support for all efforts by the Australian government to bring to justice the perpetrators of the illegal attack on the Malaysian Airlines MH17 by Russian-backed rebels, which led to the murder of 298 passengers and crew, including 38 Australians. There are at least three good reasons, as I've said before, why Australia should be part of the global effort to pressure Russia to stop the invasion and withdraw its troops. Firstly, it is our responsibility to Australian citizens who are members of the Ukrainian diaspora who are scared for the safety of their family members and close friends back in their home country. The second is because it's Australia's responsibility as a good global citizen to join its, ally its allies in upholding the rules-based order that keeps the world relatively peaceful and stable. 
And the third reason this invasion concerns Australia is because if it can happen to Ukraine, it can happen to any of us or any other sovereign nation. Russia's attacks must have real consequences. They must, we must send a signal to the world that an unprovoked attack on a sovereign nation will not be tolerated and that the world will respond accordingly. The global community knows that this attack is unjustified and so does Mr Putin, despite his ridiculous claims. We know that through internet and broadcast media censorship, as well as a steady stream of Russian government propaganda, Russian citizens have been kept in the dark as to their government's actions or agenda. Many Russians, sadly, honestly believe that there is a need to denazify Ukraine or that civilians have been spared and their military greeted as liberators, because that is what the Russian state propaganda machine is telling them. Whatever excuse Mr Putin has given the invasion, it is an act of megalomania by an autocratic despot. And it is Mr Putin and his regime, as we've heard, that will bear the responsibility for the bloodshed and suffering that has followed and will continue to follow. I also want to condemn, uh, sorry, commend, I also want to commend the bravery and the resilience of the Ukrainian people. Despite the material advantages of Russia's, Russia's forces, Ukraine's military has not only been able to hold them back from capturing a major Ukrainian city, but they have even been reported to have regained some ground in recent days. And we also hear stories like that of the 13 Ukrainian soldiers defending an island in the Black Sea who responded with a defiant profanity, which I won't repeat here because it's unparliamentary, to the Russian Navy demanding that they surrender. Ukrainian civilians have also demonstrated their courage and solidarity in the face of Russia's aggression. Who could not be inspired by the images of Ukrainian civilians standing in the path of, of advancing Russian troops um, and tanks? I mentioned earlier the citizens protesting in Russia-occupied towns. The president of Ukraine has dem demonstrated solidarity with his citizens by remaining in the capital. What a great leader. The patriotic refrain of heroium slava, or glory to the heroes that I've heard uttered at the rallies in Tasmania, has a particular resonance during these awful times. I and the whole world were moved to tears when we saw the viral video of seven-year-old Amelia singing Let It Go in a Kiev bomb shelter and then singing the Ukrainian national anthem in front of a crowd of thousands at a stadium in Poland. In fact, I've got goosebumps just remembering that now. As I've said, Mr President, Ukrainians are a truly remarkable people and they are resilient and they will rebuild. Let's continue to stand together as Australians with the global community in solidarity with Ukraine to end this atrocious war. Slava Ukraini. Glory to Ukraine. Oh, sorry. And sorry, Mr. President, I seek leave to have Senator Farrell's speech on Ukraine incorporated into hand so it has been agreed with the government whip. There's no objection. Leave is granted. Sorry, uh, my microphone wasn't on. Senator Patrick did get to his feet first. Thank you very uh, much. Se se sen oh. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> sorry, Senator Steele, John. Before you raised your hand. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Um, I stand in full support of uh, this motion, and uh, I uh, am encouraged by the words and su fully support all of the actions taken by. Uh, the, the government, uh, as articulated by Senator Payne, and, and I share uh, Senator Wong's uh, concerns as well. Um, however, uh, I wish to add uh, some words, and that is that uh, I have called for the Australian government uh, to expel the Russian ambassador from uh, Australia. News of uh, uh, Russian war crimes in the Ukraine, including indiscriminate attacks on civilians, leave no doubt that Russia's, the Russian regime has chosen to place their country outside the company of civilised nations. The Russian bombing of a children's hospital in Maripol and, indeed, the theatre 
as Senator Billick was alluding to, uh, is just the latest set of atrocities, and there will be more. The Russian military have also confirmed the use of thermobaric weapons. The use of these devastating fuel air explosives in urban areas will unquestionably be, uh, violate the United Nations Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which outlaws a wide range of barbaric weaponry. Barbarism is what President Putin's regime is engaged in across the Ukraine. Across Ukraine sorry. Aggressive war is a war crime. So too are the terrorist tactics employed by the Russian forces engaged in this war of aggression. In these circumstances, Foreign Minister Senator Payne's arguments that it is necessary to keep the Russian ambassador in Canberra to main maintain a direct line of commu communication with the Russian government sends precisely the wrong signals to Moscow. It suggests that no matter what President Putin does, Australia still wants to talk to his henchmen. Yet there is no evidence whatsoever that the Australian government's direct line of communication has any influence or value whatsoever. Australia should immediate, immediately expel the Russian ambassador in Canberra and their consul general in Sydney. Thank you. Senator Steele John. Thank you, Mr. President. Tonight the Senate debates a motion of solidarity and support uh, for the people of Ukraine. Uh, in this most terrible moment, this time of war, it is altogether fit and proper that we are here tonight engaging in this debate. Over the last four weeks, we have seen a full-scale humanitarian disaster unfold across Ukraine. As people have had their lives destroyed and have fled in the face of tanks and guns at the hands of a Russian oligarch and the media and the military that he commands. Australians have seen uh, this unfold in devastating real time. We have followed the people of Kherson in their heroic resistance against occupation. We have shed a tear as images of Kharkiv have been streamed to our phones and across our television screens. We have watched the people of Odessa fill sandbags and look out to a freezing iron grey sea, wondering when the ships will come. And we have heard the cries of the fearful children of Lviv, who wait every night in the knowledge that the destruction that they have witnessed in Kyiv, the rockets, the bombs, the planes from which they have fled, are following them there and continuing their destruction. Never before in real time have the results of war been so readily available to be seen, so accessible, so immediate to be seen by all those who may wonder what the result of war is, what the reality of war is. Already we have seen all across the Ukrainian nation generational scars lashed into the community of the type that only war can cause. Thousands have died, tens of thousands have had their homes destroyed, have been wounded. Millions, millions have fled for their lives into Western Ukraine, into Poland, into Romania. They have left with the clothes on their backs with whatever they could cram into a suitcase. And they have often done so knowing that their mothers and fathers have stayed behind to fight, have stayed behind to build Molotov cocktails or place their bodies between their grandparents and oncoming armour. 
At home in Perth, I have seen people come together, members of the Ukrainian community, people of Ukrainian heritage. A few weeks ago, I attended a vigil in St Mary's Cathedral. I was struck by the amount of young people that showed and came out to show solidarity with the Ukrainian people, to come together in one voice and utter the words into the darkness and the fear that it contained, the uncertainty, which was very, the very essence of the gloom, Slava Ukraini. Now, the solidarity that we demonstrate tonight in the passage of this moment must go beyond the words of the motion itself. We must put into action serious steps designed to bring peaceful resolution to this war that has already inflicted so much damage and pain on so many. We must go beyond these words of solidarity and, as we work to put them into action, work not as individual nations but as a global community in unison to ensure that Vladimir Putin and his dictatorial regime is held to account and that the people of Ukraine are provided uh, with the supports that they need. Now, the existence of the United Nations as an institution was created in the aftermath of the Second World War as a global human attempt to prevent ever again any generation from experiencing the horrors of global war. The mechanisms set up within that international institution were designed to mitigate the dangers of conflict to enable the world to come together and prevent such violent and atrocious acts as we are seeing take place in Ukraine today. The mechanism which is most relevant, I believe, to this particular uh, crisis uh, is the Uniting for Peace Resolution, Resolution number 377-A. Now, this resolution exists uh, for the purposes, that is to say, to be used when the Security Council is unable to come uh, to a unanimous position. The resolution enables for all actions to be considered, which may be considered by the Security Council, instead to be considered by the entirety of the General Assembly. Such a session under that resolution has been called and has resulted in an international statement of condemnation of Russia's unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine, its violation of that nation's sovereignty. We here in the Australian Greens are calling on the Australian Government to work with our international partners, with our friends in the region and across the globe, to ensure that that session is reconvened with two primary purposes, in addition to those of an immediate halt to the violence and a full withdrawal of Russian forces, an end to this carnage, we are also calling for an international effort to provide Ukraine with debt relief. The nation of Ukraine with which we are expressing our solidarity tonight is some $129 billion indebted to the International Monetary Fund and the European Commission. In the last few months alone, they have been forced to attempt to make millions of dollars in payments on, uh, uh, millions of dollars and euros in payments on those debts, something no nation should have to do in the middle of such a war. No global benefit can be gained by attempting to pursue debts that Ukraine does not have the ability to repay in its current situation. And so Australia should use its position in the United Nations to champion global debt relief as part of our solidarity with Ukraine. 
Additionally, we would see this resolution mechanism used to support Germany and other nations of the world uh, currently highly reliant on Russian oil and gas to transition urgently away from the purchasing of that gas and oil uh, to other forms of power, particularly uh, renewable energy. We must be clear, Russia is a petro-state and the invasion of Ukraine, this war, is a petro-war. It is financed by fossil fuels. In fact, in 2021 alone, Russia made some 119 billion US dollars from the sale of oil and gas. This is what is keeping the war machine going. Now, additionally, here at home, Australia must do its part. We are happy to see that our calls uh, for the end of Australian import of Russian oil uh, have been taken up. However, we must go further. There must be a special humanitarian intake uh, of no less than 20,000 refugees in relation to Ukraine. The suspension and cancellation of any, uh, ter the uh, pausing of any temporary protection visas uh, and the cancellation of any deportation orders of Ukrainian nationals until the crisis has abated. All of these actions are perfectly uh, possible and are additional tangible ways that we can show our solidarity uh, with the people of Ukraine, that we can turn our actions, our words and our actions to this point into concrete support for the Ukrainian people. And we can do all of these things while pursuing peace and supporting peace and non-violence globally. We can do all of these things while centering peace as the goal, as a global community, and seizing on the opportunity that this moment presents to turn away from solutions to violent conflict that only forge further conflict, only destroy more lives. We can learn from history in this moment, provide aid to Ukraine and to its people in its recovery of this horrific uh, invasion and ensure that more tangibly is done in this place and at this time than simply line the pockets of weapon manufacturers and global energy companies. Finally tonight, I note that this motion calls upon uh, the Chamber and the Government uh, to come together in the condemnation uh, of Russia's a violation of international law. It asked the Russian Federation uh, to uh, cease its invasion uh, and uphold its obligations under the Human Rights Charter and the International Criminal Court. It is right and proper that we do this. It is also right and proper that we reflect as the 10th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq comes into view upon what role we may have played as a nation in supporting that particular illegal, unjustified invasion of Iraqi sovereignty led by the United States government, what role that participation may have played in the creation of an international community where Putin believes that he can get away with such a crime. This is an urgent reflection each legislator must consider. Thank the Chamber for its time. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to note that peace and security are my goals. Yet often these conflict, part of the ironies of the human condition at a personal level, a global level. We do know some things for sure. War is ugly. There are many inhuman actions in even the smallest war. We also know that truth is always war's first casualty. 
Now, we're told there are two sides in this issue in Ukraine. I want to discuss a third view. So far, we've only heard one view. I'll leave the, the other side to that to the, to the Russians. They can talk for themselves. I'm not going to speak for the Russians. I want to discuss a third view. Having read widely in the last 14 years, I no longer swallow the crap we were fed at school and we continue to be fed in the media. Sen former Senator Ron Paul in the United States is acknowledged for starting, trying to start a peace department, a department of peace in America instead of a, war a defense department. He has said with some, and he has the respect, of, he had the respect when he's in, in Congress, of both sides of politics, Democrats and Republicans. Very well known for his honesty, his competence, his sincerity. Ron Paul said, every major war since 1913 can be directly attributable to the United States Federal Reserve Bank, which is controlled by globalists. I take your mind back, Senator Steelejohn just talked about Iraq. I take your mind back to Iraq and I remind people of what Mr. Alexander Downer said when he retired on his last night and he retired and he said, when John Howard came back in 2001 from the 9-11 trade towers collapse, he walked into, into cabinet and said, we're off to Iraq. We're off to Iraq. And the cabinet followed, and Australia followed, and we killed, in that conflict, Australian men and women, young men and women. We also killed a lot of Iraqis and other nationalities. We're off to Iraq. And I can recall another incident too where Prime Minister Howard, Prime Minister Tony Blair from the, United, from the United Kingdom and George W. Bush from the United States, the President, said they're all going to, we're all going to go there because of weapons of mass destruction. And then quietly the world was told they never had any evidence of weapons of mass destruction. But not one parliament, not one congress held anyone accountable. Similarly, after the Vietnam War and so many other wars around the world. And as Senator Steele John just said, led in many occasions by the United States. And I have huge admiration for the United States, having lived there for five years been through all 50 states, worked in eight states, lived in eight states. I admire what the United States has done. I admire, I'm married to an American, a dual citizen, Australian American. But I recognize now that I swallowed a lot of rubbish from the Americans, propaganda from the Americans, because the Americans, the government of America led many war efforts. And the American people are fine, peace-loving people but we have been taken into conflicts. So I'm open to alternative views on this Ukrainian issue, but we have no dog in this fight and we should stay out of it. We repeatedly see decisions in this place, as people know, I can see that quite often there is contra data contradicting the reality and yet without any data, we blunder into things. We sometimes ignore the facts and the data and always, as one of the Labor, mem Labor senators pointed out, the people pay. So I raise questions. I question the narrative. I question the political, the media narrative. It's one way. I question the political narrative. It's one way. I question the propaganda and the demonising. But I don't make statements without facts, and I don't know sufficient facts to take a view other than a third view here. I question the cost of fuel. The biggest impact on our fuel prices is not Ukraine, it's, or the Ukraine conflict, it's government taxes. Senator Hansen has flagged a reduction in excise duty. 
I question the way our capacity to defend ourselves, because we need manufacturing to, to produce weapons, to produce armaments, um, tanks. We don't have that capacity anymore. We've been gutted by adherence to UN agreements, Lima Declaration, Kyoto Protocol. We see today the government setting aside money for injecting babies with an untested vaccine. Babies. We talk, we hear the defence minister, sorry, the foreign minister, Senator Payne, talk about the Russians being, the Russians now having to fight German weapons that are being given to the Ukraine. But the Germans are giving them billions of dollars for, for gas because the United, the, Rush, the United Nations has destroyed the, the German capacity to look after its own energy needs. We have been disarmed. Germany is being disarmed. The only thing I will say of concrete in this statement is that we need to get the hell out of the United Nations, not follow it, because the United Nations is pushing a war on humanity. I'm not sufficiently informed to take a stance either way on this issue. I am, though, sufficiently informed to invite all senators to question what we're being told. So I implore senators, first of all, to understand basic needs of humans and the needs that are driving these conflicts, whether they're domestic, national or international, and to understand that the meeting of universal human needs for security the needs for basic interactions, connections. This is the key when we understand those universal human needs, the key to connection, the key to relationships. So I just ask people to question. And I question how the, Uni how the Ukraine is $129 billion in debt to the IMF, I'm told from Senator Steele John, when it's one of the richest countries in the world. How is that possible? So I ask questions and I take a third view. There being no further contributions, I will put the motion. Those in support of the motion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. A message has been received from the House of Representatives inviting senators to attend a meeting of the House at 5.30 p.m. tomorrow for an address by His Excellency Mr Vladimir Zelensky, President of Ukraine. We will now move, pursuant of order, to the tabling only of committee reports and government responses. I'll start with the government whip. Uh, thank you. I present reports from committees as shown at item 17 of today's order of business and a report of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee on the Health Legislation Amendment, Medicare Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021, together with accompanying documents. I seek leave to incorporate tabling statements relating to the various reports into Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. Opposition whip. Uh, are you Okay. So we'll go to Senator Firavanti Wells. Thank you, President. Uh, pursuant to notice. Sorry, sorry. We've just got something to do apparently before this. Minister. Yeah, I present the government's response to the report of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Reference Committee on its inquiry into the road transport industry and seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. Apologies, Senator Firavanti. -Wells. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate notices of motions number one and five for 12 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Australian Citizenship Special Residence Requirement Instrument uh, 2021 and therapeutic goods standard for human cell and tissue products donor screening requirements order 2021. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. I'll call the clerk. <laughs> Senator Walsh, you were seeking the call? I am seeking the call. I'm seeking leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. 
Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators, Senators Stirl, Cast and Smith, uh, for 28 March for personal reasons. All right, now I'll call the clerk. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion number 5 relating to the disallowance of the Industry Research and Development Underwriting New Generation Investments Program Instrument 2021, standing the name of Senator Waters. So I just, just want to confirm before we move on, Clark, that there were no further tablings. Senator Cox, we, did you have a further tabling? Yeah, this was in relation to notice of motion number five. No, no. So I move. Okay. Not so yet. Just, just confirming there was no further. All right. So. Apologies for that. We will now move on to the disallowance motion. And Senator Cox, you're saying. Thank the you. Call. I move business of the Senate notice of motion number five. Um, this, interest, this instrument is a culmination of a policy announced almost four years ago, uh, affectionately known as UNGI. Uh, we were told it was necessary to ensure stable energy supply, but all it's done is cause chaos and havoc with energy investors and halt new energy supply. Energy businesses held off on making their investment decisions for fear that the government was handing out to their preferred coal and gas donors and they would not be able to compete with them. This is, isn't just rhetoric. The whole process from start to finish has been hidden from public view. There has been no grant criteria, just a slush fund for Minister Taylor to pick and choose which projects he wants to fund and donors are encouraged to apply. When the shortlist was announced around three years ago, it included coal plants, five gas plants and six pumped hydro projects. And the department was asked over and over again how they were going to legally fund it. They did not have a clear answer. Then they tried to use the Clean Energy Finance Corporation to spend this money by creating the grid Reliability Fund. This was opposed by the Greens, Labor and the Crossbench, and the government did not have the numbers. But it didn't even get to the Senate. When it was in the House, a backbencher by the name of Barnaby Joyce moved an amendment to allow the CEFC to fund coal projects. The government killed that bill and Ungi died with it. But in the months that followed, legal counsel for the government obviously came across a new way to fund coal, oil and gas projects, and Section 33 of the Industry Research Development Act allows grants to be made by regulation. The entire Senate opposes this poor policy except for One Nation and the government. That isn't enough to pass a law to create this fund, but it is enough to prevent a disallowance, because the onus is flipped so the government needs, needs one less vote. That is why hand, handout after handout for coal, oil and gas companies has been funnelled through this section of the Industry Act in recent months. The scrutiny of the Regulations Committee has serious concerns with this bill, as they did with the ARENA regulations. So these concerns should be carried through. The committee has asked Minister Taylor to answer their concerns, and a month later, he still hasn't written back to the committee with any justification. We may not be successful today, but we will lodge a disallowance in the next parliament. Lismore is evacuated and flooded for the second time this month. Water has breached the levee, and insurance are telling us that these floods are set to be the most expensive natural disaster in Australia's history. And on this same day, One Nation and the government are voting to hand out more handouts to gas companies that are owned by billionaires overseas and are registered in tax havens. Surprise, surprise. The gas companies should be paying to clean up the damages they are causing, but instead they're getting away um, with our money 
to make floods even worse. And despite the government's best efforts, they still couldn't get this money out the door for their coal donor, Trevor St Barker, uh, Baker, who bought Vales Point Power Station of the New South Wales Liberals for $1 million. It was actually worth $700 million in the next year. And then a story in the Daily Telegraph was leaked that they were going to get $11 million for that. In estimates, the department denied that this was true, so a cabinet minister must have leaked it. Thankfully, the Angie scheme imploded and they couldn't get money out the door quick enough. The Vales Point coal plant didn't get the money in time that they needed it, so they actually withdrew their application. But still, here we are, one of the, first, uh, one of the final acts of the 46th parliament to get more handouts to fossil fuel donors. And the 47th Parliament cannot come quick, for some, quick enough for some of us. Thank you, President. Are there any? Senator Pratt. Thank you. Labor has also consistently criticised the government's underwriting uh, new generation investments program since its announcement in 2018. It lacks both transparency and integrity. It has given disgraced Minister Angus Taylor a blank cheque to fund pet projects without due process. Industry and experts tell us that it will push up power prices and expose taxpayers to risky investments. The Business Council of Australia has also criticised the program, saying ad hoc intervention in the energy market, such as underwriting generation investment, will only result in less investment in gener energy generation and less reliable energy and ultimately, Mr President, higher prices for consumers. The Australian Industry Group has said an underwriting program may have merit but presents significant risks to the public purse and therefore the burden uh, will be placed on the taxpayer. The integrity, uh, and they also have concern about the integrity of Australia's electricity markets under this scheme. Labor very much shares all of those concerns. We support the role that gas will play in terms of a transition in energy, uh, but support for any projects, gas or pumped hydro, they need to be considered through proper process, not through a coalition slush fund such as this one. We will maintain our opposition to this flawed program. Minister. Can I make a short statement? I don't need don't to do that, do I? You leave. You can just go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to make a short statement then. Um, this instrument provides an essential mechanism uh, to secure more affordable, reliable electricity for all Australians. On-demand reliable power, like the pumped hydro and gas projects supported by this instrument, are essential to keep the lights on and the prices low. Critically, this instrument will support the delivery of Tasmania's Battery of the Nation pumped hydro project, which will unlock firm, flexible, renewable generation that is vital for the future reliability and security of the national electricity market and which will support thousands of jobs in Tasmania. A vote for this motion is supporting the destruction of economy, economic opportunities for Tasmania. It's a vote for a less reliable grid, higher prices and higher cost of living for Australian families. There being no further contributions, I will put the motion. Uh, the question is that the disallowance be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. Question is that um, the disallowance, uh, Senate Business Notice of Motion Number Five, related to the disallowance of the Industry Research and Development Instrument 2021, uh, be uh, disallowed. Uh, ayes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone, teller for the ayes, and Senator Davey, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 27. The question is resolved in the negative. Uh, pursuant to order, I will now call the clerk. Uh, however, I do note that we will be in committee, so I will need a temporary chair to step in. Looking for someone volunteering for a few moments. Senator O'Sullivan or I'd send Thank you. The committee is considering the Treasury Laws Amendment Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill of 2022. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill of 2022 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. The report of the committee now be adopted. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Terrorism Insurance Act 2003 in order to establish a cyclone and related damage reinsurance pool operated by the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation and for related purposes. Are you seeking the call, Senator McKim? No?
Sorry, Senator McGinn, I don't believe your microphone's on. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. Sorry, could you just advise me what the question is before the chair at the moment? We've just introduced a new bill. Oh, okay. So we've just introduced Treasury was amendment cost of living support other measures bill, I believe. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment Cost of Living Support and Other Measures Bill of 2022 for concurrence. Minister. I that this bill now may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, employee share schemes and product stewardship to amend the National Health Act to, uh, 1953 and to provide for a one-off one -off cost of living payment and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And I think I'm calling Senator Watt. Ah, Madam Deputy President. Um, I seek leave to table my remarks. No, no, read no. I, fine, I'll read it out. <laughs> okay. Labor will support these bills. Uh, we are fully aware of the cost of living pressure being experienced by Australians, and our support for the measures in these bills reflects our commitment before last night's budget to be constructive about cost of living relief that the government would bring forward. On last night's budget, there were three defining features of, that, of the budget. Firstly, $1 trillion in debt, with nowhere near enough to show for that incredibly significant addition of debt that has been put on the budget by those opposite. Secondly, real wages are falling in the budget. The average worker is $26 a week, $1,315 a year worse off as a consequence of the real wage cuts which were outlined there in black and white in the government's budget last night. Thirdly, buried there on page 49 of budget paper number two are the $3 billion in secret cuts that the government does not want to come clean on this side of the election, no matter what government members may want to say about the budget papers. If there is a theme that emerges from this budget, it is that the government has taken a whole bunch of problems and challenges that exist from one side of the election and put them on the other side of the election. It's almost as if the Prime Minister woke up at some point in the last couple of weeks, contacted the Treasurer and said, I've got to call an election in the next fortnight or so. Let's get the shovel out and hopefully we can shovel enough money around in people's direction that they will forget that we've spent the best part of a decade going after the wages, job security, pensions and Medicare of ordinary Australians. This government has gone after Australians for the best part of a decade, and they're hoping this cash splash will make them forget the damage that those opposite have done to Australians' living standards with this almost decade-long campaign of undermining job security, undermining wages growth, undermining the pension and undermining Medicare. However, I think people are seeing through this budget just like they're seeing through this government. They understand that, even after the relief, which was budgeted for last night and which we're looking to pass through the parliament today, people are, still away, people are still way, way, way behind. While it's true that there has been significant pressure put on the economy and on prices by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, prices didn't start skyrocketing and pressure didn't start being applied to working families when Russia invaded Ukraine. It started when the coalition started attacking wages and living standards. Nothing in these bills before us today makes up for the damage that those opposite have done to household budgets. They said that stagnant wages were a deliberate design feature of their economic policy. In lots of ways, this is mission accomplished because we've got yet another year of real wages going backwards in the government's own budget. What we have said consistently and what we've said for some time is that we won't be standing in the way of some cost of living relief which is made necessary by the government's attacks on wages and the fact that real wages are going backwards. We intend to support the bills which are before the House today, which cover the measures announced last night to provide some cost of living relief for Australians, particularly pensioners and workers on low and middle incomes, and also motorists with the fuel excise cut. It is worth mentioning, though, and consistent with what I was talking about before, about taking problems from one side of the election to the other, 
that what the government will be legislating today is an increase in petrol prices in September, and they'll be legislating the end of the low and middle income tax offset. So, if the government were to change hands in May, whether the election is on the 14th or the 21st or the 7th of May, the inheritance for a new government or the inheritance, frank frankly, for a re-elected government would be a trillion dollars of debt with nothing to show for it, interest rates going up as the Reserve Bank has flagged and others have flagged, petrol prices going up in September and the end of the low and middle income tax offset. What was missing in this budget was a genuine plan for the future. At the upcoming election, Australians have a real choice. If we want to deal with the skills crisis through providing fee-free TAFE, if we want to reduce energy costs with cheaper and cleaner energy, if we want to increase workforce participation by boosting childcare, if we want to modernise the NBN to increase productivity throughout the economy, if we want to co-invest in advanced manufacturing to create new, secure jobs and new industries to build sovereign capability in Australia, then that's what an Albanese Labor government will deliver, and that's why Australians should vote for an Albanese Labor government at the coming election. Senator Cox. Thank you. I rise to make a con contribution to the Treasury Laws Amendment uh, Cost of Living Support and Other Measures Bill. And this bill provides uh, a one-off payment of $250 to income support recipients, but also provides an income tax offset of $420 for the 2021-22 income year. The government is trying to pass off these sweeteners as cost of living payments that will ease the cost of living pressures. But Australians won't fall for that. The $420 payment won't go far enough for families across Australia who are stuck spending half of their income on housing. And the $250 payment would only lift pensioners out of poverty for one week before sending them back below the poverty line in the following week. We cannot seriously be talking about easing the cost of living pressures without talking about housing. We are in a housing crisis in Australia. There are no two ways around that, and too many Australians are struggling to keep their heads above water, and too many of these Australians are women and younger people. Everyone deserves a roof over their heads and a safe place to call home. In a property market that is rigged for wealthy investors and with property prices surging to record highs, buying a home is well out of reach for most people. Decades of governments have rigged private housing markets with tax breaks to favour big developers and rich property speculators. We have a housing affordability crisis, but the Liberal and Labor parties want to wipe their hands of it, and it isn't good enough to leave this just to the market. To fix this me mess, we actually need government action, and we need it now. Renters in this country are doing it tough. It's too expensive for many people to pay both rent and also save for a deposit at the same time. More and more people are renting but with limited rights, and they can't turn their house into a home. I, like so many others across this country, I am a single parent, and I know what it's like to live in social housing. For people like us, the housing crisis is not academic. It is our lived reality. And it's time to wake up, because that is what's happening in the real world. It's time to think differently. And in the balance of power, the Greens will actually push for billionaires and big corporations to pay their fair share of tax in this country so we can build affordable housing and tackle the housing crisis head on. And whether you are renting a home or buying one, a housing system should work for people and not for profit. And that's why the Greens will build one million new homes, including 120,000 new homes in my home state of Western Australia over the next 20 years. And these new homes will clear the public housing waiting lists and make housing more affordable. It will end homelessness and ensure that everyone has a roof over their heads. We will build and offer to renters 
first home buyers and people locked out of housing new good quality homes in areas they actually want to live in for 300,000 at cost price this means renters can become homeowners paying off an affordable home loan and and building equity rather than the ever increasing rental payments because this means buying a home off the government the price isn't set by the property tycoons trying to turn a massive profit the shared equity scheme will mean eventually buyers will own three quarters of the property and be able to sell the property and move into pro the private property market or live there for the rest of their lives. The Greens will give renters the rights they deserve by strengthening rent the renters' rights and by funding tenancy advocacy services. That's why we will introduce rent control, ban no-grounds evictions and give the option of long-term leases for those who want them. Renters should be able to build the life they want in their home. I know you don't understand that, Senator Scar. Um, with the right to make minor changes without a landlord's permission and by stopping the blanket ban on pets in leases. And we will again pay this for this by making the billionaires pay the billionaires' tax on their wealth and winding back unfair tax breaks for people who own two or more properties. The Greens are the only party who don't take donations from the big banks, the big developers and the property tycoons like the other parties, because we don't take big donations and we put people's needs first. The Liberal and Labor parties back giving, back giving billions of dollars in handouts to people who own multiple properties, which just pushes the prices up and locks people out of housing. Both of these major parties want to keep the system rigged for big banks, big developers and property tycoons, all of which donate huge amounts to their parties each year. Both parties are beholden to their donors and it shows. Their policies make it easier for someone to buy their third, fourth, fifth investment property. And the Greens will make sure that those people who are locked out of the housing market can own their own home so that we can all have a safe place to call home. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Sheldon. A good thank you, um, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment, Cost of Living Support and Other Measures Bill 2022. Look, Schedule 6 of this bill uh, includes a one-off payment of $420 pre-election bribe for individuals with taxable income of less than $126,000. Schedule 8 of this bill includes a one-off $240 pre-election bribe for recipients of Social Security and veteran payments and holders of certain concession cards. Well, the reasons I say that's a bribe is because there is no real plan to turn around and deal with cost of living. Because when you only have a plan purely to turn around and do the important uh, immediate steps of trying to pretend you're dealing with cost of living, then you don't have a plan for the future. You don't have a plan before these one-off payments take place. There is nothing in this bill or elsewhere in the budget that grows wages. There is nothing in this bill or elsewhere in the budget to improve job security, which assists in growing wages. There is no long-term plan in this bill or elsewhere to improve the standard of living for Australian, the Australian people. Which leads me to ask. Why is the Prime Minister and the rest of the sorry government so desperate to hold on to power? If when you have power, you don't even try to improve the lives of everyday Australians. Isn't that why we're all here? Australians are being crushed under cost of living pressures. We're seeing skyrocketing cost of living, being crushed by record low wages growth. And of course, we've been also crushed by record levels of high job insecurity. That's the track record of this government. You know, I listened earlier today in question time with you know, some amusement with Senator Birmingham saying, we have a long-term economic plan. Well, guess what? Their long-term economic plan is to decrease your wages as part of a design, an economic design 
that they have actually put in place to keep low wages low. So to keep the standard of living low in this country is a designed practice of this government. And what does that mean for everyday Australians? And what does that mean for Australia? It means middle class jobs are disappearing. It means for the first time in the history of this country, this government has been shrinking the middle class. They have turned around and not put the plans and processes in place to make sure there's a real difference. And there are so many examples of that and the people that are suffering so desperately under this government's watch and under this government's program to make sure that people are not on a livable wage. Just in, uh, on the 23rd of March this year, it was reported where new modelling shows an aged care worker with no partner or dependents has $112 a week left after covering the costs of rent, transport, groceries and health care. If the worker is a single parent, they are $148 behind. About 70 per cent of aged care staff are qualified personal care workers with a certified three qualification, and after tax they take home $770 a week. Those figures are for a feminised industry, a caring industry, which is so critical to our community and also to our economy. The Australian Aged Care Collaboration, a group of six aged care peak bodies, examined the rising costs for living and uh, for affected workers, and that's what they found. This is not some propaganda sheet from some obscure. This is the employers saying how desperate the situation is for the workers within their industry. Now, quite clearly, you can go into so many more examples of what's occurring in our economy right now. I recall when I was first started working as a cleaner and then a bar attendant as a full-time job in my late teens. I was working with people that were raising a family. Now, for me, a middle-class job is when you have middle-class pay. And in those jobs as a cleaner and a bar attendant, people were raising families. These days, they're still middle class jobs, but they don't have middle class pay. They don't have a government who cares about expanding, developing and supporting the middle class in this country. Regardless of the rhetoric, let's look at the actual facts. The McKell Institute found an average worker would be earning $307 more per week if the wages growth achieved under Labor between 2007 and 2013 had been sustained through 2014 and 2021. There's almost an extra $16,000 per year that has been stolen by every, for, of every well, I've said this very clearly. There's almost $16,000 per year that has been stolen from everyday Australian workers under this government's watch because they have a low wage agenda. And when you look at the low wage agenda, how low can they go? How far can we turn around and make sure that workers don't have the opportunities that they should have to earn a decent living? And we only have to turn to comments that have been passed regarding workers in what is now our second largest company, Uber. 120,000 people working for Uber. And thank goodness they have been working, because thank goodness they have been on the front line of the pandemic. But what is their income? Their income is as low as $6.67 an hour. No workers' comp, no right to bargain. Oh, wait, wait a sec. I did hear from the Industrial Relations Minister who said she supports giving gig workers, and I quote, the freedom and flexibility to enter into contracts and negotiate their own rates of pay. Sounds like digital work choices, doesn't it? Digital work choices as a design of this government. Now, the person in charge of workplace laws in Australia thinks you are an Uber driver getting paid $6.67 an hour can negotiate with the CEO in, in San Francisco to try to get a decent wage? Well, the consequences are in black and white. Inquiry after inquiry, report after report. An inquiry into the job security went to the right to the heart of this issue 
of low wages and why it happens. Uber drivers cannot negotiate their wages, but for this government it's too complicated to give basic rights, basic rights to our fellow, our fellow workers working within this country. Now it does raise, and I know this doesn't apply to everybody on the other side of the of the of the um, of these, this Senate and this chamber, but it must be applying to the people that have the co the, co the consequences of what you're doing, because when you've got industries, whether it be the ag industry, with exploited workers from the Pacific, doing vital work in this country, or getting paid as little on take-home pay of $100 a week, where you've got Uber drivers getting paid $6.67 an hour, and where you've got industries that are dominated such as that of people, particularly on temporary visas, roughly 25 per cent are Australian nationals, then it starts saying the government doesn't care. It doesn't care about the most vulnerable people within our community. And what's clear from the McKell report, it doesn't care about everyone else left, because this is a design practice of this government to turn around and keep our wages low right across this economy. Well, I'll let you in a little secret. A good economy doesn't create good jobs. Good jobs create a good economy. And a good job is a secure job we are able to negotiate a decent wage. And this government has said quite clearly, quite directly, as a matter of policy, that low wages is a fundamental ambition of this government. Well, congratulations, you've achieved it. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, once again, once again, I've had the privilege of sitting in the chamber of Senator Cox made a contribution where the Greens again, they again refer to this concept of power sharing. In the event that the Labor Party wins the next election, the Greens are all set up, they're mobilised, they're going to share power with the Labor Party. Share power with you, Senator Ciccone and Senator Watt. They're ready. They're ready. You know, I, they, it's going to be delightful. I can, I, Senator Watt, I can. I can see you've got such mastery in terms of negotiation skills. I can see you there. I don't know. Are you going to play bad cop or good cop with Senator Ciccone? Senator Ciccone, I think you're a good cop. I think you're a good cop. I think Senator Watt's a bad cop. Senator Scar, can I remind you to address your remarks through the chair? Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I do believe Senator Ciccone would make a good cop. But I think, through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, that he could turn and become a bad cop. And maybe you'll need to use tactics, negotiating tactics like this, in terms of your power sharing arrangement with the Greens. But we heard it today again, this afternoon, we heard it today again. Senator Cox. Senator Cox with her uh, housing, her housing policy, straight out of the 1940s. Straight out of the 1940s. Did rent control work in Great Britain? No. Did they abolish it because it didn't work? Yes. Does rent control work in the state of New York? No. Does re did rent control work in the states of Victoria during the 1940s, during the Second World War and its aftermath? No. What did it lead to? What did rent control lead to? A lack of available private dwellings for rent because landlords wouldn't invest in them. And the ones that they'd built, they didn't invest in any maintenance of the buildings because there was rent control. And then people who had excess capacity in terms of their accommodation didn't rent it out because they wouldn't get sufficient rent. It was a disastrous policy, an absolute disastrous policy. But, but I can see Senator Watt and Senator Ciccone, Mr Acting Deputy President, spending time in terms of sharing the power, sharing the power with the Greens, having these debates. I've got some literature upstairs. I've got a book called Basic Economics, which I'll lend you, and it's got a whole chapter on rent control. It's an introductory text. For Economics 101. So I'll, I'll lend that to you, Senator Chikone, uh, through you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I will lend it to my good friends opposite for when they're engaged in their power sharing arrangements with the Australian Greens. Order. It's going to be delightful. It's going to be delightful. I must say, Mr. Acting Deputy President, Senator Watt is a person of great humour. I think he's, you know, from time to time I, I chuckle at his contributions. Sometimes I can't be too uh, open about it, but I do chuckle from time to time. I just wonder, I just wonder through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, how long Senator Watt's good humour is going to last. But whatever happens, Senator Watt, 
Through you, Mr Acting Deputy President. My door's always open to Senator Watt and to my good friend Senator Ciccone. If they need some counselling, if they need some counselling, I've been through difficult negotiations during my corporate career. And if they need some counselling at any time in relation to the negotiations, I've got a book. I've got a book in um, in my library. It's called How to Deal with Difficult People. I'm prepared to lend Senator, you that book through you, Mr. Senator Acting Scar, Deputy President. This is a very generous contribution, but I, I do start to fail to see the relevance to the Treasury Laws Amendment Cost of Living Support Other Measures Bill 2022. Well, I do, I do thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, for bringing me back to the topic because you are, in fact, right. I have been, um, as I've been, uh, as I've been thinking aloud, thinking aloud in relation to the power sharing. So I will come back to cost of living, and I'm delighted to do so. I'm delighted to do so after the budget was, which was brought down, because there are cost of living measures in the budget that was brought down, which will make a substantial difference, a substantial difference to the good people of Queensland. For the next six months, Australians will save 22 cents a litre. 22 cents a litre every time they fill up their motor vehicle because of the budget that was brought down earlier this week. 22 cents a litre. That makes an outstanding contribution. An outstanding contribution. Money in the pocket. Money in the pocket for Queenslanders. A direct contribution for Queenslanders to handle those cost of living pressures. And it's fit and proper. It's fit and proper that with the international situation as it is, that we should have. We should have, Mr Acting Deputy President. This, this budget should have cost of living measures to provide some assistance to the good people of Queensland, the good people in South Australia, who you represent, Mr Acting Deputy President, cost of living contributions to assist, uh, to assist our constituents, to assist the people of Australia in relation to the increase in oil prices, as a, which arose as a direct result out of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So there's cost of living measure one, number one. It's estimated, Mr Acting Deputy President, that a family with two cars, two cars who fill up once a week could save around $30 a week or around $700 over the next six months, Mr Acting Deputy President. A profound, a profound difference in terms of cost of living for those people who, uh, who need to fill up. They've got a family and they've got two cars. But there is also, there is also, there is also a cost of living tax offset which I'm sure Senator Patrick, uh, through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, would be most interested in. And this cost of living tax, set, tax off, offset provides a new one-off $420 cost of living tax offset for more than 10 million, 10 million low- and middle-income earners. And Senator Sheldon, in his contribution, talked about those middle-income earners and said, where's the plan? Here's the plan. $420 cost of living tax offset for more than 10 million low- and middle-income earners. $420 cost of living tax offset. The punters, the people out there, the people out there, Mr Acting Deputy President, they're not interested. They're not interested in wild and woolly rhetoric and theoretical plans, etc. They want to know what it means to their basic living expenses. What does it mean? What does the budget mean as they try, as they try to balance their household budgets and provide for their families? That's what they want to know. That's what they want to know. So Senator Sheldon can talk about uh, the, the issues in, in relation to uh, do, uh, does a good economy create good jobs or do good jobs create a good economy. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that the constituents I speak to in the region where I'm based, in Ipswich, Ipswich Regional uh, Council area in the good state of Queensland, I'm not sure they're interested in those debates. I think they are more interested. Order. I think they are more Senator interested. Ciccone. I think they are more interested in relation to what does it mean for their wallets? What does the budget mean for their wallets in terms of practically Order. managing Senator cost of living? Senator Scar, resume your seat. Members on my left, standing order one nine seven says that interruptions are disorderly. Senator Scar, you have the call. And in addition, and in addition to those cost of living benefits, there's also, of course, the new one-off $250 cost of living payment delivered within weeks, within weeks, within weeks, to six million Australians: pensioners, carers, veterans, job seekers, eligible self-funded retirees, and concession card holders will benefit. Together with the existing indexation arrangements, this will see a single pensioner receive more than $500. $500 in additional support over the next six months, just when they need it most. How's that for a plan? 
How's that for a plan? Sounds like a pretty good plan to me, Mr Acting Deputy President. Sounds like a pretty good plan to me. And the reason why we can deliver, the reason why this government can deliver that cost of living relief is because of the responsible way in which this government has managed the budget through one of the most challenging times ever seen by this country. One of the most challenging times ever seen by this country. That's why, that's why, Mr Acting Deputy President, that we can deliver this cost of living relief, cost of living relief to the good constituents of South Australia, who you represent, and to the good constituents of Queensland, who I represent. And at the same time, at the same time, whilst relieving those cost of living pressures, whilst relieving those cost of living pressures, we're also assisting, we're also assisting the people of Australia to fulfil their long-term plan, if we want to talk about plans, their long-term plan to buy a house. To buy a house. Because that's the Australian dream. That's the Australia I grew up in. That everyone in this country should have the opportunity, should have the opportunity, if they work hard, if they put the effort in, to, to realise that dream of buying their Order. first home. And this government has delivered that. This government has delivered in spades in relation, to that, um, in relation to that objective. 160,000 Australians have purchased their first home over the last year. 160,000 Australians. That is a terrific, a terrific record of achievement by this government. And we're doubling, we're doubling the home guarantee scheme to 50,000 places per year. 50,000 places. There's approximately 10,000 Queenslanders, 10,000 Queenslanders who have benefited from that home guarantee scheme. 10,000 Queenslanders in their home, in their home. No doubt, no doubt, listening to uh, their senator from Queensland making a contribution to this debate. 10,000 Queenslanders. 10,000 Queenslanders. Senator Scar, please resume your seat. Senator Patrick, I have asked you previously to respect the standing orders. Interjections are disorderly. Senator Scar. 10,000 Queenslanders, Mr Acting Deputy President, living in their first home as a direct result of that home guarantee scheme. So that's the plan we're realising. That's the plan this government is realising. We're helping the Australian people, Australian families, realise their plan, realise their plan of home ownership, their dream of home ownership. And that's a pretty good plan, I think, Mr Acting Deputy President. Minister. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President, uh, and I thank senators for their, contribu um, their contributions to the debate today. Uh, the bill before us, the Treasury Laws Amendment, Cost of Living Support and Other Measures Bill of 2022, outlines a number of cost of living measures that were announced in last night's budget, delivered by the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, in the other place. Uh, a number of the uh, schedules in this bill include things like med keeping the Medicare low income thresholds, keep making sure that they keep pace with the cost of living, making COVID testing expenses tax deductible for workers who require testing to attend work, making it easier for businesses to create employee share schemes, giving more Australians opportunities to share in the economic value that they create through their work. It reduces the GDP uplift for GST instalments, uh, saving businesses money. It includes the one-off cost of living tax offset to support low and middle income earners of $400 $120 for the financial year 2021-22. It increases the low and middle income tax offset benefit to $1,500 for a single or $3,000 for a couple, provided on assessment of a tax return for this 2021-2022 income year. It also increases the affordability of drugs that are on the PBS. In fact, 2,800 new drugs have been listed on the PBS since 2013 when the coalition came to government. It increases the cost of living payment. It introduces the cost of living payment of $250 to pensioners, to veterans, to carers, to job seekers, to concession card holders and eligible self-funded retirees. And of course, it cuts the excise on petrol by half for the next six months. These are the cost of living measures that we have promised in the budget. They are helping ease the cost of living pressures on ordinary Australians now. Cost of living pressures that have been caused by um, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia, but also of global supply chain issues that have that are a response to COVID-19. More importantly, the budget last night also did not just deal with the cost of living pressures, but also introduced a long-term 
uh, well, cemented our long-term economic plan that creates more jobs for Australians, lowering taxes, cutting red tape, investing in infrastructure and skills for a future workforce, keeping energy prices low, about 8 per cent lower in the last two years alone, while at the same time ensuring that we continue on the journey to net zero by 2050, making Australia a digital economy, a leading and in fact top 10 digital economy and society by 2030, and um, increasing our sovereign capabilities in modern manufacturing in areas like space, and defence, in food and, uh, and food and beverage, in critical minerals and mining technology. Um, and, uh, and that is the plan for the future. Um, most importantly, though, this bill is about reducing the cost of living now, the cost of living right now. And, uh, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, employee share schemes and product stewardship to amend the National Health Act 1953 to provide for a one-off cost of living payment and for related purposes. So amendments have been circulated, so we will move into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, the question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move Greens Amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1591. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move Greens Amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1591. Uh, we are in a situation where we have floods in New South Wales and Queensland. We have a housing crisis. People can't make ends meet. Um, young people are burdened with huge study debts which are holding them back. Rather than addressing these issues that affect millions of people, here we are here we have a government trying to sneak in deductible gift status for the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization, a move that will allow the centre to avoid taxation on their income. My amendment will stop this from happening. We cannot allow the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization to further cement its influence in our universities, on our students and in the curriculum. The Ramsey Center wants nothing more than to churn out students with an uncritical view of Western civilization, and the government oh, yeah. knows that. It's not like university curricula across the country have any dearth of material they already teach about Western civilization. No university curriculum is even remotely lacking in Western history, literature, or politics. All the Ramsey Center wants is to glorify Western civilization with as much influence from their Howard and Abbott-led board as possible. It is shameful that the government wants to aid the Ramsey Center's project to airbrush imperialism and colonialism out of Western civilization studies. This center is about nothing but an aggressive and extremely political right-wing agenda. Let's not forget Tony Abbott said this center isn't about Western civilization, it's in favor of it. We must push back hard against this idea of cultural supremacy and stand strongly for academic freedom and critical thinking. And I urge my colleagues in the Senate to support my amendments. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the, uh, the government will obviously be opposing this amendment, um, putting aside the fact that Western civilization is in fact the foundation of liberal democracy that we enjoy in Australia, and it is also the foundation of a parliamentary democracy that we enjoy right Order. in this very chamber. I do think the senator has misunderstood what DGR status actually implies. It does not make it a. It does not mean that the Western, the Ramsey the Centre uh, doesn't pay tax. It means that donors to the Ramsey Centre are allowed to deduct their donation. So I'm not entirely sure that that's clear. So obviously the government will be opposing this amendment. Thank you. So could I have silence in the chamber? Thank you. The question, and note the form of the question, the 
question is that table item 2255 of item 1 and item 8 of schedule 3 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes. Lock the doors. So the question is that table item 2255 of item 1 and item 8 of schedule 3 stand as printed. 
The ayes have passed the right chairs. No are left. I call Senator Chandler. Tell her for the ayes. Senator McKim. Tell her for the noes. The result of the vision is there are ayes 25, noes 8. The bill is resolved. Sorry, the question is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, the question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Sorry, the, the sorry, the bill stand as printed. Yes. Thank you. Now is the bill be reported. Thank you. Whip. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the committee the report of the committee now be adopted. Thank you. So, sure. So the question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Minister uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, employee share schemes and product stewardship to amend the National Health Act 1953 to provide for a one-off cost of living payment and for related purposes. And Clark. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence the Exercise Tariff Amendment Cost of Living Support Bill 2022 and the Customs Tariff Amendment Cost of Living Support Bill 2022. Minister. That these bills may now proceed without formalities and be taken together and be now read a first time. So the question is that motion be supported. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Excise Tariff Act 1921 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that these bill now, bills now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Watt. Um, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. In the interest of time, I won't uh, make any extended remarks. I just refer uh, people to the second reading speech I gave for the previous bill, uh, the Treasury Laws Amendment Cost of Living Support and Other Measures Bill 2022. Uh, the sentiments that we expressed in that speech apply here as well. We fully support uh, providing Australians with cost of living relief. Uh, it's a shame that it's taken this government so long to recognise that people needed cost of living support. It's a shame that it took an impending election before the government delivered cost of living support. Uh, and of course, it leaves unresolved the matter of wages uh, being at um, stagnating under this government. Uh, but we are fully supportive of providing the cost of living support that um, this bill seeks to provide. Thank you, Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting 
<coughs> Deputy President, I'll also be relatively brief. But I wanted to reflect on the fact that the opening of the Treasurer's budget speech last night was very grave. He said, as we gather, war rages in Europe, the global pandemic is not over, devastating floods have battered our communities. We live, he said, in uncertain times. And indeed, this parliament and parliaments and governments around the world are faced with these weighty issues, to which uh, he could have added that we are living in an era where the planet's climate is breaking down around us. And yet, having set out in these Churchillian tones, the Treasurer proceeded to introduce a budget that, instead of rising to the gravity of the times and to the gravity of his opening remarks, is designed to do nothing more than to get the government through to polling day in just a few short weeks. The budget confirms that this government is completely devoid of a moral compass, 100 per cent transactional, politically and electorally desperate and cynical to its core. The budget is nothing more than a money for votes pitch. And sure, you know, people will be happy to see an extra $250 or $420 in their wallets or in their tax returns. But individually and as a nation, we'd be much better off if we had a government that actually addressed the weighty issues of our time, which actually went about ensuring access to reliable and affordable and high quality essential public services, so that in a country as wealthy, safe and prosperous as ours, no one actually needed budget handouts on budget night just to help them pay next week's bills. We'd also be much better off if we had a government which hadn't actively campaigned, as they did in the last election, against the transition to electric vehicles. And we all remember Mr Morrison three years ago doing his chicken little routine about electric vehicles being the end of the weekend. Well, how's the Prime Minister's weekend looking now? And what's his solution? We've got a six-month cut to fuel excise proposed in this legislation that could easily be wiped out overnight before it even gets to the petrol pump by a spike in global commodity prices and the endlessly voracious profit gouging of multinational oil and gas companies who, let's not forget, have obscenely profited by contributing so massively to the breakdown of our climate. So we've got temporary cash payments, temporary cut to fuel excise, and they both highlight that this government has no plan and no interest in addressing the fundamental cost of living pressures that people around the country are facing. Because even with the temporary relief, and it's very temporary, that is offered by this budget, rents will still be going up, thanks to this government giving $13 billion of tax breaks in this budget to property speculators so they can buy their third, their fourth, their fifth, their tenth, their twentieth or their fiftieth investment property tax breaks that have turned what used to be regarded as homes for people into just another investment class. Uh, we will see medical expenses still going up because this government is more interested in subsidising the profits of the private health corporations than it is in running a world-class public health system. We will see young people continuing to be pri priced out of the housing market, a turbocharged housing market that is increasing significantly pressure on rents, which is pricing many people out of the rental market. Young people will also still be saddled, saddled with crippling levels of student debt. Another $9 billion in this budget added to the student debt in this country, thanks, thanks to a government made up of ministers who almost unanimously got free university back in the day. We should actually be abolishing student debt in this country. That's what we should be doing, and we can afford it easily by making the big corporations and the billionaires 
pay their fair share of tax and ending the $10 billion a year that we see every single year, including in the four budget out years of this budget that go into direct public subsidies to burn fossil fuels. And house insurance will continue to go up thanks to this government doing nothing to prepare cities and towns for the impact of climate change, whether that be floods, whether that be sea level rise or whether that be bushfires. Meanwhile, what do we get in this budget? Confirmation that the millionaires and the billionaires can look forward to a $9,000 a year leg up when the stage three tax cuts come into place. So this is a budget where there's tiny little cash handouts for people who are struggling to make ends meet. The $250 for people on business will lift a group of people out of poverty for two weeks and then plunge them straight back into poverty. Meanwhile, the billionaires get a $9,000 a year tax cut in perpetuity. It's an utter, utter disgrace. So for the rich and powerful, for the billionaires, for the big corporates, for the planet cookers, the handouts in this budget are massive, just like they are in every budget each and every year that this government's been here. As the Prime Minister once infamously said, and I will never forget it and I'll never stop reminding the Senate of it, this government, to quote from Mr Morrison, looks after its mates. This government looks after its mates. Well, so it has in this budget, because this is a government of its mates, by its mates, for its mates. Now, the good news is that this country is less than 50 days away from kicking them out. We're going to see the back of this government that doesn't even believe in being a government. And I genuinely hope that when this parliament next convenes that we have more Greens here in the Senate, and I believe that we will, and more Greens in the House of Representatives, and I believe that we will as well. Because we actually have a positive vision for this country. And in, with more Greens and the Greens in balance for power in the House of Representatives and the Senate, we can build more affordable housing. We can get rid of negative gearing and the capital gains tax concession. We can give people who are renting proper rights so we can address the housing crisis head on. We can get dental and mental health into Medicare. We can abolish student debt. We can keep coal and gas in the ground. We can restore a price on carbon pollution. We can protect the beautiful environment and the magnificent nature of this country. We can drive investment into clean energy. We can make Australia a renewable energy superpower, and we need to do those things because we've, we are living, as the Treasurer said at the start of his budget speech, in very challenging times. Our climate is breaking down around us. Economic inequality has been turbocharged. We are living through the sixth mass extinction event in the history of this planet. We need to take action to address those things. The budget did not take the necessary action, and that is because it is nothing other than a panicked scam, a desperate and cynical attempt to buy this government's way back into power. But you know what lets me sleep at night? I know it's not going to work. I know it's not going to work because it is time that the Liberals are kicked out and I genuinely believe the Australian people will do it this time round. And I hope they put the Greens in balance of power in the Senate and in the House of Representatives so we can push the next government to go further and faster on those significant public policy areas that are the cause of some of the great challenges of our time. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, following on for Senator McKim there, he's actually really started the theme that I wanted to talk about tonight because it was only in this place last night that Green Senator Faruqi made the comment, 
and I quote, the Greens, in the balance of power, will push the next government to move further and faster to tackle the climate crisis, to end coal and gas, to do more on mitigation and resilience and protect people in the pl uh, and planet. Well, I don't know about everybody else, but that sounds like a pretty good done deal to me. Obviously, those opposite and those at the end of the chamber have already got into bed together. They're already lining up to destroy industries, to destroy jobs, to turn the lights off, to kill regions like the Hunter. But what else would we expect from a party who manages to put the member for Shortland from the, the very far left of the Labor Party, who's busy off hugging snowmen, COP26, whilst he's trying to shut down the industry that his entire seat, his entire electorate, is based on. This is absolutely appalling, and it is exactly why a Labor-Greens alliance is the most dangerous thing facing this country. And if Senator Faruqi hadn't said it last night, we've just heard it said again by Senator McKim. The balance of power with their Labor mates, already locked and loaded, going to shut down every coal mine, shut down every power station, kill off jobs. I'm off to the Hunter on Sunday, and I'm very much looking forward, very much looking forward now, even more than I usually do, to catching up with those industries, to catch up with the defence industry that is absolutely striving to support our nation, to the lithium ion batteries that are being produced up in the Hunter region. Go and see the coal miners, Newcastle ports, those industries that sustain the entire Hunter region. At some point in time, the Labor Party purported to be the party of workers. Well, we know that's gone. And as we're going to lose the member for Hunter, it's like the, the last great hope as Mr Fitzgibbon leaves the Labor Party, because at least he got it. We've lost Senator Kitching. She got it. The Otis group seems to be a bit quiet at the moment. Maybe they can't get a booking or they've stopped stocking Godfathers, so Senator Farrell won't go anymore. But we do very much look forward in hopefully the next coming weeks that we hear from the Otis group that they can give some solace at some point that coal is important to Australia. Energy production and fuel is important to Australia. Gas production is important to Australia. And if you don't get that already, just go and have a look at what's happening in the Ukraine and in Europe at the moment. It is absolutely irresponsible to suggest anything otherwise. We expect that from the Greens. We know that from the Greens. But their bed buddies that are all lined up with their power sharing agreement, the Albanese Bant government, we know what's coming and we know how many jobs are going to be lost. And to say that people who are experiencing incredible hardship after COVID, that is coming out of an incredibly strong economy, bounce back better than almost anywhere else in the world, AAA credit rating, but people are still doing it tough, and we know there's cost of living pressures because we all do actually live in the real world. We actually do go in and turn our lights on and appreciate where that power comes from. But we know that Australians, real Australians, they are experiencing cost of living pressures, and a lot of that, again, a little bit of intellectual depth that we know is lacking around most of this chamber on the other side, but a lot of those cost of living pressures are actually created from international factors. We've had supply chain issues because we can't get the travel of the ships and the planes that used to bring so many goods into and out of our country. We've got the fuel issue being driven by the war in Ukraine. These are international levers. But we as a government have taken responsible action in supporting everyday Australians by putting more money into their pockets. We know that when you have a job, it's the best thing that can happen for you if you've got a job. It's good for your confidence. It's good for your self-esteem. It's great for your kids to see it. We don't want to see a consistent welfare state. We don't want to see people on a lifetime cycle of welfare. We know they want a living wage up here. We haven't heard what's coming from the other side. They backing a living wage too, backing a living wage so that we don't have people in work. But when people are in work, we trust them to keep more of their own money because we know they can spend it the way they want to spend it. They can invest in their family and spend the money they earn much more efficiently 
than a group, a gaggle, a pair of bed partners that want to shut down entire industries. I think we've all heard today. We know it's all happening. The Australian public deserve to know what alliance you have set up between the Labor Party and the Greens, what sort of backroom secret dodgy deals you're doing. I don't know if you've got a movie theme for that one as well. But you know, the Australian people deserve to know just how and when and how quickly, if you would have formed government, you would kill off their jobs. And that's why in a couple of weeks, Mike, you know that hubris is sneaking back in. We all remember the we're ready photo. I'm really looking forward to the next one. I think it'll be a cracker. But we remember the we're ready photo, and I'm sure we're going to have to have Mr Bant in that one, because Mr Bant's ready as well to get into that power sharing agreement. I think you might all find in a couple of months Australians are going to understand this government has taken them through COVID, has saved their jobs, has kept the economy strong. We are seeing debt being repaid at a much faster rate. And one of the reasons for that, Senator McKim, you might enjoy, is the unbelievable commodity prices at the moment. Iron ore, coal, thermal coal, we love it, gas. Those commodity prices are what is going to bring the deficit down. But because some of us actually did pay attention in economics, we understand that. And I think the Australian people are going to see it because they do not want a bunch of economic illiterates who want to cut their jobs off, who bully their colleagues and don't look into it whilst hypocritically jumping up and down. Absolutely appalling, and the Australian people deserve to know exactly what sneaky deals you guys have done. Senator Sheldon, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Thank you. You have the call. Uh, thank you. Acting Deputy President. Well, isn't this, you know, I'm speaking on, of course, the excise tariff amendment and the custom tariff amendment bills. The government has defeated in May its parting gift to all Australians as an increase in petrol prices in September. And of course, pay not keeping up with prices, a trillion dollars in debt, and of course rising interest rates. Now, under this government, we're going to see petrol prices and costs of living skyrocketing. We're going to see families, working families, falling further behind. And what we really should be also clearly considering that is before the Ukrainian-Russian war, for the horrors that have been occurring in Ukraine, that petrol prices were going up under this government. Now, when we start looking at dealing with the cost of living, and particularly with the fuel, the fuel excise, we start looking at my old industry, which I'll get to in a moment, and that is the old transport industry, which I still take a deep interest in. Great companies wonderful owner drivers and great employees make that industry. And of course I'm proud to say that I also, as a union official, represented the largest small business organisation in this country. And that was called the Transport Workers Union, because they represented many, many, many thousands of owner drivers across this economy. In actual fact, I think this, the biggest smallest, the largest small business organisation when you put all the other groups together. But what really strikes me when we start looking at what this excise tariff means for those drivers is that it means a $1,000 tank to fill up that the money that they'll approximately get back is $88. $1,000 to fill their tank, now they get $88. So how does this government help the cost of living for small business? Well, one, they got rid of the rights for owner drivers to negotiate collectively agreements only a number of years ago under this government, and then said they'd put something in place to make sure that there wasn't devastation across the industry. And of course, surprise, surprise, nothing has been put in place at all that's effectively given rights back to those owner drivers, those small business people that were stolen by this government. And what's particularly galling when you start looking at not only the exploitation that's happening in that cost of living questions for small business people as owner drivers, is the consequences of the death rates and injury rates. Because when you're in a supply chain, which you know a bit of a lesson for them, when you're in a supply chain and you've got the employer at the top reaping all the benefit and contracting out and contracting out and contracting out, fundamentally the same work. 
The people at the bottom, which are often those hard working owner drivers, are the ones that are forced to take the price they're given. They're not price makers, they're price takers. And this is the exact same thing when you look at Uber, when you look at the gig economy and the transport. These people, those workers, those hard workers are not price makers, they are price takers. They don't have the capacity to collective bargain. And what's the consequences? Five people dead delivering food deliveries across the eastern seaboard. And that's the ones that have been reported. Because also on further reports, as a result of, in the state of New South Wales, forensic um, and pursuit by the Labor Party there, where there was hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds each year of injured workers that were not identified to work to um, fair work uh, to the work cover in New South Wales. So hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of serious injuries across the gig industry in food delivery for one company, Uber, the ones they defend, because don't forget, they reckon that those Uber workers can negotiate. And if they don't like it, they can just take their labour somewhere else. Well, you know, when you've only got the option of starvation wages and starvation, then you take starvation wages. And this government simply and fundamentally does not care. And for those that do care, there is a solution. And for those that are in this chamber and in the Senate, there are solutions. And the solution is an $88 to those owner drivers. The solution is about having a plan, not a one-off payment. It is necessary for us to turn around and make sure that we have proper regulation to give to equalise bargaining rights between employers and those supply chains, to make sure we start dealing with the cost of living pressures, to make sure that we actually have a plan to make sure small businesses aren't being done over, to make sure those people that are in the most exploited industries aren't being um, having uh, their, their rights, the rights that we all enjoy, not being able to enjoy because we actually don't have the will to turn around and give legislative protections. This government needs to turn around and decide that the Oliver Twist approach to wages is no policy at all. Like you know, going, to, going to the governor you know, with your bowl and saying, please, can I have some more? And surprise, surprise. The governor says no. And what do you do? You go back to your seat. Well, that's not the sort of country that we should have here. We should have rights for working people to be able to argue for decent wages. And this is not an anti-company position. It's actually supporting good business, because there's lots of good business out there, including in the gig industry, that want further regulation. But they can't do it unless there's proper competition and there's proper regulation that there's fairness in the market. Now, the Oliver Twist approach by this government just does not work. You know, even, even the Reserve Bank, just as recently as the 22nd of March, a report from Ben Butler, a report in a number of other places as well, said that real wages have been stagnant in Australia for almost a decade. Although saying that was frustrating who said that we'd like to see some bigger increases. And what's the government's plan for that? No plan, no strategy, no way to make sure the middle class doing work as small business people and as employees in jobs that are vital. I mean, all they can think of is that, gee, I'll tell you what, wages are really going up for, those, for the executives at some of those finance companies. It's really going up for you know, some sections of the market. It's really going up for that top 1 per cent, but it is not going up for everybody else across this economy. They've got more job insecurity, they've got lower wages, and under this government's plan they'll have even lower wages. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak to the excise tariff amendment cost of living support bill 2002 and of course it forms part 
of the federal government's um, budget delivered yesterday by Mr Frydenberg. The, the budget does something really very important for all Australians. It acknowledges the challenges that households are facing right now as um, our market adapts to many of the challenges that have put inflationary pressures on prices. Um, the concerns emerging from Europe and the Ukraine, the impact on fuel prices um, and the impact on um, the cost of transport and its impact on groceries and the impact on household bills is something that we acknowledge in this budget, something that we empathise with and something that we understand. And so there is action to reduce the cost of living now, whether one looks to the cost of fuel, which by halving the fuel excise for the next six months, it means a household with two cars who fill up once a week will find themselves around $700 better off during that period. Whether it's about the cost of living tax offset of $420 that means more than 10 million low and middle income earners in this country will find themselves better able to cope with those increased costs of living. We'll have pensioners, carers, veterans, job seekers and eligible self-funded retirees and concession card holders better equipped to handle the price fluctuations we have seen due to that international change. We're also taking important steps to make sure that more Australians can afford the cost of a home. We know and we understand just how important that ambition of Australians to be able to save for and get into a home of their very own, including Mr Acting Deputy President, ensuring that's not something that's out of reach for people um, who are single parents. We're more than doubling that home guarantee scheme to 50,000 places per year, knowing that the enthusiasm for this program in its early years has been through the roof. Helping more Australians get into their own home, get out of the cycle of renting and own their own little piece of Australia is a big part of how we are showing that we understand the pressures that are on people for managing those cost of living pressures every day. But we're not just dealing with the here and now. We also have in this budget a long-term plan that is about building the kind of strength in this economy that delivers job and wage growth for the long term. And that is something every Australian benefits from. With $2.8 billion invested to increase the take-up and completion rates of apprentices, we will see more skilled people in the workforce. There will be 800,000 people supported into training places as a part of this budget. And with support for small businesses, to be able to get uh, supersized tax deduction for the money they are prepared to spend investing in the skill set and the training of their employees by giving them a supersized tax deduction for every dollar they're prepared to spend investing in the, the software, in the technical and electronic infrastructure needed to improve productivity, to improve cybersecurity and to improve inf efficiency of their business. Um, they can get benefits of up to $100,000 a year per business um, if they are prepared to double down on their investment in the jobs of their team, in the growth and in the contribution um, that they make to our economy. We're investing hard into local manufacturing. Of course, we've made enormous progress in developing the kind of um, specialised and high-skill manufacturing in Australia that remains an area in which we can be very competitive um, despite the comparatively high labour costs that we have in Australia. And it is going from strength to strength. And with support for greater commercialisation of 
the kind of research that is being done in enormous quantities, particularly in partnership between our universities, the CSIRO and industry, um, we are driving the commercialisation and the manufacture of new technologies, whether those are in the energy, the medical supplies, the defence um, or in other high priority areas for this country. Importantly, agriculture and energy are core to this manufacturing strategy and it's all about making sure there is a steady stream of high value intellectual property developed here in Australia so that income from new patents developed here can be taxed at almost half the rate that ordinarily applies. And that means we will become a really attractive destination for people to set up shop, do their research and development and forge into a manufacturing enterprise in this country. Our regions are a big part of the story of the coalition government's vision for the future growth of our economy. And Investment in our regions is how we ensure that we get great opportunities to people who live outside our cities, who we know ordinarily um, have fewer opportunities from which to choose. It is how we harness the um, enormous gift that we have in the size and in the, in the richness of um, the, the mineral and in the land wealth of this country. And it is how we ensure um, that people, no matter where they live in this great country, can not only have the same aspiration to a great job, the same aspiration to afford a home that they can be proud of, uh, but also that they can have the expectation of high quality services um, by building the wealth of this nation, by harnessing both the human talents and the natural talents of our regions, um, we can make sure that there is opportunity for all in this country um, from the strength of our economy. And all of this makes possible something um, that is really important, and that's our safety net. We're able to guarantee the essential services that Australians rely on because of the strength of our vision for our nation's economy for the long term. Um, of course, we have guaranteed Medicare. We have funded our health system at increasing levels every year under our government so that now health spending is at a record high. Last year's budget, there was a landmark $2.3 billion investment in the mental health of Australians and in suicide prevention. And in this budget, we have built on that commitment further. We've heard today in the women's um, budget statement just how much um, the prosperity and the safety and the health and the well-being and the leadership of Australian women is vital to this economic story. And that is something about which the women of this country, who now uh, face the lowest gender pay gap almost ever and um, the highest workforce participation they have seen um, ever, they are benefiting from now. And the families of this country will continue to benefit with more support for childcare and more flexibility in pa paid parental leave than we have seen um, in the past. I could keep going, Mr Acting Deputy President, but I think um, the point is clear. We are able to guarantee the essential services that Australians depend on because we have a strong plan for our economy to deliver opportunity for all. And what that means is fewer Australians who need our support in welfare and those very same people are not just getting the dignity of a job, they're not just getting the pride and the skills and um, the camaraderie that comes from having work to go to every day, but they also become contributors to this country in the sense of making uh, contributions to the tax system. They are net givers rather than takers, um, and that is what we need. Um, to make sure that we can guarantee the essential services on which Australians rely for the very, very long term. Finally, this budget makes it possible for us to make a record investment in the security of this country. As we face a less certain world, as we observe 
uh, geopolitical tensions in Europe and elsewhere, it is more important than ever that we invest in the good men and women of our defence forces, that we grow our capability to protect our shores, and that we prepare our cyber security, both in the governmental and the defence sense, but also to assist industries to cope um, with changing dynamics on that front. Our cyber security investment in this budget um, puts us on a robust footing on this new frontier for international conflict. And so it's in that context that um, I look with great optimism to what is ahead for Australia. And this bill plays such an important part in realising um, that vision delivered so well by Treasurer Frydenberg yesterday. And um, we look forward not just to sharing this with the Australian people in the days and weeks ahead, but delivering it, but delivering it today, tomorrow, next week, next month, and for the years and decades ahead. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill has been now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Customs Tariff Amendment, Cost of Living Support Bill 2022, Excise Tariff Amendment, Cost of Living Support Bill 2022. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bills be read a third time. The question is that the bills now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Excise Tariff Amendment, Cost of Living Support Bill 2022. Customs Tariff Amendment, Cost of Living Support Bill 2022.